members, the past presidents, and everybody who has joined the session, the 91st annual session of this academy. We are today completing 91st year of this existence, successful existence of this academy. And 4 December, as it is the foundation day on which this academy was founded and registered. So this is our also foundation day. So very warm welcome to everybody and greetings to everybody on this auspicious occasion of the foundation day and the 91st annual session of this academy. On this day, I would must I, I would like to say, Chalo pure kar liye lagbhag shatak par kaam abhi baki hai. Sapne dekhe te kai professor saha ne jine pura karne ka abhiyan abhi baki hai. So we have to do many more things. This is not the end. We have to continue. We have to do many more things. And in this connection and in this continuation, we are starting this inaugural session of the 91st annual session. Uh, I must uh, express my heartfelt gratitude to our honorable past presidents, to our president, Professor Ajay Ghatakji, to Madam Manju Sharma ji, most respected Madam Manju Sharma ji, and Professor Anur uh, Anurag Sharma ji, and Professor Ashok Mishra ji, and all other past presidents, our council members, our fellows, members, and everybody who have become instrumental in making all the activities of the academy very successful, fruitful, and with full of accomplishments. So with this, I would like to invite Madam Manju Sharma ji, and just few words about her because she is known to everybody, but many students and others may have joined. So I would like to introduce her very briefly. And she is the not only the past president of the academy, she was the secretary of the Department of Biotechnology Government of India. And being the secretary of the Department of Biotechnology Government of India, she did enormous work for the spread of the biotechnological tools and institutions all over the country. Many institutions were founded by her many projects were supported by her and today what we are seeing the biotechnology chain in the in this country is mainly due to madam manju sharma ji and she is also the advisor of nasi new initiatives and nasi dst women scientist chair professor and also she has won many awards including the padma bhushan of the government of india madam very humbly i request you to say few words as the welcome and genesis of the symposium. Uh, namaskar. Uh, my, uh, sadar abhinandan sare uh, seniors ke liye, all the senior people who are here. And uh, of course, I extend a very warm and affectionate welcome to all the younger people, all the students who will be joining and who have already joined. We have, Neeraj has already said that uh, we extend a warm and cordial welcome to our speakers, uh, council members, past presidents, uh, sectional presidents, uh, fellows of NASI, and all others. Every year, we have been celebrating during the annual session a one, one symposium along with the annual session on a subject of uh, relating to excellence of science and its application uh, benefits to the country as per the mandate of NASI, which was which is science and society. The academy, uh, you know, is the oldest of the science academies in the country, established in 1930 uh, by Professor Meghnath Saha, one of the most eminent scientists of this country. Uh, today is academies, as Neera said, uh, foundation day also, and we'll be having a uh, foundation day lecture by Professor Balram Bhargav, uh, the DGICMR and Secretary DHR. The present symposium uh, interface between biological and physical sciences towards Atmanirbhar Bharat through its uh, speakers will bring out the great importance of interdisciplinary science, cutting across various areas, physics, chemistry, engineering sciences, biology, medical sciences, etc. The importance of 
uh, mega projects, particularly interdisciplinary, multi-institutional projects, has been globally recognized now. Instead of just uh, working on small, uh, isolated projects on a, uh, just one subject, uh, scientists have started preferring large projects which are interdisciplinary, multi-institutional, and many scientists, both senior and young people, are involved. And such projects have given extremely good results. We can see in our space science and technology, the results are outstanding. Similarly, the programs of the atomic energy, which has made us so proud, and today we have Professor Ch Dr. Chidambaram here, and he will tell a lot about uh, the nuclear research and interdisciplinary areas, etc. But what is most important is that by bringing together a large number of scientists of different disciplines, the results are very, very good and outstanding. For example, I want to give an example of modern biotechnology. Modern biotechnology and biology, especially biomedical research, Today, it is, uh, in fact, a, a, a gift of, I can say, the instrumentation which has been developed. The advanced instrumentation is responsible for uh, several discoveries, most important discoveries in biomedical research and uh, biotechnology. All the new X-ray machines and CT scan and MRI, whatever has been developed, all these are now helping the medical science to move very fast. And today we know that the medical science has really has had spectacular advances, I would say, in the world. Uh, what we have today in the symposium is uh, you must have seen from the program and the titles of the lectures of very eminent speakers, uh, Professor Chidambaram, Professor Padmanavan, Dr. Mahapatra, Professor Balram Bhargo, uh, Professor Balram, all these and many others, they are all given, in, their names are in the program and the titles of their lecture. So I don't want to repeat that, but the only thing I want to emphasize here is that when we are discussing interdisciplinary uh, science and interdisciplinary areas, we are all the time having the products, the new pro processes, new technologies we can develop in this country. From the uh, titles of their lectures, also you would notice that there is always relevance to the what we are talking today, Atpanirvar Bhai. During COVID pandemic, pandemic, India has shown its strength in science, whether it is vaccine availability or other requirements for handling this pandemic. And we have moved towards self-sufficiency uh, in, in this case. And the whole world has appreciated the efforts uh, India made uh, with its scientific community, uh, the rest of the government officials, health officials, other professionals, everybody coming together. And we have seen that we have been able to, to a large extent, uh, manage this pandemic quite well. Uh, we have uh, sessions like agriculture, Analyte sciences, uh, medical sciences, and entrepreneurship development. Consciously, we decided that instead of too many sessions, we will focus in these three areas, agriculture, medical sciences, and entrepreneurship development. And uh, you would notice as we go on in the pro, uh, session that each one of them are really contributing and discussing the issue of Atpanirbhar and how the interdisciplinary science uh, coming together of uh, biological sciences and physical sciences is helping the nation uh, to move more and more towards self-sufficiency. Uh, about uh, physical sciences, uh, uh, Dr. Ashok Mishra is the co-convener. 
and uh, he told me that he will uh, give a brief summary of that the program which we have developed in the physical sciences but i don't know whether he has joined neeraj has he joined no madam no madam so i will request dr anirvan pathak to uh, our one of our young fellows and a very active fellow to give us the brief very brief account of what the physical sciences session is going to uh, present anirban yes ma'am so thank you professor sharma so in the convener has already given some idea about the genesis of the program so we were involved from the beginning and as the theme suggests that it was how interdisciplinary research can take us to atmanirbhar bharat and incidentally just like the more biology focused section means the physics focused section is also interdisciplinary so that is divided into three part engineering chemistry and physics but if you look into the topics so you will easily find that the interdisciplinary nature is reflected everywhere and for example and many of these things has been made much progress during the time of pandemic so pandemic was bad in some sense but many aspects of interdisciplinary research appeared with clarity and much of this will be reflected and the effort was made from the beginning to stress on those interdisciplinary nature so for example in physics there are talks where people will speak about high assessments how to model them then there are, in chemistry there are talks from polymer industry there are talks from how how things can help on healthcare and it is governing everything in this this domain like today we are not able to meet but still we are uh, we are conducting this meeting because of the big development in information technology and communication related industry and but this has a interdisciplinary aspects as well this connect physics chemistry and many facets of engineering so all all this will be reflected and the other thing which will which is governing now is the atmanirbhar bharat in many cases we were exporter and now we want to be importer and several national mission has been launched and not only the main part of the symposium even in the last day when we will meet for physical science session or biological science session they are also the focus is about atmanirbhar bharat the topics are chosen in such a way that the interdisciplinary nature is reflected and how that can lead to real product real instrument how lab can be taken out from the classroom and the physical things can be uh, made turn uh, converted into product patents and how that the common people for which nasi works the society can be benefited from the science so all the physical science talks are selected in such a way that this this is this particular point is reflected that science can be brought out for common people and common people can be not only benefit and scientifically their economy can also be developed if we can become importer in certain sections so i'll not extend my introduction i'll just mention that the all the talks are selectively chosen and they are the best expert of this field having interdisciplinary feeling and i i expect that all of you will enjoy the sessions on physics chemistry and engineering uh, thank you uh, anirban uh, for this introduction uh, i also want to inform all of you that uh, uh, due to some uh, unavoidable uh, circumstances dr kiran majumdar shah who was supposed to inaugurate our session uh, is unable to join us in the morning but she we have slated her inaugural address at 3 pm because that is the time she finishes her, the other meeting and she can join us so i will request all of you to be kindly present for the inaugural address also and uh, you, i'm sure you would enjoy the uh, lecture by dr kiran majumdar shah uh, we are also celebrating as i said in the beginning the foundation day of the academy normally it would have been very nice if we could celebrate it in allahabad and meet all of us 
but uh, unfortunately due to pandemic we cannot do that but uh, still uh, we have we have discussed this matter in the council and we decided that we will request Rosa Bhargo uh, to uh, give us the foundation day lecture who can also give us briefly a glimpse of uh, the today's pandemic where we are and uh, what we are doing going to do and something like uh, related to the pandemic situation uh, one another important thing uh, dr balram bhargav's lecture now the foundation day lecture will be around uh, 6 to 6 30 it will start so again i i know it's going to be a very long day but again i request uh, all the members, all the fellows, uh, council members, past presidents, everybody to please, and also the students, to please be present for both the inaugural address by Dr. Kiran Majumdar Shah and also by the uh, Foundation Day Lecture by Professor Bhargo. In between, I want, I'm requesting uh, students who are there joining us and also many scientists Please, uh, we are going to have uh, outstanding lectures today, both in the inaugural session by uh, Dr. Chidambaram and Professor Padmanabhan, and of course our presidential remarks by our president. And then uh, in the medical sciences session, we have again very important lectures by Professor P. Balram and many others. So I request you that you, you would have noticed that uh, the present uh, symposium has really uh, been able to bring uh, uh, together a large number of the most eminent scientists in physical sciences area as well as biological sciences area. So I request all the participants to be uh, with us for the whole day uh, today so that you can take the benefit of this symposium. Uh, this is Nasi's characteristic that uh, it tries to bring together the best of the people, the best of the scientists of the country, and actually discuss the relevance of this excellent science, interdisciplinary science, in context of national development. Uh, the last point I want to mention is that uh, this year we have decided NASI is will be dedicating the present annual session 91st annual session and the symposium to the celebrations of the 75th year of India's independence. So that is also a very important point uh, attached to the present uh, program. And I'm happy that uh, so many uh, experts, so many scientists and uh, other people mm -hmm. have been able to join us uh, for this particular program. I thank you once again and a uh, uh, very cordial welcome to all of you and also thank you for your kind presence namaskar thank you madam thank you very much madam and really uh, uh, we are very much grateful to uh, madam uh, to you as well as professor ashok Kishaji and our honorable president and others also for developing such a very nice program well coordinated program well orchestrated program Interface between biological and physical sciences towards Art Nirbhar Bharat, which is the theme of this 75th year of Amrit Mahotsa also. So we are now coming to the thematic address. And uh, for the thematic address, I would just like to mention about the theme also, because for last 70 years after the discovery by the James Watson and Francis Crick, uh, this interdisciplinary approach is going on and there are several names which we can take, uh, which who followed this, like uh, Professor G. N. Ramchandran, Robert Logging, Geoffrey West, uh, Ned Green, Herbert Levin, Anthony Donald, and in the continuation of that, Professor R. Chidamram, Honorable Professor R. Chidamram. I would like, uh, although uh, the whole world knows about him, I would just like to introduce very briefly uh, for the students and the teachers who have joined. So, sir, R. Shidambaram is one of the India's most distinguished experimental physicists. His outstanding contributions to science in general and the nation in particular is a matter of great pride for all of us. His key role in developing India's nuclear weapons, 
being a part of the team conducting the first Indian nuclear test, the Smiling Buddha, at Pokhran Test Range in 1974, further leading efforts to conduct the second nuclear test in May 1998 are the landmarks of India's giant leap towards attaining nuclear power. His emphasis on coherent synergy for India's science and technology efforts to take India on a sustained fast growth path and focus on the import, importance of directed basic research and are the brilliant concepts which gave a new dimension to the growth and development of science and technology in India. He has been closely associated with all three national science academies and his proximity with Professor M. G. K. Menon, another great scientist, and also he was Menon was also the past president of this academy. Another great scientist of modern India is also well known. He was the director of BARC during 1993 to 2000 and principal scientific advisor to the government of India and the chairman of the scientific advisory committee to the cabinet from 2001 to 2018 and is now holding an honorary position as GAE Homi Baba Chair Professor Baba Advocate Research Center. He received many awards, many national and international awards and honors for his services to the scientific society, including the Padma Vibhushan, the second highest civilian honor by the government, government of India. Very humbly, I request you, sir, to please deliver your team address. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you for the very kind uh, introduction. Professor Manju Sharma, Professor Rajai Ghatak, distinguished past presidents and fellows of NASI, and my young friends. It's a pleasure to participate in this symposium on a very interesting subject, interface between biological and physical sciences towards Atmanirbhar Bharat. And I'm grateful to Professor Manju Sharma for the invitation. You heard introductory comments from Professor Manju Sharma and Professor Patak. See, various science and engineering disciplines are today beginning to overlap increasingly in, in uh, different ways. In fact, uh, the boundaries between disciplines are beginning to get more and more fuzzy. As Dr. Manju Sharma mentioned, large technology projects like uh, building of nuclear power plants, launch vehicles, space launch vehicles, or missiles are multidisciplinary efforts. But in this case, all the disciplines, competences are within the organization, one organization. But there are other areas as where well. I, as was mentioned, I wanted the coherent synergy to be developed in India. Complementary competences in different organizations have to be brought together when I was a PSA. We brought together BHEL, NTPC, and Indira Gandhi Center for Atomic Research for the design of the advanced ultra supercritical thermal plant. See, while we talk of climate change, we are going to burn coal for the next 20, 30 years. But if you are able to raise the temperature of the steam to more than 700 degrees, then for the same amount of power that you produce, the amount of carbon dioxide that you emit goes down. So it's a relatively cleaner carbon technology. Now in this context, the interface between physical and biological sciences, this interface is an important uh, example and where the disciplines in these sciences are increasingly getting together. So uh, may I now have the slides, please? Neeraj? Yeah. Okay. Are you able to read it, Dr. Shama? The slide? Yes. yes. It's visible, sir. Very good. Yes, it is. Can you go to the next slide? See, traditionally, the natural sciences have been divided into two branches, the physical sciences and the biological sciences. And uh, increasing number of scientists, as you heard just now, 
are addressing problems lying at the intersection of the two. We also now we used to have biophysics before. Biophysics was the use of physical techniques to study biological problems. We now have biological physics, which means we study biological systems as physical systems. Biological crystallography is a good example. Already Professor Jain Ramchandran's name has been mentioned. He was a pioneer in this field looking at the structure of collagen. The triple helical structure of collagen is more complex than the double helical structure of DNA. But of course, uh, Dr. Jain Ramchandran didn't have access to the X-ray data on DNA. Otherwise, I have no I don't think he would, he would have run it quite easy and his student Gopinath Kartha would have found it easy to solve that. Uh, and everybody knows about the Ramachandran plot, which looks at, puts a limit on the kind of confirmations which uh, among the amino acid chain, the uh, biological molecules can have. There are now many other interdisciplinary research areas which in fact have become disciplines in their own right, like cybernetics, biochemistry, and biomedical engineering. And then we have mathematics. Mathematics is present in every discipline of natural science and biological sciences are not excluded. Next, Next slide. There is a field called biomathematics. Biomathematics is the use of mathematical models for to help understand phenomena. Many areas of biology, including physiology, immunology, evolution, conservation biology, and so on. And then we have computational biology, which includes bioinformatics, the science of using biological data to develop algorithms or models in order to understand biological systems and relationships. Computational biology was nucleated with advanced, advanced following the Human Genome Project and DNA sequencing, and is supported by the availability of supercomputers, high-speed networks, like our own Indian National Knowledge Network run by MIT, optical fiber network, which connects more than 1,600 knowledge institutions in the country and which enables, and also it's connected to international networks like the Internet 2 or the European Net, so that it enables national and international collaboration. See, for example, see, at one time, I, the proposal for National Knowledge Network came from our office when it was the PSC and we created grids within this. This was a, uh, a brain imaging grid. What it does is connects to within the National Knowledge Network. You can create specialized grids for people who are working in the same area. For example, in this case, mainly it was Alzheimer's, but you can add vascular dementia and neurodegenerative disorders run by the National Brain Research Center. And here, people, to the extent they want to share their research information or data, can do it. We have similar ones for cancer, great, and so on. Next slide. See, look at the Nobel Prize, which was given to Venki Ramakrishnan. He was given the Nobel Prize in chemistry for this work in 2009. But the problem was in biology, structure of ribosome, most complex structure to have been determined by X-ray diffraction. The study of the diffraction data came from synchrotrons, and synchrotrons are built by physicists and engineers. So you see, the whole thing is now getting partly in terms of use of techniques, partly in terms of facilities, and in fact, many problems in physics and chemistry, important problems are biological problems. 
Study this study, of course, involves mechanistic details of protein synthesis, understanding antibiotic functions, and provides guidance for new antibiotic design. Take computer aided drug design, an important area in biology. And the recent outbreak of COVID 19 has brought drug designing and development to the forefront. There have been contributions from even organizations like BAC, CSIR, and DRDO, and many other, certainly from DBT and some universities. Computer aided drug designing design utilizes in silico methods, shows promise for development of novel drugs in a cost efficient effort. See, the computational techniques used require molecular dynamic studies, ligand docking. Crystallography is a very useful technique for identifying druggable targets. Of course, here you have to use uh, artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning. And then quantitative structure function relationship. All these have been utilized in each phase of the drug discovery cycle. See, look at the physical techniques which are now being used at the molecular and cellular level, atomic force microscopy, theoretical and computational biophysics, stem resolved, electron microscopy, terahertz spectroscopy, biophotonics, neutron X-ray scattering. And the problems which are using these physical techniques relate to nucleic acids, proteins, complexes, and membranes. Some of these problems are also targeted therapeutics. The science of delivering drugs where they are needed in the body at the right time, the right place, like in cancer, and of course at the right dose. This requires developing a complete computer replica of the organ, and it needs skills to work in the life science, physical science interface. And then from atomic energy, you've got radio pharmaceuticals. The form of radio pharmaceuticals are produced using physical techniques. It requires a research reactor. It requires chemists who can know which are the isotopes which can be converted into useful radio isotopes. And these are used for studying the functions of different organs of the body, heart, brain, lungs. And the radiation from radio isotopes can also be used for treatment of cancer by teletherapy and brachytherapy. Dr. Manju Sharma mentioned agriculture. Now you can produce radiation mutants. And these mutants may lead to increased production, increased pest resistance. Of course, we make sure that the genetic mutation is stable for several generations and they are cleared by the varietal uh, release committee. The interface between chemical engineering and biology. See, there are some universities which are now doing postgraduate degrees in advanced chemical engineering and technology. The course content includes engineering of biological processes, metabolic engineering, tissue engineering. Chemistry and biology was mentioned. In chemical reactions, Catalysts play an important role by providing orbitals of their own to interact with the reacting molecules orbitals, thereby causing the energy of the latter to be lowered as the reaction proceeds. Similarly, we have biocatalysts, which are used to manufacture specialty enzymes. They are also employed production of products in different fields pharmaceuticals or intermediates, antibiotics, statins, fine chemicals, also food ingredients. Many of the products of modern biotechnology, which really use chemical engineering processes, are high value, low volume biochemicals. Next. Slide. Biomedical engineering was mentioned. It is the application of principles and problem solving techniques of engineering to biology and medicine. And many top institutes like IITs have centers for biomedical engineering. 
The earliest one was in IIT Delhi, 1971, established as a joint venture of IIT Delhi and the AIMS Delhi, and then IIT Kharagpur, School of Medical Science and Technology established. And this had the objective to provide a platform of interdisciplinary teaching and research in diverse areas of medical science and technology. There are also strong research and teaching programs in biosciences and bioengineering in IIT Bombay, IIT Jodhpur, NYSE, B, and so on. I'll give you an example from IIT Jodhpur with whom I'm associated. You can get plenty of these examples. Next slide. See, this is by this young uh, faculty member, Dr. Sushmita Das from Department of Bioscience Bioengineering, IIT Jodhpur. From clinic to lab, retroengineering of brain tumors for personalized medicine. So you get clinical data, the patient sample is there, then you do computational analysis, clinical image data, multi-omic data, AI-based, artificial intelligence-based continuous learning model, study the tissues by biological analysis, life cell imaging, flow cytometry, protein arrays, and then you get the functional assays, arrays, patient derived global blastoma steroids. So you see, the whole thing is there are many, many such examples where engineering and biology are getting together in medicine and, of course, for human good. Next slide. Next slide. See, medical devices, this is a very, very important field. And Indian medical devices market is expected to increase about $50 billion in 2025. And today, 70 to 80 percent of the devices are met by imports. And in view of this, government's new policies encouraging both foreign direct investment and indigenous manufacture. Medical device design is clearly interdisciplinary. The need is biological and the device is based on physical sciences. Fortunately, there are very good groups now, both in national labs like Bach, Babatron is for cancer treatment, CSI or CSIR, they develop these diagnostic and therapeutic devices. DRDO, obstacle climbing chair as a rehabilitation device. University, IT Bombay, They've got a biomedical engineering and technology innovation center, BEDIC, with 14 partner institutes. And ITM, this young faculty member, Professor Mon Shankar Shiva Prakasham, he set up this healthcare technology center in ITM Research Park for developing indigenous medical. It is above list. I'm just giving you example. This, this list is hardly complete. I'll give you. Some example typical of the work being done by Professor Mohan Shankar in the next slide. See, he has done so many things and all transfer to industry. Some of them are, in fact, startups. Mobile, he has worked very closely with Shankar Netrale, Mobile Eye Surgical, Eye Netra, all these related to then. Wireless remote patient monitor, 5,000 plus devices since August 2020 release. Wireless level monitor. These are all endoscopy imaging system, image guided spine surgery system. The good thing is, these are all being designed in India. And when you design in India, the cost is a fraction of the imported cost. And also, the very good thing is, Indian doctors are accepting this, are beginning to use it. Next slide. It's cybernetics. Cybernetics, because it's an independent discipline now, it deals with communication and control systems in living organisms, machines, and organizations. And the outputs are taken as inputs for further action. It's a precursor to fields such as artificial intelligence, cognitive science, complexity science, 
complexity science is a growing field, robotics. And it has actually evolved into a field of artificial neural networks. Artificial neural networks used in artificial intelligence copy the brain. They are like a massively parallel distributed processor made up of simple processing units. You can call them artificial neurons. And it resembles the brain in two respects. Knowledge is acquired by the network from its environment through a learning process. And synaptic connection among the artificial neutrons are used to store the acquired knowledge and access it when necessary. Now, in reverse, cognitive science, neuroscience is beginning to benefit from the power of AI, both as a model for developing and testing ideas about how the brain performs computations and as a tool for processing the, the complex, uh, complex data. Can you go to the next slide, please? Let me come to the concluding remarks. As has been mentioned, most of the existing prob exciting problems in science and technology today are multidisciplinary. Design of nuclear power plants or nuclear weapons or space launch vehicles, advanced fighter aircraft like Tejas, which has been light combat aircraft introduced into the Air Force. These are in mission oriented agencies examples of multidisciplinary technology projects. The borders between science disciplines, as I mentioned before, are also continuously getting fuzzy. Take theoretical chemists and theoretical condensed matter physicists. Both of them use this density functional theory, which is very really popular for first principle energy calculations in my groups on solid state physics and high pressure physics. They are used routinely, but they are equally popular for calculations in quantum chemistry. And the border between theoretical chemistry and theoretical condensed matter physics is nearly absent. And very often, both of them handle biological problems. Last, come to my last slide. See, there is a talk of reducing the man machine divide. And there are people who are scared of long-term development in the AI field and want international regulation of AI. Stephen Hawking, the great astrophysicist, passed away recently, who did wonderful work sitting in an armchair, once told a BBC correspondent, the development of full artificial intelligence would spell the end of the human race, unquote. I, I do not agree. I agree with Sir Roger Penrose, another leading mathematician, who and others who argue that humans will always be smarter than computers and computer algorithms and any other cybernetic machines that they create. You know, the great Srinivas Ramanujan, there, there is a biography of the man who knew infinity, there is a biography by Dr. Srinivas Rao that has come out. This book, this was reviewed by Professor Ezekiel Daror, Hebrew University. Because you know, in the context of robots, artificial intelligence and robotics are connected. Human robots, super intelligent human robots, they talk about. And then they have some of that like Stephen Hawking, that if you go on developing like this, the machine may overtake uh, humans. But what Drawer says after reading this biography is, and I quote, no enhancement of human intelligence opens a door to becoming a Ramanuja. And no algorithm is likely to produce robots with the abilities of Ramanuja. Next slide. And I think I'll close with this thought. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you, sir. Many thanks for such a illustrative, informative, and very conceptual uh, <clears throat> presentation, sir, on 
uh, such a presentation uh, i could say only it is a wonderful expression excellent te technological interpretations thematic address was full of guiding principles and true representation thank you sir very much thank you very much thank you uh, now we are coming to the uh, thematic address 2 and uh, this thematic address 2 is uh, to be delivered by professor g padmanabhan sir our uh, earlier president and nasi honorary scientist and former director iic bangalore uh, this thematic address is on covid 19 meeting ground for all sciences in last one or two years we have witnessed that honorable professor padmanabhan sir has written many articles popular articles as well as the scientific articles in the newspapers as well as in the scientific bulletins and the research journals which were all a guiding line for developing the vaccines and also for the treatment of the covid 19 so i would like to say few words about professor padmanabhan sir because many students have also joined Uh, Professor Raven is former director of IIC Bangalore and the past president of NASI. He was instrumental in ushering in recombinant DNA technology in the country and worked closely with several government agencies to further the cause of biotechnology in the country. He helped and promoted vaccine industries in the country and contributed in the development of recombinant hepatitis B vaccine and DNA rabies vaccine, as well as showing the anti-malarial property of curcumin. and its efficiency in combination therapy in 2004 he is the recipient of several prestigious awards by padm shri padm bhushan and also shanti swarup bhatnagar prize for the science and technology and jawaharlal nehru birth centenary fellowship of insa to name a few he has written several scientific articles as i informed so it is the uh, befitting for this occasion that we request professor padmanabhan sir to say few words as a thematic address which will be a guiding force which will be a guide, guiding train for such a symposium class symposium sir right sir thank you neeraj uh, yes sir we are sharing can you have the slide yeah Can I get started? Yes. Yes, sir. Professor uh, Gatak, uh, President Nasi. um professor manju sharma convener of the symposia distinguished uh, members of the council distinguished speakers uh, let me thank uh, professor manju sharma for asking me to give uh, the, one of the thematic addresses so it's a pleasure and privilege for me to be doing it Professor Chidambaram has given a very broad perspective of uh, interdisciplinary sciences, especially uh, biological questions being handled by physical sciences. I have taken very few specific examples from COVID nineteen. We know this COVID nineteen is a tragedy, basically. lives and livelihoods have been lost but you know something unheard of uh, a challenge by a tiny virus all of us all scientists all branches have come together to contribute one way or the other of course it looks to me the virus has its own mind but uh, i thought i will take very few examples 
uh, not very broad based, very specific, where you find multiple disciplines or scientists have come together. Next slide, please. You just see the uh, uh, medical sciences, for example. Things have become very prominent in certain areas. Public health, for example. The general public were not much concerned or even aware of scientists, even were not aware of much of public health. So medical sciences, for example, clinical diagnosis, prevention and therapy, infrastructure, instrumentation. These have become topics for discussion, you know, which we never did. Look at public health. Wearing masks or personal hygiene or social distancing or quarantine, mental health, RT-PCR. Never heard of this in the public domain being discussed. Today, these have all become uh, household words. Molecular epidemiology. These are areas, you know, which have greatly been contributed by sequencing the nucleic acid, RNA or DNA as the case may be. Now, DNA sequencing has become so popular. You know, I, I shared the uh, INSECOG, one of the committees, and the, almost every Friday we meet and there is some request from state government, some private entity, we want to do DNA sequencing. So, some dramatic changes have taken place on the ground. Of course, medicinal chemistry, vaccines, diagnostics, where you find biologists, physicists, engineers, computational biology, all have come together. Time scale for research has changed. You know, the vaccine used to take 15 years, it would be developed in two years. So the expectation of now the government or the public is very different now. You can't say I will take so many years for to do this. They say you should have done it yesterday. That's been, so uh, uh, regulatory sciences, you know, we didn't know about DCGI. We didn't know about controller, drug controller. Only a few, you know, people in the clinical trial, you now everybody is talking, talking about. Next slide, please. I will just give, I thought, these are areas in which I will give you a very few examples. Sorry, this is a very busy slide. Molecular epidemiology. By sequencing all the nucleic acid viruses, you know, uh, so many we know basically a virus will keep on mutating, especially an RNA virus keeps on mutating. Uh, and it is, for example, COVID estimated one to two mutations per month. Now you can realize if there are 30,000 infections, let me assume 30,000 viral particles and how many mutations can happen. In fact, there is a review in Nature which says at the end of the pandemic, you will have millions and millions and millions of sequences. So what has happened is all these mutations have been identified and, kept, and I will not get into great detail and it became necessary to classify them. So WHO came into the picture. They said all viruses, all viruses will keep on mutating. Now, so we have variants of concern, variants of interest. And of course, US has gone one step further and says, variant of high consequence. We will not talk about that. So all these mutation, mutants have been classified as variants of concern and variants of interest. And you know, there are definitions which are very, very, very clear. How, how do you classify something as a variant of concern and variant of interest? Now, variant of interest is potential. Potentially, it can cause escape, immune escape. Potentially, it can become more transmissible. Variant of concern, where there are mutations which have already been uh, demonstrated to cause these kinds of things. So, classification has become possible. All this is because of sequencing. 
Next slide, please. So it should not be of country, the origin. It originated in UK or India, or South Africa, Jose. So alpha, beta, gamma, delta, all these classifications were introduced. So then the widespread interest in genome sequencing, for example, uh, you know, the virus, as you know, most talked about gene is the spike protein. And, uh, and that is the one that binds to the receptor and gets you into the cell, we know that. And, you know, all uh, mutations in the spike is the what that is very, very closely watched. And this Delta variant, which actually originated in, in India, you can't read this, but the, the, all the mutations on this spike I have indicated here. Next one. The latest uh, variant that has come, you know, which is uh, affecting, I mean, concerning people is the Omicron. I didn't know what Omicron was really. Then I found it is the 15th alphabet, 15th letter in Greek alphabet. Alpha, beta, gamma, delta, the 15th one is Omicron. That is how it gets its name, Omicron. And uh, interestingly, you find this has huge number of mutations. Even in the spike region, apparently it has got 30 odd mutations. So there is a concern. You know, it has got the alpha variant mutation. It has got some of the variants mutations that are already present. And in addition, you see that it's own mutations, the deletions. But this is something, you know, everybody becomes an expert in this field. So you have as many views. There is another view which I read. This is the virus is on way out. This is how the Spanish flu happened. Spanish flu actually uh, went on a lot of mutations and slowly, slowly it became in a yearly kind of infection. It became H1N2, H2N2 and all this. So you get these things like, so it may be on its way out. There are others who think, you know, what about transmissibility, immune escape, uh, severity, and so on and so forth. So far, there is no evidence it is more severe. The few cases reported are supposed to be milder. But as I said, you know, uh, I, I, I don't look at the TV at all. You know, but when I, whenever I see, I see experts. Uh, they become you know, global experts, the most outstanding expert. I mean, if you want to get the title, this is the area to get into the biopic. Next slide, please. So the, what are, the point I'm trying to make is, the sequencing is what has happened uh, in a very big way, attracted the attention of uh, multiple people. Then there is the area of molecular phylogenetics. This is also again based on sequence data. You know, we know about the family tree, phylogenetic trees, constructing these trees. I'm highlighting this because these were not very popular areas there. And mostly did by, you know, not much of sequence data was involved in these classifications. So you will see now, uh, you know, sequencing and assigning them to pangolin, GSAT, Pang these are all softwares basically if you look at. They belong to this lineage, they belong to this lineage. And the classification becomes, as I said, millions and millions of sequences. And therefore, there was a paper in Nature which said how to classify these. Call them by lineages, AY1, something, something, something. AY2, something, something. It has already gone beyond A100. Now, AY100, 100.1, 100.2, that means just two. You know, I asked them, you know, does it every lineage, all these are variant? variants in mutations no sometimes there is no change in the mutation sometimes there is a change in the geography the same thing has arisen in some other place you get it is the software that keeps on assigning this so many people don't understand what is this ay1 ay2 ay3 but i think it helps probably to to follow up what is happening today so India also wanted to get into this. So the INSACOP, Indian SARS-CoV-2 Genomic Sequence Consortium. 
was established uh, in December 2020 and it came into existence activity only a few months later. Already millions have been sequenced, but India is now 100,000 plus uh, sequenced. You know, so many institutions have been involved in uh, sequencing. Next one, please. Uh, and uh, you have to, this is the example of a phylogenetics tree. How, when I say this, you know, I don't have time to explain. But it can be based on sequence, it can be based on geography, it can be based on relative to another virus, it can be based on origin, whether it's animal origin, which animal. So all trees can be constructed in different, different perspectives. These are all clades, for example, which are, the virus has been identified like that. Next one, please. So, this is one part of the story arising from the sequencing. You have phylogenetics, you know, all these areas have become prominent, uh, you know, classifications, molecular epidemiology, not that they are new areas, but at least they highlight, you know, they have been very high, very much highlighted. Now I move on to drug discovery. Professor Chidambaram briefly mentioned, but I must tell you, we don't have a drug for this virus. All the drugs, if you really look carefully, any drug that is available on the shelf was used. There is no drug, really speaking, that we say it is specific for COVID or SARS-2. But anyway, the latest FDA approval, the remdesivir, uh, you have immunobased therapy, antibody-based therapy, monoclonal antibodies, you make combinations of that, and uh, chemical, uh, chemistry-based drugs, uh, uh, and of course, uneven, uh, uncertain effectiveness, whether it's ivermectin, ivermectin is an animal drug, basically, but a parasitic drug, hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, uh, where, you know, at one point of time, were popular when everybody said it doesn't work. I, in fact, I find when I talk to some of the clinicians, no, sir, we are still using it. So, what happens really on the ground? What happens in all these discussions? Sometimes they don't. You no, know, so the bottom line I want to tell you that we don't have a drug. There is so much importance is needed to study the biology of this virus very, very carefully. The structure of the proteins is very careful. Otherwise, what we are doing is we are using anti, uh, you know, the HIV drugs, uh, was used for something else. Uh, but next one, please. Now, we need to know the mechanism by which these drugs act, not only drug discovery. I don't have time, but you know, as the virus goes in, we know it is uh, no, translated, it's an RNA virus, then there is a replication, and the drug remdesivir is a nucleoside analog, and it inhibits the replication process actually. And uh, apparently, it's a very expensive drug now, remdesivir has been approved, and therefore, uh, the nucleotide becomes a nucleotide analog and therefore gets incorporated and it blocks the replication of the virus. That is the mechanism. Next, next one, please. Now, there is the latest Pfizer drug, some of you would know, that the Paxlov, Paxlovid, which is a protease inhibitor. As you know, the SARS-2 uh, virus, when it is translated, one part of it is the polyprotein, 16 proteins are made and they have to be degraded by proteases. And proteases are involved in many other steps. I don't have time. And the Pfizer says this drug is very specific for that. And the bottom line you will find is a reduced risk of hospitalization or death by 89% in interim analysis of phase 2-3 uh, uh, high-risk study. So high-risk cases. So this is the latest drug. I hope uh, whether it is specific for this protease 
and this is what Pfizer has uh, put on. Next one, please. So from uh, sequencing phylogenetics to uh, drug discovery, I now go to vaccine. This is the next area. I am highlighting this because whoever talked about vaccine, public at the public level, the vaccines were not very a great topic of discussion. Now everywhere you talk about vaccine. And of course, so far as uh, we have a committee which looks at all these uh, specific vaccine platforms, recombinant spike protein, everyone tries to make either a protein or a DNA or a mRNA for the spike protein, because that is the one that binds to the receptor and can you neutralize it, prevent it. So we have a recombinant spike protein, we have receptor binding domain uh, only, uh, DNA vaccine, uh, Zydus Cadilla, you know, mRNA vaccine, self-amplifying and non-self-amplifying. There are two varieties of this. Vector-based, you know, where you can have adeno, measles, rabies, these are all the platforms on which uh, a spike is expressed and the virus is made. The most uh, interesting one is the inactivated virus. Simply take the virus inactivated and give it as a vaccine. In fact, the first meeting I raised this question. Why nobody is talking about the inactivated? This was the classical way we used to make vaccines. Whichever virus which produces the disease, inactivated, chemically inactivated or genetically inactivated and injected. And this is what ultimately happened. The NIV isolated a strain, gave it to Bharat Biotech and um, that is the inactivated virus. And we have now gone into delivery systems, various delivery systems we know, but practically you see national delivery. Seems to be a very interesting opportunity uh, seems to have very good results, interesting results. Uh, next slide, please. So the challenges again, you know, disciplines when it comes to manufacture. This virus, you know, cell based inhibitor-based virus doesn't grow very well. That is why you see Bharat is not able to make as many doses as it is required. It's still up 90% or a, more than 85% is provided by the Adeno uh, Serum Institute. So the virus replication is very slow. So how to manufacture it? That becomes an issue. Therefore, fermentary technology, there are wave bioreactors, there are different types of reactors are coming, whether we can improve the yield of the virus. And engineers get into the distribution of the vaccine. You know, I saw a project in Barak last minute delivery take a thermos flask which will maintain two to eight degrees for 14 hours so these are all you know uh, startup companies and this one company says i can even even use power from cell phone tower to, to maintain temperature in the thermos flask which will accommodate something like 200 uh, vials or 200 doses and they say this will be very useful for the last minute delivery, last mile delivery in a place like India to go to villages. And of course, the vaccine has to, you have to treat the vaccine, there's always this worry, what happens to the mutation? <laughs> when there's a mutation, then uh, will the vaccine work? We are talking about immune escape, do we need a new vaccine for the new variant? And how many vaccines? <laughs> How many variants do we have a vaccine for every variant? So these are all discussions going on. Next one, please. Diagnostic test. <laughs> Sorry, RT-PCR has become a household word. Whoever knew of RT-PCR? So now everybody talks about RT-PCR and I will not get into great dis uh, discussion on that. Current infection, definitely. Of course, you can do antibody test, you can do antigen test. Uh, these are all possibilities. Next one. Being done. <coughs> Next slide. Now, chemists have gone into the fray so far as, for example, I'm just giving one more example of how different people have, background people have come. For diagnostics, volatile organic compounds. So the test is 
individual blow into your disposable mouthpiece connected to high precision breath sample, fed into a mass spectrometer, and you know, on that basis, screening for for uh, COVID. Of course, subsequent RT-PCR payment. So the chemists have gone into it. Next one, please. So now I'll go to small instruments. Professor Shidambaram talked about huge instrumentation. These are all small, small ones which are used for COVID oximeter, measurement of oxygen saturation of blood, relative absorption of red absorbed by deoxygenated blood and infrared absorbed by oxygenated blood. Cytosolic, uh, cytolic, cytostolic component of uh, the absorption waveform. So, pulse oximeter, next one please. <laughs> Simple measurement of oxygen saturation in blood. Next slide. Yes, this is what many of you, I think some people actually bought it. Next one, but bulk is imported from China. This is the concern, you know, some, uh, some of these uh, small possibilities, you know, whether we should be doing it, probably they are now being manufactured in India. At IIC, they made an oxygen concentrator. That, you, you all know the story of oxygen requirement, all that happened. So oxygen supply, oxygen demand, oxygen concentrators became very important. And this one has become very popular, the oxygen concentrator, which is developed by IAC. And they have now given it to, I'm, I saw somewhere something like uh, more than 50, 20 companies are interested in that. Next one, please. New age thermometers. You now you would have seen, I mean, non-contact thermometer, we, we have taken it for granted. All the old classical we used here, mercury-based thermometers. Then, you know, now you have all these everywhere. You see these non-contact thermometers uh, to detect uh, COVID. In fact, till recently, um, the screening procedure in the airport was only a thermometer, I mean, non-contact temperature. Only now, because of this Omicron, but that new variant, they are looking at uh, more detailed tests and so on. Next one, please. Chest scan, I think uh, Professor Stammer also mentioned CT scan. Next one, I think I should go faster. Uh, you can also use MRI, you know, for the uh, for uh, chest uh, thing. Uh, CT scan uses X-ray, MRI uses magnetic field and radio waves. Next one. I am mentioning this because uh, Bayerich supported a very interesting project. Perhaps India will have, I think, I don't know whether Dr. Jagannathan is there. Uh, he was the chair of this committee, actually. Next generation magnetic resonance imaging scanner, world's fully mobile, low liquid helium. It just requires 20 liters or something like that of liquid helium. Helium has been the huge requirement component in this MRI actually, and this one needs much, much less. And you know, there are several advantages, and this is now supported to a company, I think it's Bangalore based company, and they have gone very advanced in developing. Uh, India may have. Only entity in India to develop such cryogenics for large scale superconducting magnets that can be used in MRI scanners. Perhaps this is a breakthrough uh, which India is looking for, this kind of breakthrough. Next one. I'm almost towards the end. Of course, then you have from face mask to ventilators. I know, you know, Indian companies responded efficiently to the COVID 19 pandemic for fast tracking innovation revamping assembly lines and expediting manufacturing of everything from N95 masks and personal protective equipment to diagnostic kits and ventilators. Remarkably, from producing almost no ventilators domestically, India managed 60,000. This is old data. Probably. 
So in some areas we have moved very fast, and we have, you know, we have uh, manufactured many things. Hospital facilities have been created. Next one. Personal protective equipment, uh, I'll not get into great detail, but these are all various things which India didn't have much and they have all been being made in India today. Next one. The face mask may not sound high tech, but we, we are not tired of repeating it any number of times. The most number effective way to prevent uh, still is the face mask. Better than probably assurance than a vaccine. Very, very important to, you know, to have this uh, uh, barrier face covering. Next one. Surgical mask, there are different kinds of masks, different, uh, each one has its own great uh, capability to filter the virus. I should tell only one point of the student's virus is carried as a droplet, which is about five to 10 micron. And, uh, you know, the cutoff point for surgical mask, for cloth mask, cotton cloth, all these are all very Next one. Respirators, again, they have become very popular. Next one. So, this is my last slide. So, the tiny virus has posed a huge challenge. And scientists from various disciplines have contributed to tackle the pandemic. As I said, timelines for applications have shrunk beyond imagination. But I sh we should accept it is a tragedy affecting lives and livelihoods. Hopefully, the lessons learned will help mankind to face pandemics in future. So you can see so many groups, so many disciplines came together. Whether it is drug discovery, whether it is vaccine, whether it is uh, diagnostic, whether it is researchers like, you know, what kind of lineages, classification, phylogenetics. A huge amount of uh, interaction has taken place uh, in, the, in this virus has necessitated, but it is still posing a lot of challenge. I only think we need to respect nature. Thank you. I'm done. Next one, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Many thanks for such an excellent lecture, sir. A glimpse of scientific advancements, a story of the country's achievements, which has been portrayed by you, sir in such an excellent way that it has enthused the young mind for doing better in the life. And we are all very much thankful to you, sir. Thank you. So after Thank you. these two thematic addresses, we are coming to the very special part of this uh, uh, inaugural session. The presidential address by our honorable president, Professor Ajay Ghatak, sir on 91st annual session. Just to uh, briefly introduce, sir, uh, although he is known all over the world for his literary contributions, scientific literary contributions, and recently the book which has been written by him is also an excellent treasure for communicating science among the students and the teachers. Professor Ajay Ghatak, sir, is a renowned physicist. He is currently the president of the National Academy. He has written over 170 research papers and more than 20 books. More than 20 books. His undergraduate textbooks on optics has been translated to Chinese and Persian. And his monograph on inhomogeneous optical wave guides, co-authored with Professor Thoda, has been translated to Chinese and Russian. In 1995, he was elected as fellow of the Optical Society of America for distinguished service to optic education and for his contribution to the understanding of propagation, characteristics of gradient index media, fibers, and integrated optic devices. He is the recipient of several prestigious awards as the Optical Society Sang Su Lee Award 
2020 for a seminal role in the de development of fiber optics and guided wave photonics and for pioneering optics education in India. The SPY Educator Award 2008 in recognition of outstanding contribution to optics education. Esther Hoffman Bell of Medal 2003 <laughs> of the Optical Society and Galileo Galilei Award 1998 also. SS Bhatnagar Prize for Science and Technology, Physical Sciences and all those things. So I request you, sir, very humbly to kindly deliver the presidential act. Thank you, Neeraj. Thank you very much. Can you see these slides? Uh, sir, it has to be actually, uh, yes. Is it all right now? No, no we can yes. see it. No problem. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Neeraj, for asking me to give this address. Uh, I'm going to spend only five, seven minutes. Uh, uh, we are already slightly behind schedule. Today, as uh, Neeraj had mentioned, Dr. Manju Sharmaji also had mentioned, December 4th is the foundation day of our academy. And on December 4th, 1930, the great visionary and a truly outstanding scientist, Professor Meghnath Saha, founded our academy, and he was the first president of the academy. And uh, therefore, to be the president of such a great academy, the oldest science academy, in India is a tremendous honor. At the same time, it imposes great responsibility. We just heard two brilliant lectures from Professor Chidambaram and Professor Padmanavan, and they mentioned extremely important issues and in which our uh, industry has to take a lot of interest and implement them. So I really enjoyed listening to both the outstanding talks. I would like to express my deep sense of appreciation to Professor Manju Sharma and uh, Professor Ashok Mishra for having organized extremely important deliberations by a galaxy of speakers in this symposium. I wanted to have, give you a list of the speakers. You already have them, but I am really looking forward to the Foundation Day lecture and many other talks given by very renowned scientists in our country. We already heard two brilliant talks just before this. So I'm really very grateful for all the efforts that Professor Manju Sharma and Professor Ashok Mishra have made in organizing this important symposium. I also greatly appreciate the efforts of the sectional presidents, Professor Anirvan Patak and Professor Rohit Srivastav, both of them young and very dynamic for organizing a very nice program on the third day of this symposium. I would request all of you to attend uh, at least one of them. One will be on physical sciences, but the other I have gone through the programs. They look very interesting and very informative. And of course, the tremendous efforts of everyone at the NASI headquarters. So I'll spend five minutes on why study of light is so important and try to bring out relate what I'm going to say to the theme of our symposium, which is the interface between biological and physical sciences towards Atmanibhar Bharat. This uh, particular sentence was coined by Dr. Manju Sharma herself. And I thought this is a very important and appropriate topic and to which the study of light in which I have spent my own lifetime on it is very important. You know, in, in the year 2015, UNESCO declared 2015 as the International Year of Light and Light-Based Technologies. And that was because in the year 1015, 1000 years back, Al Hazan, who was from Mesopotamia, now in Iraq, uh, wrote the first book on optics, Kitab al Manazid. The cover page of the translated edition is shown in the slide. In proclaiming 2015 as the International Year of Light, the United Nations recognized that applications of light science and technology are vital for existing and future advances in medicine, energy, information and communication, fiber optics, agriculture, mining, astronomy, architecture, archaeology, etc., etc. So the study of the light beams, study of optics is really an extremely important area 
not only in physical sciences, but also in engineering sciences. Then, a few years back, UNESCO again declared May 16th as the International Day of Light. And that was because the first successful operation of the laser was done by Theodore Maiman on 16th May 1960. Theodore Maiman was an engineer from California, and he demonstrated the first working of the laser, which has revolutionized medicines and uh, engineering and many other areas, which I'm going to outline in the next five minutes or so. Many feel that that uh, Theodore Maiman should have got the Nobel Prize, but unfortunately he did not. The discovery of the laser has led to tremendous benefits to society in communications, healthcare, and many other areas. And one of the main properties of the laser beam, as I'm sure all of you are aware of, it is a light beam, but the light coming from a bulb radiates in all possible direction, whereas the light coming from a laser is very directional. And because it is directional by an ordinary lens, it can be focused to a very small area, the radius of which is of the order of microns. Micron is a millionth of a meter. And so therefore, a laser beam falling on a lens, like the lens of your eye, can, can be focused to a very small area and therefore producing extremely high intensities. So a two milliwatt laser, if you look into it, it will produce an intensity of three megawatts per square meter. So which such high intensities will damage the retina. So whether whereas it is very safe to look at a 1000 watt light bulb because it radiates in all direction, it is very unsafe to look at a two milliwatt, two thousandth of a watt laser beam. And because it can be focused, so it can drill through concrete as I'm sure all of you are aware of. And there is a big lab in RRCAT, Raja Ramanna Center for Advanced Technology in Indore, developing lasers for industrial purposes. And a two kilowatt, this is an example of a two kilowatt fiber laser cutting through. This is just a light beam, a focused light beam can cut through steel. So therefore it has tremendous engineering application. The theme of our symposium, as I said, is the interface we are between biological and physical sciences. And so therefore the most important application of the laser beam is in eye surgery. Focused laser beams can cause, as I mentioned, retinal burns, but they are also extensively used to cure retinal detachment. But unfortunately, as was mentioned by the previous speakers also, most of the laser beams, not most, all laser beams that are used in eye surgery are imported. And there is no reason why we cannot develop the technology here to produce such lasers. A laser beam used for eye surgery, cataract surgery, retinal detachment surgery, and many others. In December 1961, a hospital in the US used lasers on human patients for the first time, destroying a retinal tumor. This was the time a this was the first time a laser was used for medical treatments. December 61, that was just one year after the discovery of the laser by Theodore Maiman. And then facial scars is a big industry, big, big application of lasers, which is present in India. But most of the lasers that are used are, again, unfortunately, imported mainly from China. But uh, that is how the state of the economy is. And therefore, and then there is one other application, powerful laser beams. Here we have shown eight laser beams getting focused to a target, producing temperatures in the billions of degrees Kelvin, so that the temperatures are produced what are, what are inside the sun, which can create fusion reaction. And there is a all round effort going on throughout the world to create temperatures and producing fusion energy. It has been successful to produce the fusion energy, but right now the amount of power that is fed is more than the power that comes out, than the energy that comes out. But when the reverse happens, when more energy comes out in the fusion process, we will have a fusion reactor and will solve all problems of our society, energy problems. And of course, because of the discovery of the laser, uh, these three gentlemen, Towns, Bezov, and Prokhorov. Towns was an American, and Bezov and Prokhorov was then in the Soviet Union. 
was received the Nobel Prize. And uh, I can't see the, the top one. Optical fibers now connect laser pulses propagating through millions of kilometers of optical fibers connect us across the oceans and has revolutionized communication. Today, I'm sitting in Delhi and you are in Bombay or Allahabad or, or has been possible because of fiber optics and lasers. Lasers are the, the pulse lasers are the signals which communicate through the optical fiber. And uh, this, this particular program can be seen anywhere in the world from from United States to, to United Kingdom to anywhere. And this revolution has happened because of photonics. And, uh, and the basic component is the optical fiber in which light guidance takes place because of total internal reflection. If the angle of incidence on a water air surface is at an angle greater than what is known as the critical angle, then you will have total internal reflection. And guiding of the light beam because of the total internal reflection was demonstrated by Daniel Colladon. And, uh, and, and that led to the optical fiber, which consists of a core of a higher refractive index. The cladding is usually pure silica, and the guidance of the light beam takes place because of the phenomenon of total internal reflection. And here you have a kilometers of the optical fiber guiding the light beam and the light that emanates from there is because of the phenomenon of relay scattering which is also responsible for the redness of the sky redness of the setting sun and the blue color of the sky in 1930 heinrich lamb a medical student in munich first assembled a bundle of transparent fibers to transmit an image he just took a large number of optical fibers and put them in order. This is known as a coherent bundle. So a dark spot here will be a dark spot there, a bright spot there will be a bright spot here. So the, in this case, you have the letter T. So this was discovered in 1930, in which the Indian physicist Narendra Kapani also played an important role. So here is a bundle of optical fiber. I'm sure all of you are familiar with it. And uh, these are aligned optical fibers, aligned optical fibers and which allow you to see the inside of the human body. This is known as the fiber optic endoscopy. And here you have the fiber optic endoscope being held by a human hand, which can be put inside the human body down the throat or through the anus. And one can see the inside of the human body and even carry out surgery without opening up the stomach or something like that. This is a revolution that has happened. It's a technology. It's a very significant technological development, but the, again, the unfortunate part of the story is that fiber optic endoscopes are still are still imported from from outside. And then you have plastic fibers, plastic large diameter fibers. These the fibers that I mentioned are small diameter. These are large diameter, one centimeter in diameter fibers, which are used in solar optics transporting light from the roof to the this is this this is not solar energy this is not solar energy it is transporting the light from the roof to the inside of the roof and this is a great technology for a country like india which has tremendous amount of sunlight you like you collect the sunlight to the rooftop and transport it to the inside of the room through these plastic optical fibers Unfortunately, the plastic optical fibers are also now not made in India. Glass fibers are made in India, and we are quite technically good in it. But uh, plastic fibers are not made in India. It is a it is a important technology, but there must be some problems. I had mentioned this at many many forums that India should get into a big way in the manufacture of plastic optical fibers. These are the collectors, and which illuminate the room. Now, what it now imagine all the schools and colleges and remote, remote villages where there is a lot of sunlight like Rajasthan, Gujarat, Maharashtra, Delhi, Punjab, Haryana. You can lit up the rooms without using electricity. It's a revolution it's a, that has happened. And people in Europe are using this technology. It's a big industry there. This has to come in a big way in a country like India, which has tremendous amount of, which is gifted with lot of sunlight. So you also have the, the important application, as I mentioned before, is in communication. And uh, this slide I had shown. And uh, there is a bandwidth revolution 
evolution that because of the optical fiber, because of the fact that the light beam has a very high frequency, therefore capability of transmitting a tremendous amount of information that that we can see now, you know, even 20 years back, telephone call to Bombay will cost me 100 rupees for three minutes. Now everything is free. I can talk to my friend in the United States, to my children in California without any cost. This revolution is because of optics, because of light, and because of the optical fiber, and because of the advent of the semiconductor lasers, which can be modulated with tremendous rapidity. So half of the 2009 Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded to Charles Kao for groundbreaking achievements concerning the transmission of light beam through fibers for optical communication. So lasers and the optical fiber have been res responsible for the internet revolution. Today, because of the COVID crisis, an enormous opportunity has come to India to teach the entire world sitting in Delhi or Bombay or Bangalore or, and then not only the entire world, but you see, see the impact of this revolution. We can now sitting in Delhi can teach young children in remote villages. We still have poverty. 30% of our population is still below the poverty line, which is a staggering 400 million people. How to remove this poverty? How to do only a few days back, we had in Hindustan Times article in which we said that there, India slips below the 101 level in hunger index. How to remove that? Only through education, through science and technology. And therefore, if we can now use this technology to go to remote villages, in our, not only in our country, but throughout the world. So therefore, there has to we have to invest more on photonics research, which has not only applications in, 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 in communications, in light, but also in medicine and uh, biology. So thank you for your attention. I'm sorry, I don't know how, how this uh, photograph came in. I just put it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, sir, for uh, such an enlightening uh, speech. Uh, giving details of the advancements and also the interdisciplinary research, which has led to many new things to the world. Adhut Anokha Vijyan ka vistar pradarshit kiya jo aapne baram bar dvalit karta hai hume kholne ko gyan aur vijyan ke nit nai adhut dwa. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, now we are coming to a very pleasant task, pleasant part of this uh, inaugural session and uh, before i should uh, say something about that i would like to invite madam madam manju sharma ji to say few words about uh, this award ceremony because this is a different and this is being done for the first time in the academy regarding the uh, welcome and regarding the respect giving to those who for this uh, pandemic period with their brevity and strength. Uh, Madam Panju Shabaji, please. Thank you, Neeraj. Uh, distinguished uh, scientists and part other participants. The Nasi Council uh, considered a proposal to, to felicitate some at least two of the, two was just the number Please mute yourself. Everyone may please mute. Now, can you hear me? Yes, madam. Yes. Everyone may please mute. So, uh, Nasi Council decided that uh, we will institute two awards for the young, uh, outstanding workers, health professionals or medical people or scientists who have contributed towards uh, the pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic, who have contributed towards prevention, uh, control, management, and research uh, in uh, handling COVID-19 pandemic situation. Uh, although it's a very small effort, but NASI has been doing this uh, uh, since uh, the pandemic started. Uh, we started a Jagarukta 
Abhiyan for COVID-19 and uh, have almost uh, had uh, more than 25 webinars in which very distinguished scientists have lectured and uh, it has been uh, uh, across the country in different strata of the society. So in, a, in its a small way, NASI has been actively involved and it has tried its effort to uh, contribute towards the management of COVID-19 pandemic. And it is in this connection that uh, the council decided to uh, confer these awards. But uh, before we give the awards to the younger people, uh, two younger people, uh, Dr. Neeraj Nishchal and Dr. Pragya Dhruv Yadav. Uh, we, I have one more very important uh, things to announce. While the expert committee was discussing uh, this uh, question of uh, how to select these young, uh, youngsters who have contributed enormously towards the COVID pandemic uh, management, uh, it was felt by the committee that one single person who stands out in this and who has who has really helped Nasi to communicate the message of importance of vaccines, important of science, scientific research, and also about the vaccine hesitancy, addressing different strata of the society. And that person, that scientist, is our great Professor G. Padmanabha. And the committee unanimously decided that we will just honor him with the uh, with in, in this uh, uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, all the issues which he has addressed, and uh, felicitate him in our annual session. All of you know Professor Padmanabha. I mean, I, we used to call him the big drama of uh, biotechnology. Uh, sometimes I feel we should call him Gautam Buddha. In his own quiet way, he keeps doing things which are absolutely outstanding. And he, he has contributed uh, so much to the field of biotechnology and biology. And today, when we stand amongst the, amidst the this pandemic, which is still continuing and, and it's not gone, we all rely so much on him, so much on Professor Padmanabhan for his golden words, which he has used through various lectures, very simple language, explaining to the people that how we must prevent the COVID and how vaccines are important and how the scientists have contributed and all other aspects. So, Professor Padmanabhan, it's my pleasure to invite you, and I'm sure the president, uh, Professor Ajay Ghatak, will confer and say this that we have given you this distinction. Professor Padmanabhan. Thank you, madam. Uh, we are coming one by one on the uh, this award ceremony. Mm -hmm. So, first, uh, we are giving this award to Dr. Neeraj Nishchal of All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. And this award carries uh, rupees 50,000 cash and the gold medal. The citation, I would like to request Dr. Pavitra to read the citation. Please. Award of honor to the COVID-19 frontline warrior presented to Dr. Neeraj Nishir, Department of Medicine, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi, for his significant contributions toward patient care prevention, control, and monitoring of the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as research and awareness building training to various state healthcare workers on the scientific management on the digital disease. Thank you. We congratulate Dr. Neeraj Nishchalji. Can we see him, Dr. Neeraj Nishchal? Dr. Neeraj Nishchalji? Aap hai? Has he joined? Yes, we are seeing him. Yes, we are seeing him. So uh, now we are coming to the second award. And uh, that is uh, for uh, 
Dr. Pragya Bhru Yadav of NIV Pune. I would Just like to request. I would like to request. Yes, madam. I just wanted to say one word about Dr. Neeraj Nishal. When the COVID-19 that its peak, we I was told the professors and faculty members of the All India Institute that Dr. Neeraj Nishal, 24 into 7, he worked, and thousands and thousands of patients he had seen. He, he came in the morning and late night he'll be available in the hospital. So they he has really done a monumental work in case of uh, COVID management. He has not only uh, self looked at the patients, but also helped and advised the state governments where the COVID was on peak. So Nasi uh, has selected him because of his uh, monumental contributions and we are all grateful to him for handling the pa patients and for the excellent patient care. Dr. Neeraj Dishchal, please. Yes, you, ma'am. Thank you for the kind words and I'm really privileged and uh, uh, and this, this in fact, uh, I will say because of the kind encouragement which you people have been giving me uh, time and again, uh, that has motivated me to keep uh, my best foot forward in this uh, trying times. And of course, this could not have been possible without the uh, team which I had, uh, the uh, willing team uh, who had, in fact, I am being awarded, but I will feel this award is for the uh, team which we had in place, all the frontline healthcare workers who who tried to, uh, because this pandemic situation was such that everywhere it was panic. And now you can see with this Omicron variant again, uh, hysteria is being created. and. Uh, uh, it was really trying time, but yeah, this type of motivation always will motivate us uh, uh, in uh, uh, doing best uh, in our abilities. Thank you so much for considering for this form, ma'am. Uh, now we are coming to the second body, Dr. Sadhya Bhu Yadav, and I will come in. I would like to request uh, Ms. Arjuna Pan to please read this citation. The, the citation goes like this Award of Honor to the COVID-19 frontline warriors presented to Dr. Pragya Dhruv Yadav from National Institute of Virology, Pune, for her outstanding work and scientific contributions towards prevention and control of COVID-19 pandemic, vaccine development, and other scientific research aspects related to the SARS-CoV-2 during the pandemic. The NASI congratulates both the scientists for their uh, accomplishments and they are outstanding work during the pandemic. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, would you like to say something? Yes, Honorable madam, Dr. Manish. Just a word that Dr. Uh, Pragya Yadav uh, is the head of the maximum testing facility at NIV. And she, again, just like Dr. Neera Nishal, uh, I have been informed by uh, no, nobody less than her own. Uh, boss Dr. Balram Bhargav very strongly recommended her candidature and she has worked 24 into 7 as far uh, te testing facilities and she uh, she was the one person at that time in NIV who was involved in every uh, aspect of uh, COVID uh, both at the state level and central level. So I'm very proud that a young lady has done this work and Nasi is really very, very happy about it. So we congratulate you, Pragya, on behalf of our president, our council, and all the fellows of Nasi. So congratulations, Pragya. Uh, Dr. Pragya ji, will you please say something? Uh, yes, uh, uh, thank you so much. I uh, First, I congratulate uh, Nasi for uh, uh, going for 91 of the Foundation Day. And I'm very fortunate to be here today with this August gathering of such a great uh, knowledgeable uh, people. I think it, this is a kind of a most intellectual gathering of this country where we have uh, such a, a big a senior members uh, of the Nasi to whom I have just listened in the morning. Uh, if we talk about the COVID, prior to COVID, India has many challenges. 
and as a head of a maximum container in facility state of the facility in India, uh, uh, we have been working on cream and cum, uh, Congo hemorrhagic fever, NIFA virus, uh, Zika virus, and many other challenging viruses. Even during the Ebola outbreak, our facilities serve to the country uh, quietly, and we screen each and every samples uh, on those cases which arrive uh, to different airports and they are suspected for Ebola uh, cases. And we could detect only one case which was quarantined in Delhi. After that, we work uh, during these years to train different laboratories of VRDLs on biosafety, bio-risk management. And recently, even during the pandemic, we have investigated NIFA outbreak uh, that include uh, a very adventurous program where uh, I lead a team of uh, scientists and technical staff, which is leaded by most of them are uh, females and they have small children. But during this pandemic, everybody work very hard. And I, as Madam said uh, that our Director General, uh, Secretary DHR, Dr. Balam Bhargav was a very motivational person uh, behind all the research which we did. And uh, during this uh, research, it was not just a detection and diagnosis, but we had a challenge of everything having on time in a very short period. And uh, we started our journey for uh, detecting the first three cases from Kela genomic sequencing. In, we were the first one to sequence the, the few genomes from India. And then slowly a country uh, got more capacity and we are having a huge capacity on even genomic sequencing. But it, after a few cases, then we one job to do the virus isolation and we could work on vaccine, preclinical studies, uh, the uh, non-human primate study, which we did. This is the India's first uh, study where we uh, done such kind of experiments in a containment facility. So we gone through a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, experiences which were unique during this outbreak. We have been working, working on high risk group of pathogen life-threatening diseases, but this experience of such volume was unique. Even we did work in 2019 when H1N1 uh, was a threat in the country, but uh, the kind of performance not only ICMR, but whole country and different organization has done, it is really remarkable. And I uh, thank uh, everyone in my team, including headquarter director NIV uh, for uh, be standing behind us when we were working uh, in the laboratories and uh, our team was working continuously. Even one, uh, some of our members, they went to Viran, they collected specimen uh, during uh, the demand of the time at uh, Udan Vision. We participated in different missions of the uh, country. We And the most important, which I really appreciate the team where I lead, that we develop everything indigenous from uh, first uh, real-time PCR to ELISA to all preclinical studies, and we could do these study, including vaccine, indigenous. So that give a lot of hope for country that we will be a self-sufficient uh, country in coming time. And as Dr. Bhag Bhagosar always said that we are super power for vaccine. And we would like to not only work for inactivated vaccine, but we should enhance our capacity on different vaccine platform, which is demand of the time. With this, I thank INSA for recognizing and giving opportunity to, to be here. Thank you so much. Thank yes. you very much. And now we are coming to the other very prestigious felicitation or award that is for Professor and Honorable G. Padmanabhan, sir. The award of honor for exceptional contribution during the COVID-19 pandemic, the National Academy of Sciences India, NASI, felicitates Professor G. Padmanabhan, former director ISC Bangalore, for his enormous contribution in the awareness programs all across the country on intricacies and management of coronavirus disease, with a special reference to knowledge building on vaccine development and other related aspects, and contributing several scientific articles for spreading awareness about COVID-19 pandemic. We are very much grateful to you, sir. Thank you. So, uh, may I request Professor Padmanabhan, sir, to say a few words regarding the acceptance of this recognition. Sir. 
Sir, we cannot hear you, sir. Sorry. Uh, yes, sir. It's indeed a great honor and privilege for me to have been recognized by Nasi. But, you know, I must confess one thing here. I was a member of the committee which selected these two awardees. But, you know, the committee strongly felt the person who should be felicitated is Dr. Manju Sharma. <laughs> The, the amount of contribution she has made is something phenomenal. But, you know, she has uh, suggested, put me there, but uh, I said I greatly value the appreciation. But whether you give her a certificate or not, we all know it is Dr. Manju Sharma who has really, you know, driven the entire COVID activity of NASI. I think this must be, I must put it on record uh, more than my own contribution. But uh, thanks again, uh, thanks again, uh, Nasi, for recognizing whatever I have done. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sir Supermanavan, for your very kind words. Thank you. Thank you, Sir. Uh, now, Professor Ashok Vishaji has also joined. Sir, can you listen? Can you hear me? Neeraj, we have to start the agriculture session now. Yes, yes, madam. Actually, he has joined to the vote of thanks. Uh, I just wanted to uh, request, sir, for the vote of thanks uh, because he was a part of this inaugural session. Uh, sir, can you uh, hear me? No, he is mute. Doesn't matter. So, uh, we are coming to the end of this session and we are very much grateful to our Honorable President, Professor uh, Ajay Ghatak, sir, for his continuous guidance, encouragement, and very valuable support for organizing this 91st annual session and the symposium. The whole program of the symposium was chalked out by respected Madam Banju Sharmaji and Professor Ashok Mishraji, and both of them worked together for making this program very much beneficial, scientifically rich, and in a coherent way, so that the interface could be utilized in the best way possible by the young researchers. We are really very much grateful to you, Madam, and also Professor Ashok Mishra. Uh, the thematic addresses given by Professor R. Siddharmanam, sir, and Professor G. Padmanabhan, sir, we have already told they were excellent and there is no comparison and they were really uh, carrying the theme of this uh, symposium. We are also very much grateful to both the learned speakers and the world famous scientists. Uh, the presidential address, uh, as I've already told, that was unique in the sense that it was having all so sorts of advancements in the science and technology, the main guiding principles which had led to certain innovations in the science and technology. And in the end, uh, with all these prestigious awards which have been announced for the uh, COVID-19 warriors, that is also a very good occasion which we organized in this session. With this, I thank everybody, all our past presidents, council members, fellows, and the members, as well as other distinguished guests who have participated in this inaugural session. With this, we are standing for the national anthem after which this session will end, and then we will start the very next session. Is there a time gap between the next session or we will start immediately? Uh, sir, immediately because we are lagging behind the studio. All right. Shabbat <laughs> shalom.
Thank you. Now I request Archana ji to carry on the next session. Please, Archana ji. So uh, sorry for this continuation and without break, we are starting the first very important session on agriculture and allied sciences. I will request uh, my co-chair, Dr. Barik also to join. Dr. Barik, you have joined? Sir, madam, I have joined. I'm here. Namaskar, Sapko. Is Dr. Mohupatra here? Has Dr. Mohupatra joined? Okay, we'll wait for him till he joins. Uh, oh, we will... Dr. Mohapatra? I'm here. Namaste, madam. You are there? Yeah, I'm here very much. Okay, so we have the first lecture by Dr. T. Mohapatra. Uh, Dr. Mohapatra, as all of you know, needs no introduction. He has been one of the most uh, dynamic secretary and director general of Indian Council of Medical Research. Uh, during his tenure, we have seen the phenomenal growth of both agricultural science as well as agricultural production and all other aspects. Uh, Professor Bahapatra has more than 170 research publications, both in national and international journals. He's a fellow of uh, all the three academies and the uh, National Academy of Agriculture Sciences, and he has received several prestigious honors, like Insai Young Scientist Award, NAS Tata Award, DVT Bioscience Award, NASI Reliance Industries of Platinum Jubilee Award, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, we are very happy and thankful to Professor Mohapatra, who has agreed to give us the first opening lecture in the agriculture session. Professor Mohapatra, please. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> I'll, if you allow, uh, if I am allowed, I can share my slides. Yes, please. There is some problem, so let me resolve it. Can you? Yeah, it is okay now. Is it okay? Visible? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. We, can, we can see it. Oh, uh, full screen. The whole yeah. slide you are able to see. Okay. Yeah, full screen. Already. Okay. So. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Manju Sarma, Madam, uh, uh, for uh, your kind words uh, of introduction, and uh, Dr. Barik and other delegates, uh, Honorable President, uh, Dr. Professor Ajay Ghatak, and uh, I do see Professor Padmanabhan and others. Uh, who are uh, uh, there in the past session, inaugural session, and uh, many other delegates. Uh, a very good afternoon to each one of you. Uh, uh, it's a privilege to be part of the NASI uh, program always, and more so because of uh, Professor Manju Sarma, uh, whom I always uh, uh, deeply regard uh, for her abiding interest. Uh, in uh, science, uh, biotechnology, uh, to be very specific, 
uh, and also delivery of the science for benefit of uh, humankind. Uh, so uh, uh, she has been also such a kind-hearted, compassionate human being. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, my uh, interaction with her and her guidance, starting from Rice Genome Program until date, uh, that continues. So my gratitude to you, Madam, for always being there to support, to guide, to mentor, uh, so, and provide uh, inspiration uh, to move forward. Uh, so in the context of uh, today's uh, uh, lecture, uh, let me uh, say a few words. Uh, the 91st annual session and symposium of NASI uh, has chosen the topic interface between biological and physical sciences uh, uh, towards Satmanir Bharat. So in this context, uh, I would uh, focus on uh, use of for some of the uh, physical science tools uh, in agriculture uh, in order to make it uh, uh, Atmanirbar self-reliant, self-sufficient. So uh, only a few examples I'll cite because time is limiting. We will not be able to uh, uh, you know, cover every aspect, but uh, touch upon a few of the aspects which we are working on. Uh, agriculture has uh, uh, been growing well, uh, more than 3% uh, growth uh, past four years. Data is presented here. Uh, so uh, more than 3%, uh, close to 4% you know, growth and more than 4% in one of the years. So this speaks uh, about uh, the kind of uh, uh, technology uh, that is driving the growth, the agricultural policies and the schemes uh, which are providing the impetus and uh, catalyzing this growth and moreover, the farmers' efforts, uh, which uh, uh, are bringing uh, much needed, again, the push uh, to this uh, growth. Uh, so, uh, um, and the GDP, uh, you know, hitting 20% uh, contribution from agriculture sector. Uh, so that is, uh, you know, that was declining, and then though during COVID years, the COVID uh, time, it has uh, gone up. Uh, so, uh, because the other sector contributions and decline. Uh, India is exporting because India is a, a surplus nation, agricultural surplus nation, uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, amount of export is increasing. Uh, despite COVID, it has touched 41, uh, more than 41 billion US dollar. Uh, the export e import is almost at the same level uh, as uh, previous two, uh, two to three years. Uh, so, so we are more than 19 billion plus, uh, you know, uh, additional uh, earnings from export uh, 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 if we take into account the import uh, bills. So that reflects that we are uh, not only feeding 1.3 billion plus population. Uh, we are also exporting, though we are importing, for instance, edible oil and uh, also some amount of uh, pulses. Uh, 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 during past four or five years, we had pulses revolution. Uh, we were able to produce additional uh, six to nine million tons of pulses. And in the process, use the uh, import um, by more than 50, 52% about. So, so that's the kind of uh, recent uh, developments, the government support uh, the, uh, to in the form of uh, uh, minimum support price increase uh, and also creating buffer stocks, uh, procurement, uh, all these contributing to uh, technology uh, going to field, uh, more and more uh, uh, area expansion also taking place and in the process uh, pulses production increasing very, very significantly. Uh, so uh, similarly, uh, the food grains, uh, which are uh, you know in uh, surplus uh, uh, after feeding uh, more than 80 crore population uh, of the country uh, more than six months, providing free ration uh, so during COVID times, all these were possible because uh, we had uh, surplus. Uh, these are a kind of export statements, uh, you know, with regard to uh, three years. Now how we are actually improving, the red ones indicate 2021 export, 
and you can see uh, it's not just uh, cereals which you have been traditionally uh, particularly rice uh, exporting uh, even uh, and animal products even the processed food products uh, has uh, increased uh, in terms of export floriculture fruits and vegetables uh, and so on and so forth uh, uh, these are uh, disruptive technology. Two examples I have taken how they are enabling uh, this uh, situation in agriculture. Usa Basmati 1121, the longest ever grain in the world. Uh, uh, when cooked, after cooking, it uh, uh, goes up to two centimeter in length uh, and uh, uh, earning uh, for us more than 19,000 crore uh, per year uh, by way of export. Uh, in terms of volume it's increasing, in terms of also value, uh, the return is increasing. Uh, past uh, five, six years uh, saw a revolution in sugar production in the country and uh, a variety CO238 uh, going large scale in the northern India in subtropical uh, uh, situation uh, and uh, area expansion uh, is all given there. Uh, and uh, how the crane, cane yield, sugar cane yield, giving uh, more than 20 tons uh, additional uh, uh, yield per hectare, and sugar recovery also going up to 12%, uh, so 3% almost close to uh, 2.5 to 3% increase in sugar recovery, and all these leading to 6 to uh, 7 million tons of additional sugar production. Uh, um, uh, you know, we require about 24, 25 million tons, and it is more than 32 million tons of sugar now because of this uh, technology going to fail. So these are the examples at how technology-driven, disruptive technology-driven agricultural growth in recent years has uh, enabled this country not only to be self-sufficient uh, and uh, also export. Uh, in addition to that, in case of sugarcane, we are able to take the decision to divert sugarcane juice and sugar for bioethanol production uh, so that we are able to uh, substitute 20 percent of uh, uh, petrol uh, and in the process reduce the import bills. Uh, agriculture can trigger job uh, late economic growth uh, primarily because not only that we are food sufficient uh, but also uh, we have been able to uh, reduce uh, poverty, and that's a very important uh, point mentioned was made, that uh, we were reducing poverty uh, before COVID at the rate of two, more than 2.5 percent per year, and that is very, very significant. And poverty reduction means agricultural oh. development, because agriculture and, agriculture and rural uh, settings go hand in hand. Uh, and uh, uh, if we talk of rural development, uh, and uh, poverty elevation, agriculture plays the most vital role. Uh, and agricultural growth uh, was enabling poverty reduction. The, the, uh, the COVID period has put a break and we, are, we were on our course to meet the uh, target of sustainable development goal by 2030 by way of uh, uh, the poverty reduction, uh, uh, keeping in view the rate at which we were actually moving. Uh, and hopefully we'll be picking up that growth uh, uh, once we address the COVID issues. Uh, India is ranking, uh, you know, for most of the agricultural products, either first or second position, and, uh, you know, and the per hectare agrochemical use is a bare minimum and largely organic agriculture being practiced in this country. And uh, also a rural per capita income is growing and that's the reason why the rural poverty is uh, declining. Uh, it's not to say that we have already eliminated poverty. Poverty still remains, and we have a lot more work to do. And we, if, if we address the issues in agriculture, uh, uh, and our sector will be able uh, to a great extent. What the Honorable Prime Minister says that we need speed, we need scale, we need spectrum. Uh, uh, for transforming uh, India, and uh, uh, we can't uh, sit idle. Uh, we need uh, disruptive technologies, we need the uh, disruptive innovations, and that should also be deployed, going to, should be going to the field, uh, so that we have sustainable agri-food system for ensuring food and nutrition security in the country. And the mention was made about the 
uh, uh, the index, uh, particularly the global hunger index, which is uh, you know which is now in news and being discussed. And uh, uh, we have uh, we had uh, in fact uh, been brainstorming session at the National Academy of Agricultural Sciences. And you do find there are uh, serious problems with the index which is being used at the global level. But besides the point that uh, what is uh, being used, and based on those comparisons, we do find uh, we have uh, challenges in this country with regard to nutrition. Uh, the woman nutrition, the child, child nutrition, all those uh, are uh, areas of concern, and we need to really address them. Besides addressing the kind of index which is being used, but uh, you know the realities are always there. Our national surveys do reveal that we have large-scale malnutrition uh, prevailing in this country. So we need to really address them. So food security uh, doesn't really ensure always nutrition security, but though uh, it is the prime requirement to address this. So we have many challenges, uh, and uh, uh, we have to really uh, meet these uh, challenges and uh, agriculture. Uh, 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 does uh, require uh, 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 many, many different inputs. Uh, the, uh, it's a primarily because it's a depending on monsoon. Uh, the, uh, the rainfall pattern varies from year to year. In the same year, it's not evenly distributed. Uh, and uh, the irrigation and fertilizer, because water availability is declining. So in uh, 1950-51, it was more than 5,000 cubic meter per capita. And now it has come down below 1500 cubic meter. The fertilizer application uh, and, uh, and not uh, really balanced. So it's not really used when plants require most uh, and uh, not in appropriate quantity, leading to uh, you know, a, a degradation of soils. The soil is degraded. So obviously soil system needs uh, uh, our attention so that health uh, of soil improves. And as a result, the sustainable agriculture happens. Uh, pest and disease uh, pattern is changing because of uh, the climate change. So this is a serious uh, uh, issue and we have seen COVID-19 and the challenges, how it is mutating and recent uh, Omicron uh, mutant uh, format, uh, that's uh, really quite uh, worrisome. Uh, whether it would be devastating or not, time will tell. But the, uh, the fact that it is accumulating uh, a number of mutations uh, obviously, that might uh, assume uh, very serious proportions in uh, time to come. Uh, so, uh, in that context, the plant uh, pests and diseases are also evolving, and uh, uh, that could be one such uh, problem which might devastate the uh, field crops and horticulture crops, even animals and uh, our uh, fishery system, and the process uh, uh, devastate the whole production system in the country. Uh, so uh, we have small and marginal farmers, 85, 86 percent, uh, and that is uh, again uh, uh, having a less risk-bearing ability. And in the context of change in terms of climate, soil, water, so natural resource base getting degraded, land degradation out of 142 million hectares of net zone area, 97, 98 million hectares uh, being degraded because of continuous uh, extraction of nutrients and replenishment not happening at appropriate uh, level and according to the requirements, uh, you know, as per the recommendations. Uh, so, so there are issues and concerns. So similarly, uh, with regard to rainfall and uh, uh, temperature, sea level rise, and so there are all kind of concerns and we have our commitments uh, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions over and above uh, what the challenges we are facing. So these are the kind of issues uh, that uh, we are facing. The frequency of extreme events in India is increasing. In past 10 years, uh, you know, you can see the kind of drought events, flood events, 10 of them, cyclone, seven of them, hailstorm, five of them, and different areas getting impacted. So it's all, uh, you know, we have, we are seeing, and the, the, we, the, this is uh, all uh, a fact, and we can't uh, wish away uh, the climate change at its impacts. And this is one, uh, frequency of extreme events uh, increasing. And the impact has been measured and we are trying to uh, have adaptation measures. And by way of that, we are trying to address these uh, impacts and the yield loss in case of rice, it is assessed, estimated to be 6%. Uh, 
wheat 10%, maize 18%, and mustard 10%, and various crops we have assessed what could be the impact. And uh, we are trying to use technology and various forms of technology and trying to reduce the impact and address these, uh, you know, uh, impact of climate change in, in different crops and cropping systems and also animal and fishery systems. Uh, what we are actually uh, trying to uh, uh, manage now uh, is uh, uh, by uh, employing smart agriculture practices. Uh, uh, and how do we really do this? Uh, the agriculture has to be sustainable, has to be, uh, uh, you know, our technology have measurable impacts and uh, uh, what we target has to be attainable uh, in terms of product quantity, quality, uh, and uh, also profitability. Uh, we, we have to do this with a fair amount of responsibility, uh, and that is responsibility of everyone. And uh, all that we do at the farm level, uh, uh, you know, uh, up to the fork level, we should be able to track and trace what is really happening and where it is happening. So digital agriculture platforms are being deployed uh, in the entire agri-food value chain, uh, you know, before production to uh, post-production and consumption stages. So, so how do we actually mainstream this and use physical, uh, you know, sciences uh, uh, effectively uh, so that uh, we address the concerns, address the impacts of climate change and so on and so forth. We can do yield mapping, uh, we can do GPS guidance system uh, use effectively, uh, and uh, we can go for uh, understanding what is happening with regard to soil, water, uh, uh, and, uh, and manage accordingly. Uh, and we can also have variable uh, rate of application. Uh, in the process, uh, you know, we can have uh, efficient production system. We can have the quality produced uh, and then delivered at the uh, doorsteps of uh, the consumers. Uh, and uh, with adequate profit to the farmers. So use of uh, uh, IOTs, robotics, drones, big data, uh, sensors, uh, AI, and so on and so forth, all these are being mainstreamed in smart agriculture uh, platforms uh, in order to enable agriculture uh, to be uh, uh, very precise. And uh, in, uh, in, a, in a phrase, uh, to make agriculture as a precision agriculture platforms and we call it smart farming. And uh, globally, it is actually recognized. Uh, we need uh, sensing technologies. We need software applications. We require communication systems. Uh, we require uh, telematics and uh, positioning technologies, and uh, also other hardware and software systems, data analytics uh, solutions, and so on and so forth to make agriculture smart. Uh, and uh, we need to also have climate smart agriculture if we can predict. Uh, what is going to happen if we know based on sensors, what is the actual situation, and real-time monitoring can happen. Accordingly, we use technology uh, so that we can enhance productivity, we can enhance quality, and uh, in the process, we can improve the nutrition outcomes, we can have better adaptive uh, measures on play, in, in place, and uh, have a resilient uh, uh, production system, and uh, so climate impacts would be minimized in the process. And greenhouse gas emissions can also be uh, re uh, reduced very significantly in agricultural uh, situations. So this is a complicated one, but it's very to simplify this, that we have various agencies working and uh, left hand side, and the middle one, we have the decision support system in place, and uh, some are in place and more are, more are being worked out based on the data which is being generated. Uh, and uh, we are using large-scale remote sensing, we are using now drones, and we are using sensors, we are uh, using data uh, to, uh, uh, to have a uh, uh, you know, uh, decision support system and uh, uh, use uh, AI uh, uh, to use all the information system available to predict what should be done and what can be done, and uh, go for irrigation scheduling, uh, you know, also go for appropriate time of sowing and harvesting, uh, application of agrochemicals and so on and so forth, and other agronomic practices. So, so all these kind of uh, information tools and technologies uh, are being utilized at this stage 
uh, you know, a more more of uh, uh, you know kind of pilot uh, uh, level, uh, and then uh, you know going for uh, prediction and decision support system. Uh, so uh, using uh, obviously our own system, which is existing in the form of Krishi Vigyan Kendra, and also mobile communications being mainstream uh, and wo uh, uh, worldwide uh, web also being uh, you know used. So uh, sensor technology, weather parameters, all integrated into this system, and uh, you know we are communicating to the farmers using audio, video, image, and text. So uh, and not only that we are doing, but large number of youngsters, uh, IITNs, coming back to agriculture and using the smart agriculture tools, precision agriculture tools to uh, to have uh, productive, efficient, smart agriculture systems in this country. And uh, this is uh, use of sensors, large scale, the sensor technology, uh, the spectral ones, uh, panchromatic to hyperspectral uh, sensing technologies, spatial ones, and uh, with regard to pixel from one kilometer to centimeter level resolutions, and time which was taking 24 days now, 30 minutes, and radiometric ones from seven to 16 bit. So all these, you know, at different levels of operation, whether it is satellite or even uh, planes or uh, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles or ground level. So different levels of sensing taking place uh, and in the process enabling uh, uh, real time data generation uh, and in the process decisions taken on this spot and uh, guided uh, guiding uh, precision agriculture. Uh, the plants are being taken to imaging system, non-destructive, say, high-throughput imaging system, which is uh, one which is called Phenomics Facility, IARI, which was inaugurated by Honorable Prime Minister. So plants, so they're all kind of visual, NIR, VNIR, SWIR, uh, chlorophyll fluorescence, infrared, LIDAR, and all these sensors being utilized uh, in, in days where plants are taken to the camera, plants are grown in pots, uh, uh, you know, measured quantity of irrigation water is supplied, the nutrient supply system is given according to the requirements, and the climate is also, uh, you know, kind of monitored and controlled. So as a result, one can also manipulate the climate and simulate the climate change uh, situations. In the process, see the impacts on crop growth, development, and performance, uh, and then accordingly develop technology. So that is one aspect of it. And the natural environment, field environment is also happening. The camera is also taken to the plant in the form of mobile platforms and also use of drones. And uh, so this is what is enabling the precision uh, agriculture at this point in time. Huge amount of data is being generated in the process. And uh, so this is what you know, is summarized that how, uh, uh, you know, uh, in how many districts we are using this you know, uh, uh, near uh, 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 kind of, uh, of uh, auto, uh, the remote sensing uh, uh, technology to understand uh, the soil parameters, the crop growth conditions, and so on and so forth, and how the yield is being impacted. So also NDVI, LST, and rainfall, and crop residue, uh, you know, uh, management, particularly the morning events, and all these are being monitored, uh, you know, uh, in detail and the satellites are utilized and their data is collected and the, the data, both night and daytime data is also being collected to monitor what is really happening at the country level. And so that we can give, uh, you know, uh, not only the yield data, but also predict, uh, you know, uh, the kind of uh, soil moisture changes which is happening so that the crops can be accordingly planned. So crop planning can happen. And that's a major issue in the country. And similarly, the crop residue burning. Uh, so anyway, so this is uh, uh, the kind of Nanaji Deshmukh Plant Phenomics Center, which was created, and where uh, the uh, different uh, imaging platforms I was talking about, uh, you know, image-based phenom, phenom analysis, which is taking place. So we understand the whole plant architecture, the, uh, the kind of, uh, uh, you know, performance that is uh, uh, doing uh, under varied conditions, uh, less moisture, less nitrogen, or less, less phosphorus, and uh, you know uh, the internal parameters, how they are changing. So all that is being monitored, even root imaging uh, through near infrared uh, 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 spectroscopy and uh, visual range as well, chlorophyll fluorescence. Uh, so so all these are being done 
uh, in detail. So observation science to information science to predictive science, we can predict uh, what is really happening. And uh, till date, approximately 52 million images have been generated, which is a huge database has been created. And uh, this is being analyzed using data analytics tools, which we have high performance computing facility at the Indian Agricultural Statistics Research Institute, where we are actually uh, doing this and trying to understand uh, how the uh, climate change and various stresses, biotic and abiotic spaces, impacts crop growth and so that we can address these problems under field conditions. Crop physiological parameters, whether leaf area index, leaf wetness and chlorophyll content and all that uh, can be are being analyzed and you can see the top uh, graphs, uh, left hand side, side and right hand side, if you can see right hand side, what is estimated and what is measured and how they are correlated. R square is equal to 0 0.91. So obviously we can uh, measure it and then uh, you know, estimate it and they are going, uh, you know, uh, they're uh, almost uh, corresponding. So, so this gives us confidence that all this data uh, can be, image-based data can be utilized. So I'm taking more time, let me go fast. And similarly, the UV-based remote sensing, uh, you know, uh, has been uh, utilized uh, to understand uh, the irrigation requirement by way of monitoring drought, and the also nitrogen requirement in the soil by way of monitoring uh, the uh, the plant uh, you know characteristics, particularly uh, the uh, chlorophyll fluorescence and uh, uh, NDVI data, which is being utilized. So, so this is uh, uh, happening, uh, you know, and then various parameters are being worked out and standardized in the process so that large scale uh, you know application of technology can happen in farmers field. The airborne imaging also the uh, uh, happening for soil map and soil fertility assessment and uh, the uh, the lab based assessment and then uh, the, uh, the airborne imaging spectroscopy based assessment which is being uh, you know analyzed and correspondence being established to uh, say that this can be again uh, 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 utilized under field conditions in fact this is what uh, is indicated here the composite soil fertility map, uh, you know, uh, uh, and then that can be utilized for customized fertilizer application. So in a particular field, what is the situation with regard to soil fertility and uh, how much nitrogen or phosphorus or potassium it would be requiring? And that's what is being calculated based on this, uh, you know, for soil fertility mapping. So it's a elaborate activity. And I believe in, in time to come, we would be able to utilize this large scale. And this is another real-time monitoring of uh, crop burning, which is happening. And for past three years, we have been doing this and providing the data to the country, uh, to everyone, to the policymakers, to understand how things are happening and how much reduction is taking place, in which farmers feel it is happening. And uh, in fact, the farmers were penalized based on this, although those are all now being addressed in different manner. So uh, it's not for the sake of penalizing farmers, but to understand how much we are burning and in the process uh, what would be the negative impacts and how do we really intervene by way of technology like uh, you know machines called happy shader and uh, in those villages where the machines are not there farmers are helpless and if we can provide machines and so that burning can be addressed so for that from that perspective they have been used and biotic stress management rice brown plant hopper and you can see the left hand side the graph says that different levels uh, based on reflectance spectra for rice plants and the level of uh, uh, brown plant hopper infestation, you can see the middle table and how what extent the uh, brown plant hopper has infested the rice plant. And you can see the correspondence in the lower graph, uh, the predicted uh, uh, um, uh, uh, kind of reflectance spectra based on that. Uh, uh, and then the measured uh, infestation the predicted infestation and measured infestation has a high degree of correspondence. And, uh, you know, so that says that uh, this method can be utilized. So at the experimental level, it's a clear evidence to show that for biotic stress monitoring, we should be able to utilize this and then uh, analyze uh, an application of pesticides and all that can happen. And similarly, uh, you know, uh, wheat yellow rust monitoring, that has also happened very effectively. And uh, if you see, uh, again, the spectral, uh, you know, kind of signatures, if we take, and then spectral variation uh, 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 is understood, 
based on the level of uh, infestation by uh, with yellow rust and the process uh, one can understand how this is really happening the disease severity when the uh, ndy uh, score is high and the disease severity is high and then uh, you know that's a perfect correspondence between them so spectral index uh, used for uh, wheat yellow rust monitoring and the process addressing the problem by way of uh, you know management practices so that is uh, what uh, is required and drone based applications there are many of them and we have started uh, doing spraying uh, you know so a small farmer can utilize drones to spray pesticides spray nano urea which is now commercialized uh, you know that's another aspect of physical science how it is being utilized i'll not go into those details because of time limitation that uh, nano urea being sprayed using drones and both physical uh, science application in the field of agriculture and bringing revolution in the process and the large scale field application is awaited so but then they are all validated and i i strongly believe that uh, nano urea application can go and now 2 million hectares uh, where nano urea is being used and through uh, you know aerial sprays uh, they are uh, now in practice precision aquaculture it's not just a crop based agriculture even uh, fishery uh, system is also uh, uh, you know being uh, you know targeted uh, for uh, precision uh, uh, methods to be utilized effectively and so that uh, we make it far more efficient whether it is weather and water quality monitoring uh, you know gis based uh, uh, diagnosis of diseases and auto feeding and the growth performance of the feces and all these are happening and even we have used recently and i was there there very much to understand the ganges water quality uh, and uh, based on imaging and water sampling so we can understand the quality of water uh, in our uh, you know of the uh, water reservoirs and ponds uh, and the precision aquaculture can uh, uh, integrate Uh, uh intelligent ecological simulation techniques to provide uh, optimized culture conditions for aquatic animals in the process enhance productivity uh, and in the process profitability uh, of aquaculture system then similarly precision animal farming livestock monitoring system uh, and then uh, obviously uh, wireless uh, sensor network the wsn uh, being utilized to, to understand uh, the animal health particularly so biosensor models being there uh, and the jigby model being there precision amplifier being there processing amplifier being there so all these uh, monitoring animal health uh, and uh, understanding uh, how the animal is performing what is actually required when the animal is in heat and various aspects uh, which are uh, being addressed at this point in time in years to come i'm sure uh, it would be far more precise Uh, uh you know with regard to animal farming uh, and uh, uh, so obviously uh, our productivity which is uh, very low at this point in time because we have a local uh, you know breeds not very productive but if we can address their requirements the feed requirement their health needs and all that are addressed we will be able to enhance productivity uh, effectively so uh, and similarly uh, we are able to based on the uh, you know use of different parameters we are uh, you know uh, forecasting that uh, whether our area under various crops is going to uh, reduce or going to increase because that would define future agriculture in this country so a lot of uh, ai and uh, you know uh, other data analytics tools, tools are being utilized to understand you know what is going to happen to agriculture Uh, in another 20 30 years and that's what you know climate analog sites have been identified for black paper small cardamom and cumin and fortunately we see that uh, there is possibility of area expansion uh, the uh, the blue ones indicate that there is possibility of area expansion in future so uh, so that's a kind of uh, positive things from analysis just come so digital tools are being utilized in the, uh, to revolutionize uh, the uh, uh, information flow from the lab to the land that has been a concern of honorable prime minister and the uh, the digital platforms are effectively being utilized to communicate to the farmers uh, various uh, you know kind of scientific informations which are available with us and i share knowledge base for precision agriculture this is just summarized i'll not go into the details there's no time in fact to go into those 
but I said few of these things, particularly spectral signatures of soils, crops, and all that, how they are being utilized, precision phenotyping, how it is happening, and crop simulation modeling, how it is happening, and uh, soil mapping, how it is happening. Some of these things I highlighted, but there are many more things which we are doing at this point in time. And we are also not doing any isolation. We have collaboration with IIT Delhi. We have collaboration with CSIR institutions and other institutions as well to really take it through. And decision support system, how it is happening, very briefly summarized, so I'll not really go into those details. And the process, we are creating climate resilient villages. 150 of them, now they are 150 clusters in most vulnerable districts of the country. And uh, so droughts and, uh, and then drought and flood, drought salinity, based on that we have identified uh, you know, the most vulnerable districts and there we have created this uh, you know, uh, uh, cluster of villages uh, and putting technologies to address the climate change impacts uh, and in the process make agriculture sustainable, uh, profitable, uh, and uh, less risk prone, and so that the farmers, small and marginal farmers, continue doing agriculture. So there are a lot of mitigation potential of different technologies which have been actually worked out. I'll not go into those details, and they're put in place at the village level. And village level institutions are being created by in, the, in those villages, because without this, only physically, by employing physical or chemical or biological tools and techniques, will not be able to address unless we actually address the issues and concerns at the ground level, grassroots level. And uh, that is one approach that we have capitalized on based on our strength already have in the form of Prishya Vigyan Kendra and the climate, uh, uh, village climate risk management committee we have created, custom hiring centers we have built, seed production systems established, for our product banks and product production system and commodity-based organization, they are being created. So in the process, the climate resilient village system uh, in this 150 of them, they are actually taken as examples to be replicated. And there's one uh, World Bank funded program in Maharashtra in where 5,000 villages have been taken to be made climate resilient. So, so this, uh, you know, and in, uh, in uh, uh, the, uh, the with, uh, collaboration with the University, Agriculture University, Rauri, we have one village where the precision agriculture tools are already being applied and farmers are uh, using those uh, decision support system using precision analysis, IoT, and uh, AI being uh, you know, put in place there, along with sensors and imaging platforms. So small farm mechanization, another area where we are focusing so that the, uh, the uh, requirements of uh, those small farmers are addressed adequately for various operations. I'll not go into those, but summarize. In addition to this, because agriculture cannot flourish unless there is investment, and there are opportunities in the post-harvest space to address the issues and concerns. That's the reason why these are the recent uh, you know, uh, steps taken by the central government, uh, the setting of one lakh crore agri-infrastructure fund for farm gate infrastructure. And that's a huge one. So, uh, so the youngsters are being uh, encouraged to actually go for entrepreneurship and then the farm gate infrastructure to be created. So that processing takes place, value addition takes place, and then returns to farmers increases and also consumers get uh, the returns for uh, the uh, you know, uh, uh, money he spends. And similarly, uh, you know, 4,000 crore for hobble cultivation, 20,000 crore for fishermen through Pradhan Mantri, Matsya Sampada Yojana, 10,000 crore for formalization of micro food enterprises, animal husband infrastructure development for 15,000 crore, and uh, 500 crore scheme for infrastructure development for beekeeping, and uh, so on and so forth. So there are various, uh, uh, you know, kind of schemes and provisions and uh, investment uh, government is doing so that we have Atmanirvar Bharat. So that's what is actually emphasized that farmers are enabled, they are able to actually carry out their work with the help of new tools and technologies. They are not dependent, they are self-reliant more and more, uh, and uh, you know, or the, the, uh, their doorsteps, uh, everything is delivered. So that is one way of looking at it, Atmanirbhar Bharat. And the other way is that providing adequate infrastructure, investment, 
and so that uh, you know all the kind of gaps which are existing in agriculture and uh, production post production scenarios uh, so they are also addressed so it's a holistic approach for smart agriculture and post agriculture post production uh, operations so that the food and nutrition security is ensured and we have sustainable agri food system in this country for time to come and i'm sure uh, you know the only few examples of uh, application of physical science and integration with the biological science and also the government policy and support uh, to enable agriculture to make it uh, you know atmanirbhar and self sustainable and self reliant so this thank you very much i have taken more time so i may be excused for that so thank you very much uh, uh, honorable chair for uh, this opportunity Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mohapatra, for this outstanding lecture, and uh, uh, it has brought out so well that uh, the agriculture also needs a tremendous intervention of science and technology, and especially the physical sciences are contributing uh, towards agriculture for increasing the productivity, resilience, and all other aspects. Uh, the, we are short of time, so I won't uh, say too much at, at this stage. Uh, I will request Dr. Barik. Uh, would you kindly introduce Dr. Akhilesh Tyagi? Dr. Barik? Yeah, thank you, madam. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Professor Akhilesh Tyagi, who is a renowned plant biologist and known for his studies in the plant genomics and biotechnology. He is the past president of our NASHI and also the former director of National Institute of Plant Genome Research, NIBGR Delhi. And currently he is serving as the professor in the University of Delhi, Plant Molecular Biology Department. Uh, he led first successful Indian initiatives on genome-wide sequencing of rice, tomato, and desi chickpea. And this has heralded a new era of high throughput genomics in India. And uh, he is an elected fellow of all the three major Indian science academies. Uh, in SA, NASI, and in Academy of Sciences, Bangalore, also NAS. Uh, and uh, the Department of Biotechnology of the Government of India awarded him the National Bioscience Award for his career development, for the career development, one of the highest Indian science awards for his contribution to biosciences in 1999. Uh, he has been in the forefront of uh, plant genomic research in this country, as I said, and one of his very important contribution is also that he has uh, identified, characterized the regulatory gene families in the plants and during the evolution. And also his works on the biotic and abiotic stresses are uh, noteworthy and he is a leader in that field. Uh, with, uh, he has many contributions, but to shortly tell, uh, introduce Dr. Tyagi. He himself has joined our art biogenome project for this country. And with this introduction, I uh, request Dr. Akhilas Tyagi to deliver his talk, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can uh, Nazi stop sharing their content? That is my introduction so that I can share. All right. And uh, let me see. So if the screen is full and you can hear me. Yes, everything is okay. All right. <clears throat> So uh, let me start uh, thanking Dr. Barik for uh, uh, kind introduction and also the chairperson, Dr. Manju Sharma, who has been always encouraging. I am uh, really grateful that uh, distinguished luminaries of uh, Indian science scenario are there along with students and NASI uh, officials uh, for this particular symposium, which is going on. And uh, friends, you have seen uh, Dr. Mahapatra presenting a cross section of agriculture, and it clearly shows that how huge is the overall effort. Myself, I myself plan to concentrate only on one aspect of it, and that is diversifying crop genomes. Now, crop genomes 
are and also the agriculture per se is important for sustainability development goal achievement particularly there are uh, several of them like no poverty zero hunger good health and well-being quality education affordable land clean energy climate action life below water and life on land so these are about seven of the goals which cannot be achieved without the intervention in agriculture sector now one of the intervention has been done in this sector by genetically improving the crop plants and we all are aware of the green revolution which during 65 and 95 almost tripled the grain food grain production but the important point is as dr mahapatra also said that in last 20 years about 75 million more of the food has been produced but what we need in another 30 years is about another 150 million tons of the food and we hope that uh, this modern agriculture and interventions at different levels would be able to achieve it and uh, india would remain not only atmanirbhar in food production but would also be a a major exporter of the agriculture goods in addition to this requirement which i have projected we have to also face the environmental degradation and social disruption which is going on because of environmental degradation which are creating very unwanted situation in the or like urban slums and the farming is getting neglected so these all have to be care, taken care of to sustain the agriculture production and achieve the targets. In this, genomics could help in a small way. And if we ask what is genomics, then it includes several components, like you compile genome sequence of organisms, you establish location of all genes and regulatory elements, establish fun function of all genes and regulatory elements, identify superior alleles, and deploy knowledge for agriculture, health, and ecosystem. Now, there are two ways in general for sequencing the genomes. One is the classical way in which first we do the mapping and align the fragments of DNA with the chromosome. And so we go by map and sequencing. That is the upper one. And another one is that we break the whole DNA of the cell into small pieces, sequence them, and assemble them with the computation power. So out of these two methods, we have first deployed in India uh, the map and sequence method for sequencing rice genome, which is about 400 million bases as a part of international consortium. And I need not emphasize that rice is a pillar of Indian food security. Now this work was done because Dr. Manju Sharma allowed a team to be built in the South Campus and in, in NRCPB. And you see Dr. Mahupatra was also part of it, uh, along with several of the distinct, distinguished scientists of today. Now, this work was appreciated by then Prime Minister Sri Atal Bihari Vajpayee And he said that it is a matter of great pride for India that its scientists have contributed to the international effort. Uh, but in addition to this, this was the team which uh, was present at the time of commemoration event when the rice genome was uh, released. And you see Dr. Manju Sharma has led uh, this team in Japan uh, celebration time. <clears throat> now let me start scientifically. The first thing which was done, and Dr. Mohapatra played an important role in this, was the genetically anchored back-based physical map of India. In this case, the whole genome of rice was broken into small fragments, cloned in the bacteria as bacterial artificial chromosomes, and then genetically anchored with the help of genetic markers on the 12 chromosomes of rice. Now, sequencing was done. And what came as a surprise is that 60% of the genome of rice, as you see in the form of these strips, is duplicated. And this duplication has happened about 60 million years back 
that was the time when the environment upheavals have happened uh, and that was also the time when dinosaurs disappeared so probably environmental changes were responsible for duplication of the genome of the progenitor which became rice of today in addition to that we continued to work not only on rice but also produced the sequence as international effort of tomato and also of the wheat genome in due course and uh, several institutions including nrcpb south campus uh, punjab agriculture university and also uh, nipgr have been part of these efforts but scenario has changed with next generation sequencing and uh, several of the genomes have been sequenced by indian scientists themselves among them first efforts were made in chickpea and you will see that desi kavuli as well as wild chickpea genome were sequenced in addition to that pigeon pea finger millet pearl millet tulsi neem mango jute and certain more genomes have been sequenced by indian scientists themselves that means that the technology has not only been uh, learned but has been absorbed by several institutions in india and that was the first task that this technology should spread in different laboratories in india now of course worldwide there are more than 400 uh, crop genomes available and uh, this work is going on ultimately into the nebulation of the project which is called as World Earth Biogenome Project. In Earth Biogenome Project, it is planned to sequence in next 10 years about 1.5 million eukaryotes which are present on the Earth. And this is expected to revolutionize our understanding of biology and evolution, conserve, protect and restore biodiversity and create benefits to the society for human welfare. And remember that the most powerful technology as of today is genome editing and a deployment of genome editing requires that we have, we have the genome sequence information and then it can provide help to the bioeconomy. So that has been the idea of Earth Biogenome Project and I hope India would also be able to participate in such a globally important project in the area of genome sequence. Of course, in the genome, we were able to find out several genes which are common not only among plants, but also common with animals and remaining half of them were specific to specific subdivisions or taxa of the, of the plants. And in that step onwards, we went into functional genomics and then to first try to know the, the expression profile of the more than 30,000 genes which we have found in case of rice. And we were able to do a chip analysis by which expression profile of these genes were worked out. And analyzing these sequences, it was possible to identify, for example, the genes which will specifically express in the panicle of rice or the genes which will specifically express in the seed of rice and nowhere else in, 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 the, in the plant. So these gave the idea that if a gene is expressing at one stage, it should have the relevance for creation of that stage. And that became a starting point. In addition to this, we annotated the genome of rice continuously. There have been four versions of this and identify several nucleates. Like this is one of the transcription gene family, zinc finger gene family, and here is a clade which is similar to yeast, uh, which could be its progenitor, but then there were specific clades which were identified in rice. So that shows that how diversity of the genome has increased over the period of time as evolution has taken place. Now, as I was saying, we contributed to four versions of the whole genome annotation because as information accumulates, the genomes need to be annotated and a new versions should be brought out. We also worked on the gene families for transcription factors, epigenomic regulators and regulatory networks in order to find out what is the relationship of these genes and what is their expression profile. And we also undertook the 
formation of the expression atlas for biological processes like water deficit response, hormone response, and reproduction in case of rice. Now, this led to the next step in the process, and we were able to find out regulatory sequences by hooking the different sequences from differentially expressing genes with reporter genes. And here you see that how one of the promoter is expressing only in anther and the pollen grain, which is the male part of the, of the plant and not in the roots or the leaves of the plant. So that way, why some genes express in one stage and not in another, uh, the knowledge about that was gained. And this knowledge was then used to produce male sterile lines, which formed the basis of hybrid vigor in case of rice. And you can see here that we hooked with an anther specific promoter, a gene called as ornithinase, which converts acetylated form of the herbicide into non acetylated form, which kills the pollen grains. And that's why you see here that the control has got the normal pollen grains, but in the transgenics, the pollen grains have been killed and this plant has become sterile. So this male sterile line can be used for production of the hybrid vigor in case of rice. And it is a technological advantage to the, to the breeders and as well as the farmers. Not only this, we identified the genes which will cause male sterility. So earlier we were emphasizing promoters. Now we are emphasizing on the, on the genes. And here is one of the transcription factor, which is called as basic helix loop helix transcription factor. When this was made defective, then anthers did not die. And as you will see, the pollen grains were also shriveled. And that again, because the pollen grains were sterile. So another way of approaching the sterility in rice was, was, was uh, attained. And it was also learned that which genes are involved in the fertility in case of rice. Then we moved from the regulatory factors to the communicators and the communicators are the ones which communicate between transcription factors and the transcription machinery of the plant. And when we made uh, one of such uh, gene defective, which is a mediator gene, and then we found that the architecture of the plant is affected, they become dwarf, and this is sometimes a desirable phenotype. But we also learned that this also affect the secondary branching in the roots and this secondary branching could be restored by application of the hormones externally and therefore we knew that there is something going on as far as the hormone distribution in the plants is concerned we also found because of this defect a reduction in the branching in the panicle and pollen sterility and along with that there was a resultant decrease in the case in the case of the seed weight thus we found that there is one uh, one gene which is affecting different uh, vegetative stages and also the reproductive stages and then we went on to look for which of the regulators are being interacted with this mediator to convey their message to the transcription machinery and this was done by what is called as the East 2 hybrid assay or immune precipitation. And we were able to establish this model in which the same gene, which is mediator, interacts with three different regulators to establish development of anther, seed, or lateral organ development. And that is how we learned that how uh, these different regulators communicate through uh, one component with that of the transcription machinery and our important formation of different organs of the rice. Now, it is not always that we make the organs defective. We were also able to improve uh, the seed size by knocking down one of the genes. And this is gene is called as the grain weight 2 gene. And you see, this is the wild type and this is the, this is the uh, knockdown line and here we could see that there is 20 to 30 percent increase in case of the seed weight. So both kinds of the possibilities could be explored by doing the functional genomics. 
we not only restricted to different organs, but we also went into the into the stress response of the rice plant. And we know that rice needs a lot of water, about 3,300 liters of water for production of one kilogram of rice. And that's why sometimes I tell jokingly that when we export rice, as a matter of fact, we are exporting water uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a huge amount. But our idea was to look for the genes which will be induced in the stress condition. And we found a gene family of zinc finger proteins which are induced in cold water deficit, mechanical wounding, submergence, and also in the heavy metal conditions. Now, these genes have been transferred into rice, and you can see that if there is a normal wild type plant, if we give it a stress, then the number of grain it is able to produce goes very drastically down, but the transgenic lines are able to produce a significant amount of the seeds. So, uh, our efforts uh, in finding out the genes responsible for stress tolerance were also successful. From this point, uh, so far I have been talking to you about the reverse genetics in which we knew the gene and we tried to find out the phenotype. But now I will tell you some examples from India in which phenotype was known, but the gene controlling for that was not known, which was found and ultimately introduced into other varieties of rice to improve rice and other crops. Now, this is just to show that how variable are the phenotypic traits in case of rice, be it the seed size, panicle size, or the root length and the root, low root strength. And so, this variability exists, but question is, what causes this variability? So, on this, that line, we looked for the seed uh, related traits, and by doing a genome-wide association analysis, we were able to find out 13 new genes and also 10 genes which were already known to be associated with that of the grain size in case of rice. So discovery of new genes which will affect the grain size uh, was possible by applying the uh, genomic genome-wide association study. And then these QTLs were ultimately also mapped genetically by linkage analysis. Now, there is altogether a different dimension to genomics that people not only sequence one variety, but they sequence thousands of the accession. And this brings in the concept of pan genome. Now, pan genome is the one which includes common genes in all the varieties. And it also includes the genes which are specific to specific varieties, so variety specific genes. And it has been found by sequencing 3,000 3, genomes in rice that 25% of the genes are specific to varieties. They are not common among the varieties. So this uh, tells us that we need to make use of this information to improve rice because many of the useful genes are present in, in, in the case of of a variety which may not be the one in our hand, but maybe in our stock and so on and so forth. So we developed a chip based on analyzing this all genomes together. A chip is 80,000 gene chip, and then made use of it for doing genome-wide association analysis. We found that there are about 42 genes which affect grain length, grain width, length to width ratio and thousand grain weight and out of these 34 are the ones which are present in the common genome of all the varieties but we were able to find eight genes which were variety specific and that again shows the strength of analyzing pen genomes with some single genomes and this is the area which is going to to be very important. By the way, I should tell you that the gene for submergence and gene for phosphate utilization in rice, which has already been deployed, is also a pan genome type of the gene because this was not present in all varieties, but only in some varieties. And this is to emphasize that why pan genome analysis are, are necessary. Now, besides this work, which is going on in our lab, Several other laboratories in ICAR uh, have been working on rice to improve it. 
And this is an example of how Kusa Bakmasti has been improved by utilizing the technology of genomics and introducing some of the bacterial blight uh, genes like XA13 and XA21 that is being done at IARI. Another effort is that not only bacterial blight, but also uh, the blast resistance and also salinity tolerance could be introduced into Basmati. And therefore, we should not be surprised that utilizing the strength of genomics, if future uh, finds many of the useful traits getting introduced into some of these novel varieties. In another effort, the flood resistance, drought resistance, and salt resistance is being brought together uh, by Indian scientists using the knowledge of genomics. There is also an effort to, to mine new genes, and therefore several of these institutions led by a group in IRI, Dr. A.K. Singh, uh, is prospecting Indian rice land races for several of the biotic stresses and also abiotic stresses and other traits like grain quality. And this will form the very sound basis for the breeders uh, who will be able to do speed, speed breeding and bring new and new varieties uh, in the hand of the farmers. Not only it has happened in, in case of rice, but even an improved maize uh, has been pr produced, which is nutritionally important as it has got a high amount of provitamin A and the desirable amino acids uh, that is also genomics assisted breeding has provided that. At our South Campus itself, Professor Painter's group has been working on mustard for very long time, and they have also taken the approach of genomics to develop uh, markers and have found the genes related to glucosinolate content, low erucic acid, and also white rust resistance. Their efforts have uh, been successful in bringing these, uh, these uh, uh, several genes together by way of crossing and pyramiding efforts. Also, uh, we, as I said, we sequenced chickpea genome as well. Chickpea genome has been used to find out such genes which will improve its quality and also the strength. And one of such gene has been the ABC transporter gene, which has been identified by, by which is involved in glutathione uh, transport uh, in, in, in chickpea. And here you see a variety which has a small seed size, but high seed number. And there is another variety which has large seed size, but low seed number. And by doing this uh, targeted breeding to introduce this particular gene, a, 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 a haplotype of this gene into these varieties, it has been possible to produce a variety which has got 20% more yield, 13% more productivity, and 15% more protein content. Thus, genomics is not only, uh, not only supporting rice, but it is spreading, and uh, for sure, uh, this will be an area which could be uh, boundaryless and uh, restrictionless because we faced some problems with the transgenic technology or the GM technology, but the integration of the genes through genomics efforts uh, would not have any of these restrictions uh, and therefore would be able to reach in the hands of the farmers very fast. But of course, we have our own questions. And these questions are shown here. That is, which genes are responsible to form function and sustainability of crops? That would be one of the effort. So far, only function of about 5,000 genes are known, but rice has got 30,000 genes, and therefore more efforts would be required in this direction. Also, what is the spectrum of allele variability and its association with a superior trait? And therefore, I should say that for a breeder, it is not the gene, but it is the allele of the gene, which is important, which a breeder would like to introduce into the varieties and produce improved varieties. So these need to be combined, superior needs, alleles need to be combined, and then diversity of the varieties could be, could be increased uh, to provide the sustainable solutions 
uh, in the area of uh, food science and agriculture. That is all for today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Madam, shall I thank her? Yeah, thank him, please. Doctor. Also, uh, Professor, you can yeah. write Dr. Subir Majumdar, the next speaker. Okay, Madam. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Akhilesh Tyagi. Excellent uh, uh, talk uh, summarizing the current status of uh, uh, genomic research and the status of our crop improvement program in the country using functional genomics approach. Great. I hope that uh, soon we will have an alternative to the transgenics. Uh, and uh, we will see those that these things have been transported to the farmers as well as possible. Thank you, Professor. Yes, uh, Dr. Dr. Barik, can I just mention one point, which is yeah, important? And this is that our research has been supported all through by DBT. And I had wonderful interactions with scientists from Delhi University, and IPGR, IRI, and ICRISAT. And that need to be acknowledged because without them, it, it would have not been possible. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, in fact, you have given the completely national scenario. Uh, so naturally, everybody is covered there. Thank you so much. Uh, well, now this is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Subir S. Majumdar, uh, my old friend, and uh, he is an. Uh, he was the director of National Institute of Animal Biotechnology, Hyderabad, until recently, and now he is the distinguished professor at the same place. He will be delivering the talk on animal-human interface, biotechnological interventions for conserving each other. He has generated a new technique of transgenesis called the testicular transgenesis, which can quickly generate humanized animal models of diseases for testing vaccines and therapeutics, and opens up avenues for easy, large animal livestock transgenesis. Indian variety of cows have great qualities of heat resistance, disease resistance, rot resistance, stabilizing during million years of millions years in India is getting lost due to random artificial insemination using imported semen. So India's first and world's largest high density snip chip of cattle is developed using next generation sequencing of 43 Indian breeds of cows at NIAB. This chip is named as Indy Gau and is released by the Minister of Science and Technology in August 2021. So he has great contribution towards this effort. And uh, he's also responsible for initiating a one health program of disease surveillance and for testing, teaming up medical and veterinary researchers from 27 centers and practitioners for addressing the one health issue of the country that arose due to pandemic situation. He's a fellow of all the three science academies of India and recipient of Tata Innovation and Jesse Bush Fellowship as well. I have the pleasure to now uh, invite uh, Dr. Subir Majumdar to deliver his talk. Dr. Subir, please. Thank you. Thank you Dr. Barik, can you see my slides? Yes, yes, please just make your slides so good. Thank you, Pranam, Madam, and I think all awards and everything is given, but I wish and pray to God that for rest of life, Madam's love, affection, tenacity for the science and for us, who do science remain same forever and this is i wish forever and ever and i also send my pranam to all my elders all of them are there i may miss someone's name and it's a great occasion for 91st uh, uh, annual meeting and with this i will start because time is short thank you everyone for getting me here especially madam so dr, dr. subir dr subir can you just make it in the slide some more full screen please it is not in full screen no Is it now? Yeah, please go ahead. Thank you so much. So the topic is about interface between biological and physical sciences towards Atmanirbhar Bharat. And I will be, I chose to talk on animal human interface, the biotechnological interventions for conserving each other. It's our duty to conserve each other, animals and human. <coughs> so we, we all know that major infectious disease outbreaks are occurring in Southeast Asia. We know their names of also Ebola, monkeypox, Nipah, and SARS, and so many. I will just say this is the area where we live. And the major issues here is a the disease is not only going from animal to an animal or animal to only human, but it is going from human to human. And human are also passing the disease to 
uh, animals, you'll be surprised to know what we call as reverse zoonosis. So it's a cycle. And unless we understand this cycle well, we try to surveillance well and interrupt well, I do not think ever we will be able to stop this cycle and diseases will keep on increasing. So the problem is animal to human, human to human, human to animal, and also animal to animal. So if you see specifically this fourth paradigm that influenza can go from birds to pigs, and like that, there are so many diseases go in between cows to cattle, like that. So major burden were of zoonotic influenza, salmonellosis, West Nile virus, plagues, rabies, brucellosis, Lyme disease, and obviously to count more, tuberculosis has become a bigger problem between animals and human. Leptospirosis during rainy season, CCHF is coming from Pakistan border, see hemorrhagic fever. So Rajasthan and Gujarat is seeing it very much from animals. Cattle is coming. Kainasur forest disease is Karnataka's new disease from the ticks. Cysticercosis, swine fevers coming from the northeast borders. So what factors are increasing these zoonotic emergencies? Deforestation, we all know. But more than that, we cannot forget about antimicrobial resistance, especially people say it's poultry, but I think it's everywhere. Intensified agricultural and livestock production. Feed, protein requirement has increased. And people found that this is one of the easy avenue to earn money and live. So how to live with the animals, how to treat them, how to bring them up is not that well nicely educated, that is creating a lot of infectious diseases spreading around. And definitely, uh, we have got a illegal and, and kind of a poorly uh, regulated wildlife trade, where somehow people transport things, they don't know what they are doing. And climate change is, of course, there to affect everything on the top of it. So, greatest burden, ILRI, International Livestock Research Institute, has found that greatest burden of zoonotic disease falls on 1 billion poor livestock keepers in our part of the world. This is our part of Africa and uh, Asian countries. And what they found that around 2.3 billion human illness and 1.7 million human deaths occur because of this kind of a zoonotic disease. So human beings are dying because of the poor upkeep of the animals and our uh, lack of knowledge. This is very important. Main diseases of India which has really affected us are chronological order, rabies, leptospirosis, brucellosis, anthrax, TB, and foodborne diseases. And now, obviously, if you take the recent ones, you will find Ebola, Nipah, COVID-19, and other advanced influenza. Now, let me give only one example of tuberculosis and animals. You will find uh, it's very difficult. You will find bovine tuberculosis in wild. You will find bovine tuberculosis in livestock. And you will find bovine tuberculosis in human beings also. And very often you will find avian tuberculosis also going in between them. No one knows from whom, who is getting what. And the difficult thing is that unpasteurized dairy products are really very much taken in the villages and there is no control that you can do. Next comes a big disease, brucellosis. According to the WHO fact sheet, although approximately half a million brucellosis cases are reported annually, the true incidence is always 10 to 15 times higher, undetected, than the reported number of cases, especially countries like India, where detection is very difficult, kids are costly. And you know various kinds of brucellosis and they all affect human. Infertility, infertility and resident fever of no cause is a major issue with the human beings also. So most of the butchers are infertile because of the, this particular disease. Diagnostic is always a dilemma for a doctor. Doctor usually confirm a diagnosis of brucellosis by testing blood bond or trying to find out whether in bone marrow there is a bug, bacteria or not, or there is just an antibody. So, you know, sometimes they do x-rays also and major tests which go is Rose Bengal test in the market, but not that kind of a famous test to go for. So, what we have done in, uh, I will show you what kind of physical biological interactions we are trying to do as per the uh, the motto of the present uh, 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 our meeting that we have started saying that most of the brucella detection kit is from the LPS that is upper surface of the brucella and uh, that is how you test. So if you have vaccinated an animal you don't know when you do the test whether the results of antibodies because of the vaccination or because of the resident brucella infection. 
So we are <coughs> started dissecting the brucell and go into intracellular proteins. One of them is BM5, which is produced and comes out in the blood. So if you have an antibody for BM5, you kind of have a guarantee that there is a disease resident, not only the vaccinated animal. So you have to somewhere differentiate vaccinated from non-vaccinated animal who is really suffering. And we have done uh, ELISA and uh, also the lateral flow assay. It's all patented and given to an industry. We are using the same for graphene based biosensors, which are very modern biosensors and which are very, very sensitive because detecting disease early prevents is spread to other herd. By the time we detect a brucella in a cow, probably it has given it to 20 other animals. So to increase the sensitivity, in house we are using graphene based biosensors, which are very sensitive and very cost effective. Now, on the same line, ICR has developed very recently, the Brussels Abortus S19 per uh, vaccine developed. And this is a wonderful thing, which has uh, been now with the help of Department of Biotechnology, which facilitated technology transfer. And this is what is coming for us. And that's a very good thing. That's a vaccine from uh, IVRI, uh, ICR and biotechnology. Now we all know that in case of the rainy season, we had been reading in the newspapers, huge floods and that is really followed by a huge amount of the leptospira spread all over. So a huge deal of work has already been done uh, at NIB and we are trying to develop similar biosensors for detecting leptospira and uh, that's a big disease. In addition to that, there is SARS, MERS, avian influenza. We all know MERS came from the Western countries and uh, we have suffered in 2006 outbreak we have seen how animals and eggs, everything has been destroyed and how people feel very uh, poor from their uh, farmers have been really, really into great trouble. And when biology of that is done and from various organs, this is tested. And with the grace of God, country has high security disease, animal disease at Bhopal under ICR who does wonderful work. And we could find out which genes are there and which are really causing our issues for this. Uh, influenza has really spread all over country. Sometimes they say that it originated from our Asian countries and it has spread and it has really given trouble to the whole world. I think that is, we should be very, very careful about how to contain them, how to find them, how to do the surveillance, how to detect ahead of time, catch them, prevent their progression to the other part of the world. So Japanese encephalitis virus is another virus which is causing, we know, that in Gorakhpur we have a lot of issues. In Northeast nowadays, at present, there are a lot of issues because we are running a big program. And uh, there also the problem is by that time you detect the uh, presence of uh, infection, it has already spread. So what you need is use most modern biosensors as what you are talking, the physical science and biological science. They should come together. So very recently, there is a electroactive reduced graphene oxide made. Earlier, there were graphene oxide electrodes on which the antibodies were immobilized and you can read the readout in terms of the voltages, sensitive. But now they have got reduced graphene. So the beauty of that reduced graphene is that if you put graphene and put the antibody, if the antigen correctly falls on it and binds, even the small burden on it can give you wonderful flexibility, which can be read as a readout of the electric current and much, much sensitive. And this work has been done in our institute and we have developed this and uh, we have uh, filed a patent also and planning to go for a company. And this is the beauty of that is usually in buffer, all these assays are done very easily. When you go to serum, it becomes thick and there are what they called as factors which appear, which interfere. But luckily with this, uh, dynamical mechanism of deformation and bending studies illustrated that resilience and com compliance of the flexible electrode against extreme mechanical deformations, this is stable. And for us in buffer as well as in serum, it is giving more or less similar results. So you can see only JEV is detected, but if you take yellow uh, fever virus or dengue virus or West Nile virus, there is no cross reaction. So it's specific also. So this is very good thing. And based on that, we also started thinking that if you, so we work for both, for detecting disease in animal, for detecting disease in human. So our sensors 
or biosensors are going to work for both of them. So we wanted to do the, the, the label free detection for COVID-19. The problem was whenever somebody is coming on airport or anywhere, it takes three, four days. So we thought, why not to make a very sensitive sensor? So we made a uh, gold nanoparticle particle coated biosensors where antibody is coated. And as soon as the antigen is added to it, you will find that it will change the charge and this charge is readable in a machine and you can read it very easily. Again, as I said, when you do it in water or buffer, the sensitivity is up to 7.4 femtomolar because there is no interference. As soon as you go to, this is a, a sputum sample. As soon as you go <coughs> to sputum sample, the sensitivity comes to 120 femtomolar, but that's fine. It doesn't matter. As far as the patient is concerned, I think up to even up to 20, 21 counts of what you call CT value, we can become very easily the, the S1 protein of um, uh, COVID-19. And I think this also we are going to go for patent. The beauty of that is only that very quickly you can detect the uh, presence of a, a virus, maybe in 10 to 15 minutes, you can get a result on airport and come out. This is what we are trying to do. This will also help us to go to wildlife. This will also help us to go to livestock and check whether from human, this disease has spread to them or not. Now, let me come to another thing. This is aptamer based fluorescence assay for SARS-CoV-2 RNA. So another biophysical thing which you started thinking and designed is that if you take the nucleic acid of the virus and just have aptamers, small, 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 small aptamers which match them and try to hybridize them. And this is simply done. It's all standardized now that how much we have to keep three minutes at 100 degrees centigrade and then additional hybridization pro pro cocktail, cocktail has to be put. And as soon as they hybridize, wherever they hybridize, when we add cyber green, they bind and simple fluorescence can be read. So you don't have to really do the PCR or amplify. Rather than that, you're trying to add or amplify probes in terms of fluorescence. And uh, we have got good, interesting result. And uh, frankly speaking, we got positive 13 samples, negative 11, and samples did not match were six. So, you know, we are modifying, amplifying, and trying to do that we reach to the perfection. Now, if you come to Indian dairy sector, very simple mastitis gives lots of diseases to human beings. So India contributes 20 crore ton in milk, 7 crore livestock farmers and greater than 6 crore are marginal. 30 crore cow buffalo, average 4 to 5 cow buffalo per farmer, 18 to 24 crore farmers suffer from mastitis related diseases as because they have these animals standing on their, sorry, on their house and they don't know how to handle in villages, practices are not that good. And this eventually has led to six to 7,000 crore of per year economic loss in income because of the mastitis. So it is important. Once mastitis has set in, it is very difficult because inflammatory reaction has gone in, very difficult to reverse it back. So it is far better to catch mastitis in a preclinical condition. That should be the objective. It should be done in the field side, in the villages. It cannot, the cow cannot come to the clinic. So this is a healthy cow's udder. This is kind of subclinical mastitis and this is the clinical mastitis. So you can know subclinical mastitis will give us four to 4.5 thousand crore loss, but clinical mastitis will give you two to 2.5 thousand crore loss. So I think this is the place where we need to detect them early. So we have just developed an iron nanoparticle where milk can be put and ahead of time, preclinical mastitis, there'll be a clumping and the Positive clumping will be called as preclinical mastitis. We can give mild antibiotic treatment. Animals can be repaired. Spread of the E. coli resistant disease to human beings will be stopped. And <clears throat> we have also used one more important thing. There are a lot of infertility in animals. So physically, we have now started making uh, the PVA micro needles, which can just be patched on the body and they can give hormones to the cow and buffalo, 35% of our buffaloes are infertile and hormones can be physically delivered from the surface rather than uh, very costly injections and vials. And over a period of time, they will be ovulating and we have seen some encouraging results. So this is a trans delivery uh, approach to physically develop hormones to the animals. Most importantly, we have made a cow SNP chip first of the country 
and biggest of the world now because it has got 11,496 SNPs, more than the FMATRIX chip for US and Europe. And as far as this particular topic, this is made for conservation of the indigenous breeds of cows because they are mixed because of artificial insemination. We want to conserve our pure breeds. With this chip, we can find out out of 100 Sahiwal, only 42 are Sahiwal. Rest of them look Sahiwal but are not and preserve those for future use. But at the same time, same chip is a dictionary. We can find out which cows are going to be immunocompromised or disease prone. So we can disregard or throw them out of the system of breeding and keep the pure and good cows, which are healthy animals and make healthy herds because SNPs give full information about the, the ability of a uh, individual to fight. This will help in disease detection, disease resistant herd making and it's a great, uh, will be great achievement if funded properly uh, by our country. For this, we use arrays fabricated by direct synthesis of oligonucleotides on the glass surface using photolithographic technology, which is the Affymetrix array based uh, work. So if we come to now one health, sorry, an integrated view of animal, human and environmental health is needed. Everyone ecosystem should be taken into consideration. Integrates it integrates purely biology driven paradigm with social and policy policy sciences. Potentially, because policy and social science, our habits, our behavior, how we keep our animals, everything is important. Our children treat animals potentially leads to better outcomes, creates authentic partnership with non academic stakeholders, include newer technology. And we have to include newer technologies and cutting subject as, as I was discussing, we have to put bring in what you call a pace in this research of uh, preventing diseases. So keeping all this in view, last year, uh, Dr. N.K. Ganguly came to NIAB and we established a center for One Health on behalf of DBT and uh, uh, Dr. Renu Saru participated online and this center now got a very big grant. We call it, we do not call it NIAB project, we call it establishment of a consortium for One Health to address zoonotic and transboundary diseases in India including Northeast region and uh, I have been successful in really gathering around 19 big centers and 12 from the mainland, seven from Northeast and I will give you detail. I understand that though I retired, but the whole team support of all these 28 centers is there and I will be behind this and we will be working continuously to ensure that this is the day of the light. This is need of the country. And what happens here is that this is aimed to initiate and strengthen surveillance system of zoonotic diseases through existing and newer diagnostics to have platform for generating indigenous resources for developing detection kits, vaccines, animal models of diseases, dig out pathways leading to antimicrobial resistance in Indian subcontinent and tracking points for interventions to mitigate AMR and its aftermath. The Scope of this application lies in understanding the pervasiveness of the specific animal pathogens, their threat to animal health, their zoonotic potential and threat to human health. And for the incursion and or reappearance of the animal disease across India and initiating a One Health program with the ultimate objective of establishing inter-sectoral collaborations among veterinary, medical, agriculture, environmental, wildlife, meteorological and other areas to detect, prevent and control zoonotic disease and transboundary diseases, especially in Northeast. Network to be harmonized and synergized with state and district levels. So we need those officers also. Involving local vets and doctors, we have got 12 centers in other states of the country, six veterinary, five medical, seven centers in the Northeast of the country, four veterinary, two medical, one wildlife nationwide, they will look. We are taking the Eradun uh, Wildlife Institute. Eight disease investigation units of Northeast. They are small centers. We have established and helping them. And a central project coordination mon monitoring unit, which will monitor uh, all the progress. Now, the objectives of that is to establish a network of laboratories and centralized field level to estimate prevalence and burden of the select disease through serological and other methods to detect pathogens where needed by serological, check actual antigen, not antibody, or molecular test to model data. This is most important, to model data, whatever data of surveillance we collect, which disease has which kind of pattern, which season, which time, 
which environmental change and area disease forecasting and assess the risk using artificial intelligence tools to generate tools and reagents for detecting treating emerging zoonotic diseases so not only we will generate tools for detection but reagents for therapy also and we need artificial intelligence data to forecast the disease otherwise of no use the medical centers which are participating are aims delhi aims jodhpur icmr rmc gorpur gorakhpur dibrugarh nazareth hospital shillong gandhi medical hospital hyderabad ngr university of medical sciences chennai and the veterinary universities which are taking care of 4455 studies is ivri bareilly uh, mafsu nagpur niab hyderabad northeast assam agricultural university tanuvas in the south and gadwaso and uh, this they will coordinate with the medical centers also and we will see the patients who are coming to the hospital with zoonotic disease how veterinarians can help to identify that and how doctors who get such zoonotic disease communicate with the veterinarians nearby and see whether there are spread of disease in animals or not so this is a, a novel uh, plan even if we are successful in achieving 35% we will be happy that we have brought on one platform medical veterinarians wildlife uh, healthcare takers that would be a great achievement these are the major diseases bacterial we have taken brucellosis tuberculosis rickettsial q fever scrub typhus viral ccsf japanese encephalitis parasitic cryptosporidiosis cysticercosis and foodborne listeriosis salmoniosis you may think why only seven or eight diseases this whole project is not about curing all diseases this whole project is about bringing people together changing their framework doing boot camps making friendship amongst themselves understand the problem and understand reality how they have to come together to resolve the issue make the centers forever in this country so that they keep on modifying those centers making them better that's the beginning so i think that's the reason and expected outcome will be understanding of the pervasiveness of the select zoonotic and transboundary pathogens and their threat to animal and human health so definitely when we talk about this we have seen dr mahapatra it's extremely important to understand soil health and plant health because animals and humans are in close contact for agriculture or for feeding so unless we take care of environmental changes soil health pollution it will never make a good cycle so because they all of them affect human and animal health animal health equally well question 1 should india be com coming out with its own list of select organism and zoonotic pathogens yes because environmental influences the genotype the phenotype and pathogenic behavior human behavior and cultural practices do affect animal diversity and balance between wildlife and domestic life is completely different in india question 2 if so what needs to be done so we have to identify our own important pathogens which we must address and that move between the three domains human plant and animals and gain pathogenicity as they jump against which effective therapeutics and prophylactics the diseases are the, the 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 prophylactics are not available we must try to find them out first those with emerging potential to harm the humans and animals we must try to find them first and derail which can derail the country's economy so develop integrative strategies to tackle the threat and definitely policy help and funding today is a forum where i do not belong to this but there are very great people who have contributed to policy and will contribute and i think policy help and funding is needed research definitely regulations have to be eased out to do this kind of work like if i go to wildlife i have to take 10 20 kinds of licenses to take a wildlife sample for assessment of a disease and definitely consumers and stakeholders are to be considered but most importantly for one health in addition to policy policy regulation and funding structure we have to generate human resource student are the change agents if we can put in their brain that this is needed for the country's health i think some of them will come out as leaders and take up this work so usually this is my last slide we think that they gave us all the diseases they think that we are the poor practitioners of their upkeep and we are more knowledgeable and intelligent but we are the culprit because of them they are suffering so now the problem is very big and ground is very vast human beings need to collate all their knowledge including biology machinery artificial intelligence for detection prevention and curtailing health effects of zoonotic and reverse zoonotic disease which goes from human to animals inclusive of equal importance to human and animal health taking doctors veterinarians environmentalists and plant and soil health scientists together 
on one form on one platform is a need of the day and we will work for each other as per motto of the niap and niap's motto is animal health for human welfare with this i will stop thank you very much for patient list And Dr. Barak, will you thank? Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Subir, for your talk on the One Health and particularly uh, giving details on the sensor based detection of various viral diseases and genotics. And of course, the big program which you have been, you have been uh, spearheading. Okay, thank now, you. yeah, thank you so much for excellent uh, uh, presentation. Now, uh, Madam, I'm inviting Dr. C. R. Mehta, the next speaker. Please do that, please. But uh, just, just tell him that the time now we have to finish it by quarter to three. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Dr. Mehta, I have the pleasure to introduce him. He's the director of Central Institute of Agricultural Engineering, Bhopal. As you know, the if we have to sustain our food production, mechanization is a must. And I think that's how the uh, organizers, all we have decided that he has to, uh, I mean, this topic should be included. So, Dr. C. R. Mehta will be talking on the trend in farm mechanization for Atmanirbhar Bharat, which is so crucial. So, he is the director of uh, CIAE, ICR uh, organization, has been working for last 26 years in this institute and currently is the director, author of more than 200 papers, and is a fellow of the Indian Society of Agricultural Engineers. And uh, he has received several prestigious awards, including Distinguished Service Certificate, Commendation Medal, Team Award, and ICE Fellow from Indian Society of Agricultural Engineers for research and development in the field of farm machinery and power. So I invite now Dr. C. R. Mehta to please uh, deliver your talk. But uh, there is a uh, time constraint as we all has it. So please try to finish within uh, 2.45. Thank you so much. Dr. Mehta, please. Thank you, sir. Am I audible? Yeah, please go ahead. You are, you are also full screen. Please go ahead. Okay. So, good afternoon, everyone. Respected Professor Manju Sharma, Chairperson of the session. Dr. Tilochan Mahapatra Ji, Secretary Dear and DG ICR, Co-Chair of the session. Dr. S.K. Barik Ji, Distinguished Delegates. First of all, I thank Nasi for providing me an opportunity to participate in this annual symposium and deliver a talk of Nasi. And I will be talking about the train in farm mechanization for Atmanirbhar Bharat. So as you know that around 45% of our workforce is engaged in agriculture. However, it contributes only 17% to the GDP of our country. And recently, you may see that even horticulture production have even surpassed the food grain production. If we see the Indian agriculture, 86% of our land holding is below 2 hectares. Only 4% of our land holding is above 4 hectares. So that is suitable for individual ownership of farm equipment. And that highlights the need for going for custom hiring of farm equipment to reduce the cost of cultivation of different crops. Another issue is that labor is migrating from rural area to urban area to work in industry, to work in service sector. So that is also reducing the availability of labor in rural area to work in agriculture. And recently it has gone down to around 45% of total workforce engaged in Indian system. Here you can see that as the Farm power availability is increasing, food grain productivity is also increasing, as well as cropping intensity is also increasing. So that shows that there is direct link between the food grain productivity and farm power availability. Even farm power availability helps in completing different operations on time. And in this slide, you can see that nowadays the trend of higher horse sale of higher horse power is increasing over the years and that is due to the custom hiring of farm equipment in our country. Here you can see that uh, rice and wheat are the two major crops, food grain crops which are mechanized. However, if we see the mechanization of cotton and sugar cane cash, cash crops like that, then mechanization level is very low. 
even for sugarcane and cotton harvesting is it mechanized only around 15 percent for sugarcane and overall mechanization of different crops in our country is around 47 percent right now so that also highlights the need for going for mechanization of different farm operations so there are a number of challenges with respect to mechanization one challenge is i have already mentioned small and fragmented land holding another is that we have spatial and temporal variability in the cropping system throughout the country. We have no, we are growing number of crops, and we have low farm mechanization, particularly for horticulture crops, animal husbandry and fisheries, as well as hill agriculture. That highlights the need for mechanization of these crops, as well as the annual involvement of women in agriculture is increasing due to migration of male worker from the rural area to urban area that also highlights the need for development of gender friendly tools and equipment which can be operated by male as well as female workers so india is having diverse condition agroclimatic zones as well as soil terrain is different so that also highlights the different kinds of machinery are being used in indian agriculture so we in indian agriculture animal operated equipments are being used for land preparation also lightweight tillers as well as power tillers are used in addition to that tractor operated equipments are also being used for field preparation and recently we have developed the control level puddling system for wetland leveling also we have for dry land leveling we have laser guided levelers so we have recently developed this and this is this is having potential for export to other countries recently we licensed it to one of the manufacturers and for sowing and planting also we have manually operated equipments animal operated equipment those are having relevance particularly in the hilly areas where we cannot take tractors in addition to that we have crop specific planters as well as multi crop planters and now we are moving towards the use of pneumatic planters for saving of seeds because the cost of seeds are increasing day by day and now in india also there are a few manufacturers who are manufacturing pneumatic planters and these have a potential for export from india and some of the manufacturers are even exporting such equipment to other countries also if we see that irrigation and fertigation we have we have developed number of good equipments particularly sprinkler and drip irrigation system even we have now we develop the pressure compensate variable rate drippers also so that varies the irrigation water use efficiency and these equipments have potential for export from our countries and for planting also we have different kinds of planters semi-automatic automatic planters also for we have developed the potato planters also semi-automatic and automatic and these are also being exported to some of the countries as well as we have some crop specific like turmeric rhizome planters for rice transplanting still in some part manual transplanting is being done we have manually operated rice transplanter paddy drum seeder also as well as we have the working type four row transplanter as well as six row and eight row riding type transplanter but gently if you see the trend in manufacturing of these transplanters particularly self propelled transplanters are being imported from near nearby countries and they those have potential for manufacturing in our country for intercultural operations also we have manually operated equipment self propelled equipment as well as a sri power weeder for use in paddy fields and then we have tractor operated rotary weeders etc and these some of these equipments have potential for export from india and some of these are also being exported in plant production we have manually operated knapsack spare then animal operated spare self propelled spare and then tractor operated horizontal boom spare air assisted spare and recently we have developed the sensor based spares also which identify the plant canopy and does the spraying only on the canopy, which helps in saving of the pesticides by around 50%. So these equipments also have potential for export from India. For harvesting also, we have 
manually operated uh, sickle, then vertical conveyor reaper, reaper binders, and presently some companies are importing reaper binders from other countries, particularly European countries. And in India also, some of the farm machinery manufacturers have started manufacturing such tractor operated reaper binder also. For thrashers, we have different kinds of thrashers, like for crop specific thrashers, then multi crop thrashers, and these are being exported to a number of countries from India. For combined harvesters, we have multi crop combined harvester as well as rice. Uh, for our combines for rice harvesting and some of the even mini combines are being imported in our countries also. We have developed number of machinery for management of paddy straw in that happy cedar is there then uh, strip till lil which is also called the smart cedar. So that is also one another super cedar has been developed and and these equipments have potential for export because the similar problem is there in China, Nepal, Bank, Pakistan, and some of our neighboring countries of burning of paddy straw in their fields. So nowadays we are moving towards the going, going for development of uh, smart machinery to reduce the cost of cultivation. In addition to that, we are moving towards the customizing of farm equipments. And nowadays we are moving towards the Enhancing the efficiency of tractor implement system by and in the future we are expecting that we will be having the autonomous vehicles and in the long term we may see the full autonomy or autonomous tractors being used in our country. Some of the companies have already manufactured autonomous tractors, but those are not getting popular right now in our country. So in this slide you can see the recently we developed the light sensor based spread meter at our institute and presently spread meter are being imported in our country that is used for measurement of chlorophyll content of the leaves to for the, deciding the fertilizer to be applied for a particular crop so the imported one costs around 1.5 lakh and we recently we develop it and licensed to, to manufacture and it cost only around 5000 rupees so that we can say that we have done the make in india of the imported equipment. Another uh, now government is putting a lot of trust on use of drones in agriculture and that can be used for remote monitoring and analysis of field and crops that can be also be used for the crop yield estimation as well as the crop health scouting and the spraying of uh, pesticides and biofertilizers on crops. And recently government has uh, also put uh, brought out the scheme of PLI or drone manufacturing in India because presently most of the components of drones are being imported in our country and then as assembled by a few manufacturers. So that there is also, also potential for indigenization of development of drones in our country and government is putting a lot of trust on that. If we see the trade scenario of agriculture machinery, then we can see that we are exporting more machinery as compared to whatever machinery we are importing. In addition to that, if we see the sale of tractor, and in that, if we see the sale or export of the tractor from our country, 92,000 tractors have been exported in 2019. Around 10% of the tractors which are being produced in our countries are being exported. So, in tractors, we are uh, independent even we are exporting tractors to other countries if we see the export import of machinery in our country then export import trade of agro agro, agro machinery has increased from 611 million us dollar to 1301 million us dollar nearly double in 10 years so we can see that the export import trade is increasing as well as in that there is major role of export and presently we are exporting machinery to some of the countries like USA, Bangladesh, our neighboring country Nepal, then Sri Lanka and Turkey. If we see the export import trend of agriculture machinery, global trend I mean, so in that 62% uh, of the machinery are exported by European Union, 18.9% by Asia, 
and 18.7 percent by USA. And particularly, the export China is playing major role in the import destination import destination country. Particularly, they are uh, exporting machinery to different countries, and even we are also importing some of the machinery from China. And if we see the trend of sale of total machinery in that 31 percent share is of tractors and 69 percent. some problem, madam. Am I not audible? Oh, it's okay. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. It's okay. Okay. And 69% share is of agriculture machinery. So that shows that we have uh, world is moving to, from tractorization to mechanization. And in, in India also, we have to move from tractorization to mechanization because in India, more tractors are sold as, as compared to agriculture machinery. And some of those are being used for non-agriculture purpose also. So some of the machinery which are being sold for exported from our country, I have listed in this slide. I have already mentioned that we are exporting around 10% of the tractor produce in our country. In addition to that, we are exporting delayed machinery. We are also exporting laser guided leveler. We have recently developed wetland laser leveler. So that is also having potential for export. We have a potential for export of even high clearance vehicle also, then we have potential for export of combined harvesters also. So we, these are the some of the machinery which have potential for export or some of them are already being exported from our country. And presently some of these machinery are being imported in our country and those have potential for make in India like power tillers. Power tillers are being imported from our neighboring country. So recently government have come out with some policy. Small engines are not being manufactured in our country. Then lightweight tillers are also being imported. Earlier knapsack spares used to be manufactured in our country, but nowadays those are being imported by even sprayer manufacturers in our country. Similarly, the condition for rice transplanter also. So these have potential for made in India and some manufacturer have already initiated, uh, have made attempt for manufacturing of these equipments in our country. So these are the, some of the photograph of machinery which are being imported in our country. These are some of the recently developed equipment which have potential for export from our country. On the top left hand side, you can see the sugarcane butt chip set link planter which have been developed for sowing of sugarcane seedlings and recently we licensed it to three manufacturers and out of that one manufacturer is exporting to Philippines. Then high class multi-purpose vehicles, such vehicles are being imported in our country and those cost around 40 lakhs and we recently we developed this equipment at the cost of around 10 lakhs rupees. Check basin former have also been developed and that also have potential. And at the bottom, you can see that recently we have developed the tractor operated nursery seeder. And that is one of the kind of equipment developed throughout the world. And, through, and that also have the potential for export from our country. So their government has already taken some initiative under the Atmanirbha Bharat. So in that uh, power tiller for import, they have restricted up to 10% and due to that sale of power tiller from Indian, Indian industry have in the increased by 51% during last year. Another, they have uh, put the announcement of uh, import duty from 2.5 to 7.5% on roti tillers because them, now them, those are also being imported from nearby countries. Another uh, simplification of rules and procedure for testing of machines and equipment that has government has developed to promote this uh, made in India machinery as well as their sale through different government scheme. Government has also come out with agriculture infrastructure funder, uh, fund under that they have made provision for one lakh crore, particularly for interest subvention and financial support to FPOs, self help groups, cooperative society for post harvest management infrastructure like cold storage structure, warehouses, uh, cleaner and graders. Government is also providing the level playing fields to domestic manufacturers by putting import restrictions under foreign trade policy and way yeah. forward for Atmanirbha Bharat government to 
give the support to grassroots level innovations. So those are being manufactured in our country. Another, we have to put import on uh, import restriction on some of the equipment in phase manner. Another, we have to enhance the manufacturing capacity of some of the equipment to be cost competitive. Then some of the equipment have potential for reverse engineering also. We are working on that. Then we have to develop the multi-purpose equipment because the cost of land holding is going down day by day. Another, because the land holding is small, we have to promote the custom hiring center and that government is promoting under submission on agriculture mechanization. And we should have arranged the linkage between the industry engineering college as well as MSc in agriculture, MSME in agriculture machinery industry for enhancing the manufacturing of agriculture machinery and to promote research in that area. And in the end, I can say that the high capacity machine can be used on custom hiring basis and or for contractual field operations. Another because uh, women workers are also engaged in agriculture. So we have to put uh, more emphasis on ergonomics and safety aspect in design of farm tools and equipment and machinery. So those can be operated by male as well as female workers. And we have to put more focus on development of uh, or mechanization of horticulture and hill ag agriculture. We have to put to more focus on full crop mechanization of rice, sugarcane, cotton, and potato crops. We have to put emphasis on farm machinery management for enhancing the energy use efficiency of different equipments. In addition to that, we have to put to more focus on development of precision agriculture machinery for enhanced input use efficiency because cost of inputs are increasing day by day. And we have to also make those machineries reliable as well as government has to pro provide support at the initial stage so those can be adopted by the farmers. And we have to promote the make in India of imported agriculture machinery by supporting the industry in different forms, whether it is through PLI or some other more. Thank you. This is all in brief about my presentation. Can I just sum up now? Yes, ma'am. First of all, thank you very much, Dr. Mehta. And uh, it is very eye-opener what you have talked about the agriculture machinery and how much it can contribute to our export. So it's a very important part of the modern agriculture. So thanks again for the excellent lecture. <laughs> this particular yeah, session, I'm not going to sum up because we have heard everything and we are very short of time. But uh, the whole set, uh, session has given a complete uh, picture, almost I would say a complete picture, of modernization of the agriculture sector, how it has moved forward, how digitization is taking place. And in, in starting with the crop productivity, going up to the final product in every area we have used the modern science inputs. So it is very challenging and considering that uh, agriculture is the uh, backbone of our economy, uh, I am very, very happy that Academy got this particular session organized and we have, the, we have had the best of the speakers in all these areas, agriculture, uh, modern uh, plant biotechnology agriculture, then animal, and lastly, the farming organization. So I very warmly thank all the speakers for their excellent presentations, and uh, we close this session now. Now uh, we have no time. We have 10 minutes. Neeraj? Yes, madam. And 10 minutes ka break kar de. हाँ मैडम अभी वो प्रोफेसर किरण मजमदार शो भी अभी आए नहीं हैं अच्छा देख लीजिए कि पता पूछ लीजिए हाँ नहीं पूछ चेक कर लीजिए नहीं अभी नहीं किए मैडम अच्छा नहीं लॉगिन करा है तो ठीक है तो अभी दस मिनट का ब्रेक करते हैं हाँ दस मिनट का ब्रेक करके देख लेते हैं उससे बात सो वी वी विल बी बैक एक्जेक्टली एट � Thank you, madam. Thank, Thank you, you, madam. Namaskar. Namaskar.
And thank you so much, Dr. Barrett, for co-chairing the session mm -hmm. and taking the major responsibility of introducing all the speakers. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Professor Padmanaman, we just have a 10 minutes break and then come back again. Okay. Next one is, is not a uh, medical session. It is the... Uh, uh, medi after that, after uh, Kiran's lecture, we have the uh, medical session. Okay. Right. Kiran said she won't speak too long. Right. Are you, madam? Going for up.
हाँ नमस्कार मैडम नमस्कार वी आर फ्रॉम नेशनल एकेडमी ऑफ साइंसेस कैन यू हियर मी यू आर प्लीज अनम्यूट हाँ कैन यू हियर मी नाउ यस यस नमस्कार हाय मंजू जी हाय एवरीवन हाय प्रोफेसर घटक नाइस टू मीट यू मैडम आप अनम्यूट कर लीजिए मैडम अनम्यूट कर लीजिए मैंने अनम्यूट किया है नहीं आई एम रिक्वेस्टिंग मैडम मंजू शर्मा जी हाँ जी मैडम अभी भी आप म्यूट पे हैं आप ठीक है कैन यू यस मैडम यस यस ऑडिबल सो थैंक यू किरण जी एंड हाउ इज बैंगलोर नाउ बैंगलोर इज फाइन आई मीन ओके वी हैड सम फ्यू केसेस आई एम टोल्ड हां नथिंग नथिंग मोर देन दैट ना नो नो Are you starting now? I thought you were going to start at three o'clock. Are you starting now? Well, it's just two minutes. Okay. All right. Sure. It's about five minutes to three. Yeah, because we are short of time. Okay. We no have... problem. No problem. i gave time to everybody to just uh, i mean just rest because we have been having the session from 10:30 onwards continuously so i thought everybody wanted a 10 minute break Neeraj. Yes, madam. Okay. Now, should we start? Time will be. Yes. Sab log aa rahe hain, na? Yes. 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 नहीं अभी नहीं आता है 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 आ गए और पद्मनाभन थे यहाँ 
सभी लोग मेरे ख्याल से वो भी है वो भी अच्छा बाकी और सारे लोग है मधुलिका साहब भी है अखिलेश जी भी, भी है अखिलेश को सुबीर भी है सुबीर भी है ओके सो गुड आफ्टरनून ऑल माय वेरी डिस्टिंग्विश पार्टिसिपेंट्स एंड साइंटिस्ट इन दिस पर्टिकुलर सिंपोजियम टुडे वी हैव कम टू ऑलमोस्ट एंड ऑफ द इनग्रल सेशन माइनस द इनग्रल एड्रेस Uh, as i told in the morning that due to some unavoidable circumstances uh, dr kiran majumdar had uh, said no to uh, for the morning session but she agreed that she will come and give her you know her address later on so she is here now she has joined us uh, all of you know i don't need to introduce her but just to for the sake of the students and some of the younger people uh, who are joining us on the youtube uh, i want to just mention here that a kiran majumdar shah is a household name today in india everybody knows her uh, when we talk of industry first name comes to everybody's mind is dr kiran majumdar she is the pioneer of biotechnology industry in india and the founder of the country's leading biopharmaceutical enterprise biocon this name is again familiar to everybody it started in the year 1978 she was also named time magazine's 100 most influential persons in the world she is recognized as a thought leader who has made her country proud by building a globally recognized biopharmaceutical enterprise that is com committed to innovation and affordability in developing in delivering the best in class therapeutics to the patient across the globe her rich contributions to research innovation and affordable health care have been recognized by several national and international awards the us based chemical heritage foundation has conferred her with the 2014 othmar gold medal and the germany based kelt institute for the world economy gave her 2014 global economy prize for business she is we are very happy uh, to inform you that she is also a fellow of our national academy of sciences she has received uh, the most prestigious highest civilian award one of the highest civil, civilian award the padma bhushan she is now the, in the list of forbes in the top 50 women by business financial times so now we know that uh, uh, we are, we are we are going to listen to one of the persons who whose life whose everything uh, go circles around the industrial development of this country starting from the research to the product development to establishing a company kiranji has shown that she has completed the innovation chain and she is almost like an icon for the industry so can i request you kiranji to uh, deliver your address thank you so much manju ji because you've been extremely generous with your introduction and i feel very humbled listening to all these words of um, you know praise that you have showered on me but thank you so much um, you know professor ghatak uh, president of nasi other distinguished members of nasi and council members uh, this is indeed uh, a great honor for me to deliver the inaugural address on the 91st annual session Uh, and symposium of the uh, national academy of sciences india which is the oldest science academy in the country uh let me first apologize for this delayed inaugural address because i have was previously committed to a uh, uh you know a i was supposed to be traveling overseas which got cancelled because of omicron and then i was i had committed myself to the cii national committee meeting and hence i requested uh, 
Manjuji, if I if there was an alternate time, and she very kindly agreed that I give this talk now. Let me start by saying that for the last nine decades, Nasi has been steadfastly delivering on its commitment of developing a scientific temper in the country. From the time of its founding in 1930 under the visionary leadership of Professor Meghnath Saha, the academy has been cultivating and promoting science and technology through cutting edge research, publication of scientific works, organizing dialogues and discussions on scientific and technological matters, cooperating with international organizations on scientific research and securing and managing funds and endowments for the creation of scientific knowledge in the country. In doing so, the academy has been fulfilling one of the fundamental duties mandated in the constitution of India, which states, it shall be the duty of every citizen of India to develop the scientific temper, humanism, and the spirit of inquiry and reform. It is important to note that the founding fathers of our great country wanted the spirit of inquiry and scientific temper as a foundational aspect of our society. I believe science and scientific temper are imperative if better lives are to be assured to a billion plus people in a country constrained by resources and at a time when the world is reeling under the devastating impact of, COVID, of the COVID-19 pandemic. Our scientists have done a stellar job throughout this devastating viral outbreak. They have worked over time to come up with innovative solutions across a range of biomedical fields, from mathematical models to mass production of masks and personal protective equipment, diagnostic kits to treatment modalities, and from vaccines to ventilators, you name it. U.S. President Joe Biden's top medical advisor, Anthony Fauci, has actually lauded the Indian scientific community's contribution. And he, he said, uh, as I, and I quote, India's contribution to the global scientific knowledge are well known to all. With strong government support and a vibrant biopharma sector, this knowledge is already yielding solutions to COVID-19 prevention and cure. India, we can proudly say, has delivered 71 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines to over 95 countries until November 2021. And since exports have resumed, we will continue to do this human service to the world. India has become the world's second largest manufacturer of PPE kits. From an actual shortage to manufacturing 2 lakh PPE kits and 2 lakh N95 masks per day, India took less than a year to accomplish its Atmanirbhar vision to manufacture these very essential medical products. Though we have achieved so much on the scientific front, Sadly, large parts of our society continue to be in science denial mode. Vaccine hesitancy and the tendency to believe in fake cures, um, you know, uh, and with no scientific basis, and the refusal to trust scientific data, all these are hampering our efforts to fight the deadly virus. We must remember that scientific research doesn't take place in a vacuum. It can only happen with society's blessing. It can only happen if we as a society can develop the right scientific temper. It is the interaction between science and society that ensures knowledge is exchanged, tested and refined in order to respond to societal needs and global challenges. Scientists work tirelessly at the forefront of knowledge to discover more. Driven by curiosity of the unknown and unexplored, they apply knowledge to new realms, thereby adding value to the knowledge base. And in doing so, they help us live longer, 
healthier and more enriching lives. The scientific method is a remarkable tool for creating verifiable information, always expanding the boundaries of our knowledge and challenging our preconceived notions of what reality is. It is this approach that has enabled humanity to make the impossible possible and create new knowledge that is breakthrough in its nature. Look at the world's most innovative economies. Switzerland, Sweden, Israel, US, UK, Republic of Korea, which all are in the top per percentile of the Global Innovation Index 2021 rankings. What makes these countries innovation leaders? Some of the factors that make these economies innovative are the culture of questioning, the scientific temper, the ability to take risk, and the willingness to think out of the box. To be truly innovative, a country needs a critical mass of people who are true innovators. What is the definition of a true innovator? A true innovator is one who sees what everyone sees, but thinks of what no one else thinks. I'll repeat that. A true innovator is one who sees what everyone else sees, but thinks of what no one else thinks. Take, for example, the 2005 Nobel Prize winners for medicine, Robin Warren and Barry Marshall. Everyone had thought that the cause of gastritis, inflammation, and stomach ulceration is excessive acid secretion due to irregularities in diet and lifestyle. But it was Warren and Marshall who postulated that the causative agent was in fact a bacterium called Heliobacter pylori. They were ridiculed, but they stuck to their guns. They could see and think beyond what others saw and thought. Similarly, Francis Crick, who was originally a physicist, did not limit himself to his chosen field of research. His scientific temper drove him to collaborate with James Watson in deciphering the structure of DNA, thus opening the whole new area of genetics. Their discovery heralded modern biotechnology, wherein living systems could be made to produce any desired products by artificially introducing the genes responsible for doing so, all because they had cracked the genetic code. Percy Spencer, one of the world's leading experts in radar technology, discovered the microwave oven when his curiosity was sparked on seeing that a candy bar he had in his pocket melted when he was standing in front of an active radar set. Today, we can't even imagine a modern kitchen without a microwave oven. These innovators epit epitomize the maxim, a parachute works only when it is open. The mind is also like that. It works only when it is open. The pandemic has re-established the need for nations to develop a scientific temper, to cut across the traditional boundaries of knowledge and stretch across various disciplines. While ancient India was clearly a leader in disciplines like mathematics, physics, astronomy, and life sciences, today's India too has considerable scientific achievements to its credit. Not only has our country attained global leadership in information technology and in the pharmaceutical and biotechnology sectors, but we also have made significant progress in space research. ISRO is developing heavy lift launchers, human spaceflight projects, reusable launch vehicles, semi cryogenic engines, single and two stage to orbit vehicles, development and use of co composite materials for space applications, etc., etc. Just as the three Nobel Prizes for chemistry, physics, and medicine have promoted the spirit of inquiry and for science at a global level, I must also mention that the Infosys Science Prize has done the same in India. 
This annual recognition of outstanding achievements in engineering and computer sciences, humanities, life sciences, and mathematical sciences, as well as physical sciences and social science, not only celebrates the creativity and innovation of remarkable individuals, but they inspire and encourage others and society at large. The Infosys Science Prize 2021 has recognized some incredible scientists, including Dr. Chandrasekhar Nair, a fellow biotech entrepreneur who was awarded the prize in engineering and computer science for his development and large-scale deployment of a indigenously developed TrueNAT diagnostic, which is a point-of-care testing platform for PCR test-based medical diagnostics. Dr. Nair's work has enabled rapid testing for millions of COVID-19 and TB cases, both in India and across the world. Professor Mahesh Sankaran from the National Center for Biological Sciences was awarded the prize in life sciences for his pioneering work on the ecology of tropical savanna ecosystems. His contributions to highlighting the biodiversity of important Indian ecosystems such as the Western Ghats has been recognized. Dr. Neeraj Kyle of Microsoft Research Labs Bengaluru also got the prize in mathematical sciences for his outstanding contributions to computational complexity. The winners were felicitated by Professor Gagandeep Kang, professor at CMC Vellore and one of India's leading virologists who also has won the Infosys Prize in Life Sciences in 2016 for her contributions to understanding the natural history of the rotavirus and other infectious diseases. And in 2019, she became the first Indian woman to be elected as a fellow of the Royal Society. For despite a large scientific talent pool and some quality institutions, of higher learning and research, there remains cause for concern. For one, the quality of science education in a vast majority of our institutions is suboptimal. In many of these inadequately staffed and financially strapped departments that offer outdated and irrelevant syllabi, learning by rote is unfortunately the norm. This is especially true of our schools undergraduate colleges, which are the crucibles of science, where the spirit of inquiry must be nurtured. Many of these institutions have overcrowded classrooms and poorly equipped laboratories, where experiments are rarely conducted. In addition, we do not have enough quality teaching or research staff, partly owing to flight of talent to more supportive and lucrative academic and research environments abroad, and partly owing to the fact that many brilliant students do not consider a career in science as an attractive option. We have to change this. We have to bring in a very strong research culture in our research institutions, in our colleges, in our schools, and in our hospitals. I think you know, our clinical institutions must focus on translational research in a much bigger way. We keep focusing on clinical practice. We keep celebrating how dedicated and devoted our doctors are to patient care. But unless we start harnessing their experience and their wisdom for clinical research, I think we will lose a huge opportunity. I think Manju Sharma ji and I well know how we basically sacrificed a huge research opportunity uh, a decade ago when clinical trials were banned in the country. That was actually a very dark phase for research in our country. It took a long time to revive that culture of and spirit of clinically investigating any new hypothesis or treatment or concept. And I can tell you that the impact it has, the negative impact that it has made on translational research is something we are still struggling to overcome. 
we have to build credibility unless we start you know embracing the spirit of inquiry the spirit of research and experimentation and the spirit of innovation i don't think we will do justice to our talent and to our education in the capital intensive and empirical body of knowledge that is science it goes without saying that the lack of state of the art laboratory equipment can have a disastrous effect on the quality of research conducted whether it is in academic institutions or private research centers besides with very little mutual interaction or cooperation there is a disconcerting disconnect between our academia and industry as they pull in different directions i have always been trying to see how we can bring this industry academia connect and it's been a struggle because i think both uh, you know in parts of the uh, the equation believe that they don't need to connect each one believes they have to do things in a certain way and that is not going to work that is not going to help us build that scientific temper there has to be mutual trust mutual collaboration and there has to be mutual uh, innovation as a focus in, if we are to uh, progress even in the biotechnology industry which has shown a great promise in india by growing from a little known uh, science to a major economic enabler in just a few decades research has mainly focused on the imitative rather than the innovative where opportunities have been addressed with no strategic direction we need to shift our focus to discovery led innovation to attain global leadership in biotechnology this is a must this observation can be logically extended to other areas of scientific research in other realms as well it is true that we have the knowledge and the skill base to be ranked on par with the world's greatest scientific powers however we lack the requisite all pervasive scientific temper that is essential to transform us into a science and technology powerhouse to rank amongst the world's scientific elite we must first and foremost encourage the scientific community to create and market their intellectual property entrepreneurial scientists are crucial components in the march towards scientific superiority as is evident from the success of the united states as a leading scientific power in today's knowledge driven economy innovation is the primary driver of progress to generate intellectual wealth and create social good india will need to take several key measures i hate to say this because it sounds greedy to say that we must create intellectual wealth but without unfortunately without creating intellectual wealth you will not be recognized as an intellectual reader or a thought leader unfortunately that is the fact for innovation to be recognized and respected i think we have to create that intellectual wealth uh through all the kind of proprietary discoveries that scientists make and you know one of the things i have been pitching for is to embrace the uh, uh, the template created by the bay dole act in the us i think scientists must be encouraged to be able to uh, you know to to create patents to be inventors and to basically create that intellectual wealth that they can be recognized for of course through their institutions because technology transfer from institutions to industry is going to be a very important part of creating this intellectual wealth like it has been done in other parts of the world now what are these several steps that we need to take to create this particular ecosystem one is to fund ideas from lab to market funding is a critical factor that can de decide the course of science for innovation to flourish ideas must be funded and taken to the market without capital even the most transformative ideas can die before they can take flight 
at the research level to be able to reap the dividends of the time consuming and capital intensive research, we must attract monies from venture capitalists, from angel investors, from corporate social responsibility, and with incentives which are linked to that funding that can come forward. Until we can create a funding financing ecosystem, innovation in India will continue to be a far-fetched dream. India needs a virtuous cycle where academia generates ideas, especially those based on science and technology, which are incubated to proof of concept through government-sponsored seed and incubation funding, and then taken to the market through business intervention backed by venture funding. This is the virtuous cycle we need to create. Right now, I think we have at last started seeing ideas being incubated from scientific laboratories in, in research institutions and academic centers through government-sponsored funding. I think in the biotech sector, BIRAC has done an outstanding job of you know, incubating these ideas up to a proof of concept. But what has let us down are the business translation backed by venture funding. For some reason, venture funding is still very risk averse because that's the nature of science and technology in our area. Nothing is certain. Everything is based on hypothesis and you have to take that risk. If you believe that hypothesis can, come, uh, can, can become a reality, you have to fund that hypothesis. And that's what we need to educate our venture capitalists to do. They are very spoiled by today's very easy, uh, you know, technology to market journey of the IT sector. Unfortunately, you can develop a, a, a digital idea and take it to the market instantly. That's what they like because it's a very quick journey to the market. It fails or it succeeds, they are willing to back that and take that bet. But when it comes to fields like biotechnology uh, and others, where I think the uh, validation of, of the hypothesis takes a long time to translate into success or failure, they are not willing to take the risk along with the entrepreneur. I know that because I've done it many, many times. And I know how difficult it is to basically get that buy-in from a venture fund or a venture capitalist. In my early stages of building my company, I had to do it with my own source of debt financing. I had to go to banks, raise debts, and then find fund my own hypothesis in biotechnology to develop in those days enzymes. And then later on, of course, I was able to then attract venture funding to back my biopharmaceutical ideas, uh, which of course was higher risk. But I think I understand what uh, young entrepreneurs go, go through when they seek this kind of financing. Ease of accessing market, both primary and secondary, and being able to raise capital with greater flexibility would spur innovation and unleash an entrepreneurial avalanche. By encouraging technopreneurs to grow from small and medium enterprises to large industrial scale operations, India will be able to create a compelling opportunity to take innovative ideas to global markets. That's what I've been aspiring to do. That's what I've succeeded in doing. And I wish that many, many others, uh, you know, entrepreneurs could do the same. India will also need to forge academic cooperation in research and teaching programs between institutions of higher learning and national laboratories. Besides, academic institutions must be encouraged to coordinate with industry to share resources and skills. Better allocation of resources can improve the quality of science education in our schools, colleges, and universities. Opportunities for India to move up the value chain needs to be dovetailed with the entire ecosystem of innovation that brings together academics and research institutions, big industry and startups and entrepreneurs. A well-rounded national innovation ecosystem can be the ideal catalyst for India's emergence as a science and technology leader. 
while it is important to focus on higher education it must be understood that a culture of science can be built only when we start from the grassroots it is encouraging to note that the contributions of several public and private initiatives towards this end an excellent example is the vision group of science and technology constituted by the karnataka government which is significantly promoting science education in the state Indian scientists and institutions are I'm sorry to say risk averse we must take risks we must be more tolerant of failures a certain amount of irreverence is essential for creative pursuit in science true path breakers in science will refuse to preserve the status quo because they enjoy the fun of creation of new ideas and destruction of old dogmas we need to identify and support such scientists to the hilt the government must enable and support innovative startups and businesses that think locally but have the potential to make enormous global impact india should identify four to five moonshot specific sunrise segments for example in biotechnology where a 360 degree turnkey incentives and support should be provided for this sector to capitalize on globally available opportunities examples of these for instance everyone is very excited about mrna technologies how do we you know take on some challenges and new ideas with mrna technologies genomics is a huge area you know that even today when you look at uh, the new variant the omicron variant it is through genomic surveillance that we have actually come to identify such a uh, a new variant and i think genomics is very important when it comes to uh, you know diagnosing diseases understanding diseases understanding gene regulation various things so from basic to many other uh, aspects of science i think genomics unlocks many of these opportunities then we have this new emerging field of quantum biology and i think that's another moonshot area which we need to invest in synthetic biology is another big area which we should be investing in cell and gene therapy of course is now becoming a very hot area and that's an area we should be investing in of course uh, virology now is a very hot field because of the pandemic and i think we must continue to invest in virology in a big way um i think rare diseases is an area which we must really look at very seriously india is a vast diverse country in terms of its ethnicity its uh, its various demographics and its various um, uh, aspects of its um, uh of its of its uh, uh, te- uh, geo- uh, its geological terrain and i think we can actually uh you know a very very rich reservoir of knowledge built around rare diseases and research and innovation can happen in this field in a very big way then of course immune immuno oncology is of course is just at its in its nascency we are beginning to understand the immune system and its role in 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 triggering cancer but this is an area that again fosters a lot of research opportunities in basic research and in of course uh, the outcome of applying that basic research to various aspects of diagnosis and treatment i think here the government needs to support innovation by undercutting the risks through various forms of incentives and to basically start creating plug and play infrastructure and multilateral and multidisciplinary collaborations i think that's what we really need to do so in conclusion i would like to say that science lifted the world and its living standards over the past two centuries and it can do so again as we strive to advance in science and technology it is important to keep two things in mind one is that science can be sustainable only when it is closely linked to our economic imperatives to our
invention and innovation. Two, for a country haunted by hunger, poverty, and disease, the benefits of scientific research must go right down and be made affordable for the common man if these advances are to mean anything. I think India has actually demonstrated its leadership when it comes to affordable innovation. That has to be a very strong mantra in everything we do. We have to focus on making it affordable and accessible to the lowest common denominator in our country. That itself requires innovation. To make it affordable itself requires a lot of innovation. And then to basically make it accessible also takes another set of innovations. So I think that is some affordable innovation itself is a very strong mantra that we should be practicing. We therefore need science that is inclusive in its reach to the common man and sustainable for our long-term economic development. If it is well thought through, science and innovation can offer scalable and affordable solutions to pursue inclusive development. Again, I go back to the fact that for a country like India, whatever we do, we need to do it at scale. Even when we look at, say, uh, creating a universal healthcare model, it might work in pilots. It might work in small regions of the country. The big question is, how do we scale it up? How do we make sure that that small idea that works in a small setting can work in a big, uh, scalable uh, model? The government is aware of the need of an inclusive approach. The science, technology and innovation policy of 2020 states that in order for India to march ahead on a sustainable development pathway towards achieving an Atmanirbhar Bharat, a greater emphasis may be needed on developing traditional knowledge systems, developing indigenous technologies and encouraging grassroots innovation. With these objectives, India will not merely lead in science and technology, but also in human development. It is by developing a scientific temper, I again go back to the need for having a very strong scientific temper, investing in breakthrough ideas and embracing an inclusive model of growth that India will be able to unleash the power of innovation to ensure a better life for its billion plus citizens. In doing so, we will be able to garner a large share of, glo of the global value chain and combine both make in India and innovate in India to deliver our aspiration for an Atma Nirbhar Bharat. So with that, I'd like to thank you. And uh, really, I'm, I'm sure you had some very exciting deliberations. Uh, and I, I wish the rest of the deliberations to be even more exciting. But as someone who is very invested in the scientific ecosystem in the country, I do believe that the, despite the, the devastation we have seen from COVID-19, the small glimmer of hope I see is that it has ignited the flame of science and technology. It has ignited the flame of invention and innovation. And it has forcibly brought us into the global research ecosystem, which I think is big. I know how proud scientists within uh, the uh, National Institute of uh, Immunology are. I know how proud the scientists at uh, various uh, you know, uh, research institutions have been in contributing to find solutions for uh, COVID-19. This has kindled a new kind of life into science and technology in India. And I really think we should not lose this opportunity. I know as an industry, we have also requested the government to come up with research linked incentives. And one of those aspects of those incentives is to increase the incentive when there is an industry academia linkage. So I think that is something I really want us to aim for. I've always been very, very concerned about the fact that uh, the industry academia link has been very weak, many cases non-existent. 
But I really believe that if we can build that link, that bridge, and if we can actually, you know, get bold ideas coming out of our academic research labs and translate them into economic opportunities through a business partnership, that is where our country will catapult itself into a strong leadership position in science and technology. Thank you very much. Thank you, madam. Thank you for a nice talk, uh, giving a glimpse of the whole of the development of science and technology and its relation with the industry and the need of our, that how we should maintain the balance between the research and the industrial growth with the cooperation of each other. Many thanks. I would like to request Madam Manju Sharma ji to kindly express the formal vote of thanks. Thank you very much, Kiranji, for this uh, outstanding, very inspiring, and very encouraging lecture. The last part of it, what you said, uh, the business partnership, the link between academia and science, I think that has been talked of for so many years, and we really need to strengthen it. Unless we consciously will make it make an effort, I think things will be still slow. And as you said, if we, we want to attain leadership in science and technology, uh, we need to develop an intellectual capital in the country and also focus on innovations, uh, discovery driven uh, research uh, industry, and the two must come together. There must be several common platforms where industry and scientific institutions are together. That will build a very strong partner for India. And it was an excellent lecture you gave and we are very thankful to you. Always you have been very nice to the academy and you have always come to our, uh, this thing, with our request to give a lecture. So thank you so much. Thank you. Can we start the other session now? I will request Professor Padmanavan to please uh, chair the medical biotechnology and healthcare session. We have all the four speakers I can see. And uh, please, the only thing is we must remember that at six o'clock, by six o'clock, we must conclude so that uh, we can have the foundation day lecture. Thank you. Professor Padmanavan, please. Thank you. My my co-chair is there or no? Dr. Sanjeev Sinha has come. Maybe he'll join. Please. I thought I would request him to introduce the last two, two speakers. I will do the first two. Anyway. I ask uh, anyway, yes, madam. Just check whether Sanjeev Sinha is joining. No, madam, not yet. But just unko phone karo. In the meantime, we'll start with we'll get started. Yeah, Professor Ram's lecture. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for asking me to share this uh, medical biotechnology session. And I have great pleasure in introducing Professor Balaram. Uh, yeah, most of us know him, and there are young students. Uh, he was the former director of the Institute of Science. It's an outstanding, I don't know what shall I say, chemical biology, organic chemistry combination application to biology, chemical sciences to biology. Um, major contribution, evolution, the evaluation of factors influencing the folding and conformation of design peptides, investigated structural elements playing a key role in the formation of secondary structural motifs, motifs such as helices, beta turns, and sheets. You know, um, uh, Professor Balaram is known for his uh, uh, editorial in current science. Apart from the, you know, formal science, people used to anxiously wait or very eagerly wait for his uh, editorial in current science. Uh, Professor Balaram has been decorated with many awards uh, just to uh, is a recipient of uh, Padma Bhushan, the Twas Prize in 1994. He was conferred the Bruce Merry Merrifield Award in 2021. 
several hundred papers uh, Professor Balram has and the fellow of all the academy, science academies. Uh, so I have made it uh, pretty short, but uh, it's a pleasure to request Professor Balram to give his talk on protein sequence variation by random mutation and natural selection. The case of the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. Professor Balram. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Padmanabha. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Manju Sharma for inviting me to make this presentation. I must apologize if the content of my presentation doesn't entirely fit with the theme of the meeting, but I am going to talk about what I've learned about the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein over the last 18 months or so of the pandemic. And I've been an amateur sequence watcher for protein for many years. And on this first slide, I just show you what the spike protein looks like. Uh, the trioEM structure of the spike protein came out quite early on in the pandemic. And the coronavirus itself, which was discovered in the mid-1960s, derives its name from these protein spikes which form a corona. Now, on the second slide, I show you a very old paper. This paper, written by John Maynard Smith in 1970, talks about natural selection and the concept of protein space. And what Maynard Smith pointed out here was that if you took a four-letter word, word, and then you made single-letter mutations, you could eventually reach the word gene. If you look at all the words here, each one of them makes sense in the English language. So he said that protein evolution might have happened by mutations and new functions will evolve when a certain sequence now is capable of imparting that function. The sequence pace of Maynard Smith was revisited by Frances Arnold, who won the Nobel Prize a few years ago for her work on uh, test tube evolution of bacteria, where she compared the protein universe, sequence universe, and she drew attention to this little, little short story by the Argentinian author, George Louis Borges, called the Library of Weber. We have an enormous number of protein sequences. And to make sense of them, how do they affect protein function, has always been a challenge. The major characteristics of proteins are the following, that proteins fold into precise three-dimensional structures, they oligomerize, and they recognize ligands in a very specific manner, for example, receptors, antibodies, and so forth. Enzymes, of course, are a little bit more complicated in that in addition to binding, they also do further chemistry. But the protein that we are interested in today is the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. It has 1,273 residues. I show the sequence uh, sort of illustrated around the structure in the center of this slide. It has three functions. One is it binds to the receptor, and therefore it acts like a Trojan horse, which allows the viral components, the genetic components of the virus, the RNA, now to be delivered into the cell. And that schematic is shown also on this slide. So binding to a receptor, followed by proteolytic cleavage at a specific site, is the prelude to infection. After that, there's membrane fusion and virus internalization. All these events require the intimate participation of the spike protein. On the next slide, I show you what I've done with a couple of my colleagues, uh, uh, Professor Niranjan Joshi, who retired from the Indian Institute of Science, and Dr. Vijay Sarthi, who continues to be associated with me. Uh, we looked in the NCBI database for all the sequences of the spike protein which are now currently available. This is data up to the 15th of October. 
There are about six lakh sequences. We curated them for lengths up to 1266 to 1273 so that we don't have truncated version. And then we examined the number of mutations. That's what is shown in this set of numbers on the left hand side of the slide. So 3873 corresponds to the original Wuhan sequence. And then, of course, you have one, two, three mutations running all the way till 41. I want you to think about this. The Omicron mutant, which is now making the news, has in addition of 30, in excess of 30 mutations. There were sequences, odd sequences, which had more than that coming in 2020, but they didn't spread very much. What I have here is the number of mutations on this graph plotted against the logarithm of the number of sequences. And you can see some peaks. Those peaks correspond to spike protein variants which have driven the pandemic. For example, the D614G mutation and the mutations in the alpha and the delta variants. I'm going to come to this in some detail. In trying to understand diversity at specific positions along an amino acid chain, we use what is called the Shannon Wiener Index for representing amino acid diversity. This is well known to ecologists, and my colleague, Professor Niranjan Joshi, is very familiar with this. So, what he then did with this large database of sequences is simply to compute the Shannon Wiener index along the 1273 uh, residues of the chain. And now you see a small red line at the bottom, somewhere near about 1.09. Anything about that is a residue which is accumulating a lot of mutations. And you can now see all the mutations that are accumulating at different positions in the coronavirus by protein. This is for the US data set a much smaller data set which is available for India in the NCBI. I did not have access to the EATS account database. One can also look at the mutations and you see pretty similar mutations. Before I show you what results might actually mean, I show you a picture which looks nice and colorful. What this picture is, is we've taken 3000 coronavirus sequences which infect diverse animal hosts. So the coronaviruses would have started with some original ancestral organism and over evolutionary timescales eventually diversified into coronaviruses which infect many animal species. Today, we are worried about zoonotic transfer, but a great deal of uh, coronaviruses have been known to veterinarians for a long period of time and they've been sequenced. So we aligned all these sequences and they include a few human pathogens also and look at conserved and variable regions. We use the Shannon Wiener Index, which is shown at the bottom. So if a region is blue, it's highly variable. If a region is, uh, is red, it's much less variable. Now, if you look at this, I have the 1,273 residues. Each one is a rectangle running across the slide. You find that the blue is towards the first half, first six or seven hundred residues, and the more reddish regions or the more conserved regions are in the lower half. And I've indicated it on the top uh, schematic structure, which I've listed there. These two domains we can classify as the S1 and S2 domains, and they are cleaved when the spike protein is proteolized. I marked the cleavage site right in the middle. Now, coronaviruses bind to cellular receptors. Now, it turns out long ago in the 1990s, for the first human coronavirus which was ever discovered, 229E, human aminopeptidase N was shown to be the receptor. Now, 229E is the coronavirus which really gave the first electron micrograph. These are now opportunistic pathogens which latch on to any receptor which might be suitable on the surface. And mammalian cells have many proteases which are membrane embedded 
with large extracellular domains. Now, if you look at the human aminopeptidase, you find that it binds many coronaviruses. It binds a couple of human coronaviruses. It binds feline, porcine coronaviruses, but at different points in the structure. There's one human coronavirus, which is fairly widespread, called OC43, which does not bind. But the real lesson here is we've been exposed to coronaviruses for a long time. And about 30% of common colds are caused by coronavirus infection. Virology has become a popular subject in India after the pandemic. But virology was not such a popular subject in earlier years. Now, if you look at the parts of the pandemic over time, beginning in January 2020, all the way till June, July of 2021, this is what it looks like in the United States and India. This picture is July 2021. And you can see the two main peaks in the pandemic. The first peak, the one in which I also got infected, was driven by a mutation P614. I'm going to discuss this. The second, which was the very terrible period which we had in April and May of 2021, was driven by the mutation P681R. Now, I've shown the mutations here, the alpha and the delta. 10 in each, and I'm going to come back to this a little bit later. It, one characteristic of both these variants is they delete residues in the n terminus domain, and many bulky residues are replaced. Saline, histidine, and tyrosine in the case of the alpha, and in the case of the delta, uh, glutamic acid, phenylalanine, and a mutation of arginine to glycine. Also, these mutations are clustered together. 156, 157, 158, and so forth. So there is some meaning in this. If you now watch these mutations during the course of the pandemic, you can see the x-axis here is the number of days. Day zero is January 1 of 2020. And day 660 comes, takes you well into October 2021. And look at the mutation D614G. By March or April of 2020, every coronavirus which was being sequenced almost practically had the D614G mutation. This is an example of evolution in action. The Wuhan sequence had aspartic acid. Every sequence afterwards had lysine, and therefore viral fitness now improved with this, and we need to ask why. Later on in the pandemic, in 2021, you had the red, the alpha strain, and the blue, the delta strain. And you can see those beautiful figures, the alpha strain growing, eventually the delta strain growing and taking over from the alpha strain, which is all United States data. The United States is a wonderful laboratory for analyzing sequences because they have been much less controlled than other places. And they've had both strains now circulating for some time. And you can see somewhere between June and July of 2021, there was a point at which the alpha and the delta strains were equally widespread in the population. One can then think of possibilities like co-infection, recombination to give you a new mutants, and so forth. On the right are the figures for the furin Tibet site. The furin Tibet site was discussed very early in the pandemic as an unnatural feature of the Wuhan sequence. And there's always been this theory, did the Wuhan sequence emanate in a laboratory as a result of gain-of-function experiments aimed at humanizing a bat virus? But leaving that aside, you can see the mutations. The Wuhan sequence had proline at 681, the alpha variant had histidine, and the delta variant arginine. The studies have now shown in the literature that as you go from histidine to arginine, the efficiency of cleavage with furin keeps on increasing. You can follow infection dynamics by looking at this. These are slides which I got from my colleague Niranjan Joshi very recently, and you can see that one can study these. This is now historical analysis of the pandemic. And if you look, the alpha and the delta variants will continue to accumulate other mutations. 
So now there are viruses circulating which have as many as 15 mutations. I show them here in purple and in green. And you can see that and only one residue is common between the alpha and the delta variants. And this, of course, raises a question. How did these variants now independently evolve? The doubling times of alpha and delta don't seem to very, very much, but small differences are all that you need when you have such amount of infection and viral multiplication. But let's get back to the spike protein structure. S1 and S2 are the two domains which I've already marked. Red conserved domain and blue variable domain. But within those domains, you have structural domains which I've marked over here. And the breaking point in these would be that the red arrow shows you the furin cleavage site. Now we're going to look at some effects of mutations. We've talked about D614G. Now the spike protein itself exists in two conformations. Those two conformations you can see if you look at the structure on the left. The receptor binding domain in blue on one, the receptor binding domain in red on the other, and the RBD up is a pre-fusion confirmation. So there are structures available now, a pre-fusion confirmation and a confirmation which is like a resting state which we will call the RBD down. If you now take residues which are close to the angiotensin converting receptor in complex, lysine 417, and the site of mutation of spatic acid 614, you can see it is 69.79 angstrom in one state, 63 angstrom in the other. So it's a very large opening up which facilitates receptor interactions. If you go and look at receptor interactions, they are available now in the literature for soluble receptors. You can see which residues are interacting. I will go quickly past this so that I finish my lecture quickly. This is the kind of detail that you have in the literature. You can see some residues on the spike protein in brown interacting specifically with the angiotensin converting enzyme. If you have mutations here, you might either decrease binding or you might increase binding. Now you can examine different parts of the spike protein. The S2 domain is responsible for fusion and the fusion process I indicate here in the schematic. This is taken from work that has been done on the influenza virus. And you can see that many mutations which I've marked, which are now known, many of them also in the Omicron mutant, are in the S2 fusion domain. Another interesting feature that you will see here is you will see a preponderance of asparagine and serine residues which are now being mutated. I do not know the reasons for that. Furin clavage site has been discussed, and I show you just an alignment of four sequences at the bottom Wuhan, Alpha, Delta, and Omicron. The only additional mutant in the Omicron, which I think we should watch, is the mutation of asparagine to lysine, which I've shown here. But I don't believe that this is going to enhance proteolytic cleavage any more than has already happened. Now, the Omicron mutant itself, which everybody is interested in, has all these mutations. But you can see how science has changed. Uh, Kiran Majumda talked a great deal about the scientific temper. But what it means is that even old scientists like me now need to get used to new ways of communicating scientific information. The Omicron sequence first appeared on Twitter when Tom Peacock put out that sequence over there. This was the 23rd of November. Today is the 4th of December. So we are moving pretty fast. On the 25th of November, he put out another tweet saying Q493R, not Q493K, and that's what we have here. So I've corrected this. But interestingly, Q493 is a residue which binds to the receptor. Looking at the structure, it would seem that Mutation to an arginine, it's hard to predict what it will do. Uh, it might, in fact, even destabilize receptor binding. But one does not really know at this point. I should show you 
summary slide here from Francis Collins in 2021. Now, if you look at the kinds of antibodies which are now known and characterized, they bind in the receptor binding domain, the N terminus domain, and the S2 subunits domain. And so we do have antibodies. Some of them we've always had because of the similarity between past coronaviruses and the present coronavirus. And now the mutations of the Omicron mutants now you can see all over the place. A large number of them focused in the S2 domain. Sometimes these mutations do not seem to affect receptor binding because the residue is pointing away from the receptor. Then maybe it is important for binding to an antibody. So today when people talk all the time about immune escape mutants, uh, one needs to look at these. Is structure important? Structure is important. Conformational changes are very important because all virus vaccines are now based not on the original spike protein sequence, these mRNA vaccines, but they are on engineered sequences. And in these engineered sequences, proline residues have been inserted, A986P and B987P in the Moderna vaccine. So sometimes these stabilize the pre-fusion conformation. This runs, of course, across all viruses because all viruses have this kind of fusion domain. That brings me more or less to the end of the scientific presentation that I wanted to make. But I will conclude by drawing your attention to an article written by Joshua Lederberg in the Journal of the American Medical Association more than 30 years ago. This was at the height of the HIV fears in the United States. And his article is entitled Medical Science, Infectious Disease and the Unity of Humankind. And this is what Lederberg says, and it's well worth reading. Human intelligence, culture, and technology have left all other plant and animal species out of the competition. We also may legislate human behavior, and many times governments try very hard to do so. We have too many illusions that we can, by writ, govern the remaining vital kingdoms, the microbes that remain our competitors of last resort for domination of the planet. The bacteria and viruses know nothing of national sovereignty. SARS-CoV-2 has established this. In that actual evolutionary competition, there is no guarantee that we will find ourselves the survivor. He goes on to say that many defense mechanisms inherent in our evolved biologic capabilities mitigate the pandemic viral threat. Mitigation is also built into the evolution of the virus. It is a very quick victory for a virus to eradicate its host. This may have happened historically, but then both the vanquished host and the victorious parasite will have disappeared. Even the death of the single infected individual is relatively disadvantageous in the long run to the virus, compared with a sustained infection that leaves a carrier free to spread the virus to as many contacts as possible. From the perspective of the virus, the ideal would be a merely symptomless infection in which the host is oblivious of providing shelter and nourishment for the indefinite propagation of virus genes. If this last sentence had been read early on in the pandemic, we would have had slightly different public health measures as far as testing was concerned. Asymptomatic transmission has in fact been the driver of the COVID-19 pandemic. Lederberg concludes at evolutionary equilibrium, we would continue to share the planet with our internal and external parasites, paying some tribute, perhaps sometimes deriving from them some protection against more violent aggression. The past coronaviruses might have provided us some protection. The terms of that equilibrium are unwelcome. Present knowledge does not offer much hope that we can eradicate the competition. Nothing has changed in 30 years. Meanwhile, our parasites and ourselves must share in the dues, payable in a currency of discomfort and precariousness of life. No theory lets us calculate the details. We can hardly be sure that such an equilibrium for Earth even includes the human species, even as we contrive to eliminate some of the others. A propensity for technological sophistication, harnessed to intraspecies competition, adds a further dimension of hazard. 
this interspecies competition is in fact one of the greatest dangers that we have. He concludes, and I will conclude my presentation by reading you this. He says, as one species, we share a common vulnerability to these targets. No matter how selfish our motives, we can no longer be indifferent to the suffering of others. The microbe that fell one child in a distant continent yesterday can reach years today and seed a global pandemic tomorrow. Never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. The Omicron mutant, which appears to have emanated in Botswana and South Africa, is being discussed in the press. It might well have emanated elsewhere too. But viruses are going to be around and they will continue to mutate. Thank you very much. In conclusion, I'd like to thank Dr. Manju Sharma again, and also the two institutions which have hosted me through much of my academic career. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Balram, for a very enlightening and a slightly different lecture with a different perspective. Um, I think we, we haven't been discussing projects, I mean, we have not been uh, having discussions after the presentation, so I don't know, time <laughs> gets to be more important than anything else, I suppose. Thanks again, Professor Bhagram, for a very, very interesting lecture. I think we should. Thank you. We'll go to the next one. Professor Jagannathan. I'm there. Rakesh Mishra, is it? Next one. Uh, After Dr. Jagannathan is Dr. Rakesh Mishra. We, we, uh, we swapped our talk. Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh. So it's uh, Dr. Jagannathan, is it now? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. So let me formally introduce uh, Dr. Jagannathan. He's currently the J.C. Bose National Fellow and Professor of Eminence of Radiology at Chetty Nadu Academy of Research and Education, Kerala Bakum, Tamil Nadu. He, I think entire career he was at Professor, head of the department, NMR and MRI facility at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. And it always identified with uh, MRI and I think contributed a great deal in this field. He's the author and co author of uh, several hundred publications, edited five volumes. He's a fellow of uh, science academies. Uh, uh, Indian Science Congress Fellow of International Society for Magnetic Resonance in Medicine. In 2017, he was elected as Vice President of the Indian INSA New Delhi, recipient of several awards, J.C. Bosch National Fellowship I mentioned, outstanding contribution to science in 2015, also S.K. Mitra Birth Centenary Gold Medal Award of the Indian Science Congress Association from the Prime Minister of India. Significant lifetime contribution to the development of science and technology in the country. Professor Jagannathan is going to talk to us on study of breast cancer metabolism by MRI and MR spectroscopy. Professor Jagannathan, please. Thank you very much, sir. Are you able to see my slides? We can, but you must make it on the full screen. Yeah, we can see it. Uh, can you make it full full screen? Yeah. Is it a full screen now? Uh, no, now it's okay. Now it's okay. Fine. No, I think something is happening. Just one second.
Okay. Um, thank you very much, GP sir. And I would also like to thank Dr. Manju Sharma and uh, Dr. Ajay Gattai for giving me this opportunity uh, to share some of my work that uh, mostly I did at uh, AIMS New Delhi. Uh, basically, to study the uh, cancer metabolism by MRI and MR spectroscopy. Uh, it's a truly an analytical tool, uh, sort of uh, uh, invented by physicists and later hijacked by chemists and then biologists and then uh, came into the realm of uh, uh, medicine where it revolutionized the field of uh, radiology. Uh, we all know that in uh, cancer metabolism, there are a lot of differences between the resting versus the proliferating cells. So if a cancer, for example, cell wants to convert the energy, nutrients into energy and biomass, mainly for cell proliferation. They use a variety of nutri nutrients, including glucose, glutamine, glutamine, fatty acids, amino acids, and glucose, we all know that supplies the energy in the form of ATP as well as carbon for uh, biomass. And some cancer cells also use glutamine as an oxidative substrate substrate for energy and as also as a source of carbon and nitrogen for biomass and they also use the fatty acids to generate lipids for cell membrane and oxidase mitochondria to produce energy and amino acids of course all of you know that produce macromolecules like proteins and nucleic acids so this is what i have actually shown in this uh, particular slide as a cartoon wherein i want to derive the home that some of the metabolites that I have pointed out here can be actually detected in, a, in vivo from a human being so that we can study a, a better tool, as a better tool, the metabolism of the cancer cells. So what are all the different techniques for assessing metabolism that are available in vivo? Uh, what I have gone, uh, shown on the left one is basically a broad invasiveness versus the number of metabolites. If it takes, for example, positron emission for that, tomography, PET, or hyperpolarized MRS, they require injection of the radioactive nitride or a contrast material, and they give very low number of metabolites compared to what is isotope infusion and MR spectroscopy. They give slightly larger number of metabolites compared to PET and um, hyperpolarized MRS. But if you do metabolomics using NMR or MAS or LCMS, it requires a tissue, but it gives very high number of metabolites. So basically, NMR or MRI or MRS is a non-invasive physical technique. And as I told you, it's an interface between biology and physical science and revolution is the field of medicine. And once this technique uh, was developed by physicists in the early 1940s, and later with the advent of 2D and 3D NMR, the biologists and the chemists started using it for their own synthesis and to find out the structure of micromolecules. Later in 1980s, the use of NMR in medicine was realized when MRI was developed. Now, MRI is a buzzword even for a street uh, person going in the streets. So this is a technique where it uses all the fields of science, technology, and engineering. Like, for example, the expertise of physics, chemistry, engineering, technology, computer specialists, and others. So it's a combination of so many fields of science and technology and engineering, which basically give the MRI. Just for a, the students who are participating through the YouTube, I just wanted to give a glimpse of what is MRI. Basically, it gives the anatomical information. That means you can actually study what are all the different organs present in a particular region of interest that you are going to image. And it gives a superior soft tissue contrast compared to the other imaging modalities like CG, uh, PET, etc. And as a multiplanar imaging capability, which is very, very useful. Not only multiplanar imaging capability, what I mean is that getting the images in the three orthogonal planes, that is the axial, coronal, and the sagittal, you also, up to today's in MRI scanner, get up to three oblique planes. That means a section going 30 degrees sagittal to coronal, or minus 30 degrees, plus 38 degrees, it is all possible. And you get a lot of functional information, which is very important through functional MRI, MR angiography, perfusion imaging, and diffusion. And the beauty of MR is that when you do it in in vivo, you not only get the structural information on the morphology through MR imaging, you also get the metabolic information when you do the spectroscopy that you are actually familiar with using NMR for many of the biochemistry or organic chemistry people. So it gives the complete uh, metabolic information that means the biochemicals present in a particular tissue, which I have pointed out, for example, in the breast cancer one on the right side. You see that. The voxel that is positioned in the tumor is much different from what the voxel positioned in the normal breast tissue. 
So that means you can actually get the biochemical distribution from the region of interest called the ROA and study the physiology and metabolism. Not only that, you can study the efficacy of drugs in group of patients and dynamics, pharmacokinetics, and also you can use it for monitoring treatment. Not only MR spectroscopy, but also MR imaging because both are non-invasive. So the role of in vivo MR in clinic, clinical medicine, if I can summarize, is basically to distinguish between malignant and benign lesions, which is sometimes very difficult to do that. And identifying small lesions, if you do it at early, then you save the patient of uh, the surgery or the uh, very aggressive chemotherapy. It also can guide biopsy, treatment response, and guiding therapy possible recurrence. And today I'm going to talk on the study of the physiology and metabolism. So can we now use MR to monitor the metabolic changes. What happens when a ca cancer cell actually transforms into malignancy? There are two types of changes that one, one can encounter in a broader sense. One is the change in the structural features, which le will lead to morphological changes and also the micro -MR. Can I use MR to study that? Yes, you can use the routine MRI, which is T1 and T2 on proton density images. And you can also use dynamic contrast MRI and diffusion MRI and MRI also. The other major thing when the malignant malignancy occurs is that changes in the biochemical and the metabolic alterations. So I can use this technique to study that through MR spectroscopy. And this is what I have actually shown in a pictorial representation. So you have a grass anatomy of the tissues, you have the microvascular vasculature, microenvironment, and, and then the metabolism. So microvasculature can be studied by dynamic contrast and the, uh, the Micro environment and the, diffu the use of diffusion coefficient using diffusion MRI and MR spectroscopy, you can actually monitor the hypoxia, acidosis, and the one. And the metabolism and bioenergetics can be studied by MR spectroscopy. Now, just for the sake of the students, what happens when a cancer cell progresses? Basically, it leads to high metabolic demand for oxygen and nutrients, which will which is generally achieved by angiogenesis. And this will lead to abnormal vasculature and permeability, leading to hypoxia in tu and tuber environment, microenvironment. So, and the perfusion characteristics also changes. And these can be monitored by dynamic contrast in MRI, in which we give the patient a contrast material and then monitor the images as a function of time when the patient is being infused with the contrast. So you can actually measure the extra volume extracellular volume, volume transfer coefficient. I will give you one example of the changes in the structure and the microvascular changes by MRI and dynamic contrast. What I have shown on the left is the T1 weighted and T2 weighted images. I'm not going into the details of it, but you can very easily appreciate that the tumor is seen as a contrast very well compared to the normal tissues. In most cases of breast cancer, the dilemma for your radiologist is to find out whether it is a benign or a malignant tumor. And what I have shown on the right panel is uh, the top one is a uh, benign tumor, wherein you can find out as and when the patient is given the contrast through an IV injection, we monitor the images at a frequent interval. And then once if the time profile of the curve, that what I mean here is that the time taken for the images to be produced through the contrast, if is continuously rising, it, then it's a type 1 curve indicating that it is a benign tumor. If we take the lower bottom on the right one, Basically, it is a malignant tumor, so there is the membrane rupture there, and so the contrast goes into that very fast. So you have a sharp increase in the fall. That means washing and washer, which is typical of type three curve, uh, which indicate malignancy. And in between that, you have type two, where it is a dilemma for radiologists to find out whether it is a benign or a malignant. Now, further, this malignant transfer transformation not only leads to morphological changes. But it also leads to rapid proliferation, which, as I said earlier, leads to the anatomical changes. And this actually disturbs the endogenous cell architecture and the microstructure. This is reflected in the tumor size and the cell density. And it will lead to loss of membrane integrity as well, and also changes the fluid property. So all these effects basically is reflected in the fluid property. So if one can do the diffusion MRI, you can actually monitor this complete malignant transformation that leads to microenvironmental and microstructural changes. By measuring the diffusion coefficient, when we do it in in vivo, we call it as an apparent diffusion coefficient because it's not observable. 
And one such example, what I have given is basically the microstructural and environmental changes monitored by diffusion MRI. Concentrate on the left top and the right top. One is the normal breast on the left. You can see the diffusion coefficient is 1.5. And whereas in the tumor that I have shown on the right, the tumor shows 0.91 compared to the 1.86 of the tumor. So when we did a very large data set, close to about 450 patients over a period of about a decade, and you can see that in pre therapy patients, the diffusion coefficient is much less than compared to the control or the benign or the contralet. And this is what is depicted on the right. So basically, the lower ADC value that we compute from diffusion MRI compared to the normal and company is due to the high cellularity that is present in tumors. And then the metabolism also changes during therapy. So can we use the technique of MRI to monitor the therapy induced metabolic changes because it completely changes the cell architecture. So the diffusion coefficient that you measure will or can reflect the changes. And one more clinical question attached to this one, because when a surgeon operates this, he also wants to, wanted to know how long or how far above the tumor that he can resect the normal tissues so that there is no uh, even a small one or two cells in the area above the tumor or below the tumor. So what we did is that we used diffusion in about uh, close to 40 patients and then draw a concentric circle around the tumor and above the tumor up to two centimeters and determine the diffusion coefficient. And we were able to find out that outside the margin OAM, M, OAM1, OAM2, OAM3 are different in complete responders compared to partial responders and compared to non-responders. So that means this diffusion coefficient, when I do it in outside margins, may serve as a response predictive indicator. That means I can now give the surgeon that up to about 15 millimeter from the tumor border, you can resect it very easily. So the safe limit that we have given in this paper is up to two centimeters. It's a very clinically useful method that we can give it to the surgeons. Further, what I have talked until now is about the microenvironment, structural morphological changes, which are being monitored by routine MRI, diffusion MRI, and dynamic contrast. I have already showed in one of my earlier slides that this malignant transformation also leads to a lot of changes in the biochemical and metabolic conditions. So it alters the water and the lipid composition and also the proteins that are present. And these can be easily monitored by in vivo spectroscopy. Either it can be proton or phosphorus spectroscopy. And this is what we have done. The effect of metabolism on the different stages of tumor. Can I use now in vivo MR spectroscopy to monitor the spectral characteristics? What I have shown on the top is the normal breast tissue, which is dominated by a lot of uh, lipids, very little water. So one can use the biomarker like water to fat ratio. And also the presence of choline and choline signal to noise ratio or the absolute concentration, which I will come to you a little later. What I have shown on the bottom is basically the spectral characteristic of an early stage T1 tumor, T2 tumor, and T4B tumor. You can see clearly the spectral pattern, and hence there is a variation in the water to fat ratio. And now, using water to fat ratio, one has to be very careful for the simple reason that the normal women, actual women, actually undergoes a lot of changes during the hormonal period, during the menstrual period. So, what we did another study is that. Putting the voxel at the region of interest in the normal breast at three quadrants, upper quadrant, uh, lower quadrant, and near the nipple, you find out how the spectral pattern changes. You can see very clearly upper pattern and lower uh, quadrant NMR, NMR spectroscopy was slightly more or less similar. Whereas if you do, do the spectrum from the parallel near the nipple region, the spectral pattern is entirely different. So when we did this experiment in about uh, close to about 30 uh, volunteers, through the function of the menstrual cycle, you can find out that the water fat ratio is much less in the uh, during the neutral period compared to the menstrual and the proliferative period. And also, you can measure this as a function of uh, the treatment uh, as well, which I will come to you a little later. So this is as long as the as as far as the water to fat ratio is concerned. Now there is a change in the lipid metabolism also in cancer. So can we use this again, this technique to find out that? So we evaluated 
in about uh, close to 70 patients and 35 uh, 30 volunteers and 30, 35 benign uh, patients what is the water to uh, the fat ratio which is where, where we can actually calculate the area of the water and the lipid and then have the lipid lipid by water plus lipid and you can find out that in the malignant one it is much less than compared to benign healthy so we also estimated the fat fraction as a function of the several hormonal uh, status like er plus pr plus versus the er minus pr minus and yet to do plus to a twin minus and triple positive and triple negative so these results imply that during the menstrual period the women undergoes a lot of hormonal changes which leads to changes in the metabolism which can easily be monitored by proton then mass spectroscopy now coming back uh, to choline see earlier i have been concentrating only on the water and the fat whereas if you suppress the water and fat then you can see the choline actually unlike brain breast does not contain many metabolites because it is basically dominated by fat the breast so you only when you suppress the water in fact you can see the choline choline which can be used as a biomarker because this choline increases because of this cycle and due to increased membrane synthesis and rapidly dividing uh, cells you can see the choline presence in most of the malignant cells and when we were doing this experiment uh, with the malignant and benign patients as well as in volunteers i wanted to give you one example of a fibroadenoma case where you can see the tumor and we did a multi cell spectroscopy and we chose only water there is no choline. but in few patients we were also able to find out the choline at 3.2 ppm and then while i was doing the experiment my student was not available on that day i was having a patient who was lactating at that time one breast was affected by a tumor the other breast was not affected so when i put the voxel on the unaffected breast i was able to see the lactose lactose also in vivo in addition to the lipid and the water and also choline that means choline is present not only in malignant cells as well as in benign as well as in lactating cells so can we now estimate or find out what is the metabolic differences in these three cases so for that one instead of relying only on the qualitative presence or the absence of choline we need to have some kind of a biomarker which is quantitative so we first resorted to having a signal to noise ratio of the choline peak later we developed a method to find out the absolute quantitation in vivo uh, determining absolute quantitation in vivo is very difficult because you need to have so many other things common because we are dealing with human being so this is a typical left one malignant uh, before suppression of water and fat you can see only water and fat when you suppress yeah, clearly choline and benign also you can see choline peak in normal uh, human beings also you can see choline so this is the plot on the right hand side uh, the early breast cancer have a little higher choline concentration compared to the locally advanced cancer that is uh, t3 and t4 benign and normal uh, breast tissues have a less choline concentration so we plotted as a function of uh, the different hormonal uh, things and then we were not able to find out much difference in the choline concentration between er plus pr plus r er plus pr minus etc but the volume of the tumor basically changes in all these uh, cases now we resorted to instead of doing either diffusion or dynamic contrast or mr spectroscopy we wanted to combine all the three because Doing it in NBO also in, increases the time. The patient has to be uh, lay still more than about 45 minutes, which is very difficult. So, what we did in one of the cases is that I earlier told you that a lactating breast also, in lactating breast also, we used to observe choline. So, what is the metabolic difference between a malignant cell and a lactating breast tissue? So, what here what we did is we did diffusion weighted imaging and also a mass spectroscopy this is from a malignant breast tissue you can see the choline and the concentration in these patients roughly about 12 patients we did it is about 3.51 uh, uh, millimolar per kg on the right side it's a lactating breast you can see the voxel from which the spectrum is obtained which is shows clearly the lactose and the choline and the lipid and the concentration of this uh, choline peak is also almost the same thing so we ended up in a dilemma 
So how do we distinguish using MR spectroscopy? The malignant patient we have is a normal lactating breast tissue. So we introduced the diffusion imaging into the protocol. When we did that one, we were very easily able to find out the difference between the lactating breast and the breast tissue because the diffusion coefficient of the malignant breast tissue is around 1 compared to 1.62. So when you do the plot, a TCO, a coding concentration was easy. You can easily find out the two groups, lactating and the malignant one, easily. So combining two, three methodology, MR methodologies actually will give you an indication of how you separate out the malignant breast cancer patients with obviously lactating breast cancer patients. So, so far I have been discussing using MRI, MR spectroscopy as a tool to find out the, the or use it as a diagnostic one. Now, can we talk more about the association of enhanced polling with the beta catenin pathway into breast cancer? So, we did a pilot study using ELISA and MR spectroscopy. And what I have shown on the bottom is the uh, benign case of the lawyer one, and the upper one is the uh, from the malignant breast tissue. And you can find out a very clear difference in the total, total choline concentration between the benign and the malignant, which is shown in the histograph plot on the right. So if we take the uh, metabolism and the relation between choline metabolism and the WNT pathway in breast cancer, we all know that in normal breast tissue, uh, this is the kind of uh, the metabolism that goes in. The cyclin D1 basically encodes the cell regulatory protein that is expressed in at high level during the G1 phase. And beta catenin is an important component of the WNT signaling pathway and is involved in diverse cellular process. And it tra translocates to the nucleus where it binds to the T cell uh, receptors factors and activates the transcription of a number of genes including cyclin D1. That's what I have shown over the bottom. So what we did is that we uh, recruited 10 patients, uh, 20 patients, and uh, the involved uh, take take took out the tissue from the involved uh, tissue uh, malignant uh, portion as well as from the uninvolved and compared it with the benign. So you can see here that uh, the cytosolic and the nuclear fraction of beta catenin in uh, malignant cells are quite different. And if you take it benign, this cytosolic is more or less the same. Whereas there is a lot of difference in the nuclear uh, fraction. Similarly, in the case of cyclin D1, you can see that it is 1.7 cytosolic and nuclear is 2.21, and there is not much difference between the malignant cell and the uh, benign uh, tissue. And the T codeine concentration is uh, high in malignancy compared to the benign one, which I already showed. So if you plot the cytosolic fraction of the malignant tissue with the beta catenin and T codeine concentration, you will see. A gradual increase in the concentration, whereas in the benign tissue, there is nothing much. So, what we basically in this work is done that one compare the coding that we determined from MR spectroscopy with the actual metabolism that is happening in the uh, cancer cell. So, I wanted to give you a little bit glimpse of how MR can be also be used for monitoring the therapy, being a non invasive technique. This is a very useful for the clinicians to find out. The top panel basically gives the pre uh, the respondent. Uh, diffusion weighted imaging. Uh, the A1 is a pre therapy, the B1 is after the first cycle, and the C1 is after the third cycle. You can see the um, blue arrow, the tumor is very big prior to therapy, is now reducing. And in C, after the third cycle, therapy is completely disappearing. The bottom one is on a non responder exam one. You can see here in all the three panels now prior to therapy after first cycle and third cycle, the tumor size and the tumor diffusion portion remains more or less the same. So this information, we can give it to the clinician in about one minute because the sequence takes only about one minute and we can tell whether the patient is going to respond or not. So depending upon that, the physician actually can change the treatment regimen and then save the patient from undergoing much more uh, torture of the chemotherapy. Similarly, you can use the metabolic changes determined when in vivo spectroscopy. What I have shown on the left is the simple water to fat ratio as a function of treatment response. One is the create therapy after the post therapy, and the water fat ratio is shown down on the left panel, where the water fat ratio, which was much higher prior to therapy, reduced considerably after the post therapy. So, but then water to fat ratio cannot be used under all circumstances because some. Uh, Tumors have only lipids, so that will be confusing. So we restarted to basically doing the choline concentration, as I told you earlier. 
and the top right panel is on the responder. Before therapy, you can see the choline, the arrow, and after therapy, the complete disappearance of the choline. Whereas in non-responders, you can see the complete uh, the uh, presence of choline even after the third cycle, and the tumor size also remains more or less the same. So we also combine the uh, other techniques like diffusion weighted imaging and regular imaging uh, to study the induced metabolism, uh, drug induced metabolism. This is a diffusion weighted imaging of a responder, uh, and this is the uh, corresponding MR spectroscopy pattern where you can see that the ADC value is much lower and the choline concentration is much higher. And if you co come to the uh, left bottom corner where it is the post therapy one of the same patient, you can see the complete disappearance of the tumor in the volume size as well as increase in the ADC value and the also decrease in the choline concentration. Whereas if you come to the poor responder on the right side, the top and the uh, bottom panel shows that the tumor size more or less the remains the same and the choline concentration also remains the same. So you can now plot it in this way where you can very easily identify the uh, pre-therapy and the post-therapy, the two groups of patients as a function of the first cycle, second uh, cycle, and the third cycle. So using both MR spectroscopy and diffusion weighted imaging, you can segregate the patients who are responding or not responding. You can get the kind of information even after first cycle of therapy. And if other parameters, clinical parameters do that, and these patients can be advised to go for a, another treatment regimen rather than the one that they actually follow now. So in addition to, this is my final uh, slides, which will give you how the metabolism of chemo drugs can be monitored by in vivo MR. So I'm going to complete this. This was the one uh, actually done by me in USA, where we find out that the 5-FU uh, fluorouracil, which is normally given with a modulator before and after, and you find out actually it goes to catabolism and anabolism and produces the fluorobeta already. And when we give the modulator before or after, we found there is absolutely no difference. You can find out at 10.5 minutes, the fluorobeta alanine is uh, there whether you give the drug, uh, five of your drug with the modulator 30 minutes before or after. So the, even though it is not a very encouraging result, but it gives that the usual, you, very useful information from the clinician that the modulator giving before or after it doesn't induce much change. Today uh, morning, Dr. GP was, uh, uh, Dr. GP was making that uh, make in India thing. There are two programs I wanted to uh, convey to the audience here. One is started by uh, the government of India, METI, uh, which involves five institutions, Samir Mumbai and CEDAC Chivandra Mughi Kroketa, New York City, Delhi and Diamond Sankar. And they have already come up with a lot of coils. I have shown the head coil, the loop coil and the images they have got. So this uh, basically project was uh, given, proposal was put up in 2014 and was accepted in March 2015. And then we are now where the magnet is being fabricated in Delhi. And once it is fabricated, we will be linking all this one to this one. And I chair this committee. Uh, and the other one, which Dr. GP was talking, is about uh, the voxel grid, which is a, a private firm which have also manufactured and also installed one at Satya Institute in Puttaparthi. It's a lightweight, ultra fast next generation MRI scanners by voxel grid. And in fact, Bayrak is uh, funding on this one. And I chair this committee. And they have uh, fabricated the complete magnet and the electronics. And this is the kind of a figure that I'm showing, which was uh, installed already. And they have come up with two more prototype MRIs. And it is going to be very cost effective, lightweight, and it can also be transported to the district headquarters. And this is the first image that they have shown uh, to us for the committee. So we are actually now slowly into the Make in India program. And very soon, I think we will have an MRI, which is cost effective, and we will have all the functions that what we do and the cost effectiveness will be about 50% of the cost that we are actually now buying with MR scanners. Uh, with this, I would like to conclude by thanking my students and the collaborators and my boss at uh, Komaraski with whom I learned in the MRI technique and the funding from the DST, which has been funding this almost for three decades continuously for this breast cancer. Thank you very much and thank you very much again, Dr. Manju Sharma and Dr. Gadak for giving me this opportunity and thanks GP and Dr. Sanjay Sharma. Thank you, Professor Jagannathan, for highlighting the potential of the MRI 
uh, various applications and highlighting cancer, breast cancer in particular. Thanks again for a very, very valuable lecture. Thank you. Shall we move forward? Uh, Sir, yes, can I, sir. sir, may I come in, sir? May I give some comment? Yes, I am Dr. Sina here. Sina has sir. joined now. I have joined since speaking, sir. I am there. Chair is there. Yes. Uh, Dr. Sanjeev Sina is here. Okay. Can yes, you sir. introduce sir, I, the next two speakers? It will be nice of you. I'll do. I'd like to thanks to Professor Jagannathan. It's my pleasure to hear you. I have done a lot of work with him. And we have done several international publications together at AIMS New Delhi. So, Dr. Jagannathan, thank you very much for an excellent talk. Dr. Sinan. Uh, Thanks, Rakesh Kishra, nice for you. Uh, and uh, congratulations for an excellent talk. So, I would like to introduce next speaker. And. Uh, Rakesh Kishra. Yeah, yes, I, yeah. I have that program. So, I would like to invite uh, Professor Rakesh Mishra. He is director of Tata Institute and Genetics and Society at Bangalore. And he is a found director at Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology at Hyderabad. His topic of talk is pandemic triggered realization of need and capability, self reliance in the healthcare. Dr. Akesh Mishra, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sina, for the, uh, the introduction. And uh, uh, I thank also Nasi and especially Dr. Manju Sharma for giving me this opportunity to speak uh, to this uh, very special uh, event. Uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Sina said, I'm going to basically talk about how we got motivated and catalyzed to think of self-reliance in many other things which we were kind of uh, uh, complacent and this pandemic uh, although we have gone through a lot of suffering has given many positives and i'm going to highlight uh, one uh, uh, which is about the self-reliance uh, particularly in uh, from uh, my experiences uh, during our fight against the covid uh, 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 from CCMB. So, uh, so uh, this self-reliance is we are what we are talking is not really uh, limited to pandemic. It's going to be uh, well beyond that. Pandemic has been really testing time for uh, the healthcare system. Huge economic impact and social and psychological impact. We are still counting uh, and waiting for pandemic to get over. Hopefully soon uh, but this also has uh, uh, implications that the increasing scope of healthcare domain which is going to be a driver uh, large extent is still uh, already entering into that and the job creation and uh, with that we know that new healthcare era is coming of precision and personalized medicine prevention nutrition and one health and in all these aspects we need really uh, uh, almost complete self-realization, otherwise these will remain uh, a dream for, for us. So, uh, coming back to the pandemic, when a, a, a new infection arrives, what we immediately need to do is uh, uh, detection of and diagnosis, of course. For India, it has to be accessible, feasible, and very high throughput. Method should be of this kind. Controlling the spread uh, by technical means, behavioral, governmental interventions and so on and then many other related issues of new way of working uh, managing life information uh, distribution access so on and policy and ideas so it comes with really multiple aspects that need to deal with it i'm going to talk about as i said uh, in brief uh, the effort that we made at ccmb uh, ccmb as you know is a csr laboratory uh, uh, with a mandate to carry out fundamental research uh, in biology. And all what I'm going to talk to you, almost everything uh, is 
mostly the contribution of our PhD students who stayed back uh, during the lockdown and uh, uh, instead of going home contributed to the fight against this pandemic. And we have played several roles uh, in this process as a testing center, as a training center for testing, validation center for the testing kits, a national repository for virus and patient samples. We even cultured virus in the laboratory to enable testing and screening of drugs, uh, validation of devices, and we developed uh, uh, diagnostic methods, protocols, SOPs, understanding the biology of the virus and the genome dynamics uh, of the virus. There were many activities in which uh, we were uh, uh, involved. And I will cover just few of them. I will just talk very briefly how we indigenized or innovated in the uh, uh, testing uh, First, uh, as a first example, so conventional testing is done when the swab is collected in a BTM, then is brought to the lab and is unpacked. It's a massive exercise. Those who do diagnostic, they know. Then you have to do RNA isolation and then RT-PCR. So what the students did, they uh, tested uh, since they were the volunteers for testing. They were also doing research. So they trans, uh, used dry swab and not in the VTM, so we save VTM and we are transporting, there is no leakage and there is no RNA isolation required and you do directly PCR. So that led to uh, many advantages immediately. So 50% less time, 40% less cost, many fold higher throughput and so on. And uh, this uh, swab was later recognized by ICMR and has been handed over to several companies uh, and we are even developing even uh, uh, as a co-producers of this kit with Apollo hospitals, which should be in the market soon. Other in, uh, activity did was uh, a collaboration with Sinjin, which was uh, funded by CSIR completely to go for a very high level, uh, high throughput uh, uh, screening. I will not go into the uh, details of this, but idea here is to collect the sample uh, do isolation uh, of RNA and put on a plate with the barcoding and then these samples are pulled together, transported to the NGS laboratory and then NGS is, put, uh, is uh, carried out uh, with another barcoding and in about 48 hours you have the results. The important thing here is that you can do 50,000 samples in one go and the cost will be about 200 rupees if it doesn't full capacity. So this is a very good method for screening a very large number when you want a very short time, like a whole army unit and uh, or, uh, or industry uh, or academic institutional uh, premises. We also did lots of uh, repurposing testing of the various drugs and large number of companies were listed there, whether they're uh, service mode or it was a a collaboration mode with different organizations. So far, we have tested almost 60 drugs in service mode, 93 in the collaboration institutions and uh, 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 drugs in collaboration and 10 drugs in collaboration with companies, and they are listed there. They are at many different, there are different levels of uh, commercialization. I just give one example. This was the first antiviral anti COVID that we tested with DRDO, and uh, uh, which was uh, even released for use. Uh, by the health and defense minister because science, technology and defense labs were involved. One thing which I'm very uh, much excited uh, that it will be a major uh, uh, contribution is the antibody therapy that we are working with a company called uh, Vince Bioproducts of Hyderabad company. So there we have produced the virus, given the inactivated virus to company to inject in the horses, and then we brought back the FAB2 fragment for testing antiviral activities and showed the results. So uh, it has now passed the phase one trial, has been completed. Phase two trial is going on, uh, and uh, hopefully it will be completed soon, and then it should get a emergency approval. So we are really going to be much better positioned for handling when people need hospitalization. Genome surveillance was uh, the activity which we were doing from the beginning. Uh, CCMV is known for its uh, genomics uh, infrastructure. 
and we have developed even tools which work like a, a, a give a real time reflection of sequences deposited from india on other places so this is now a couple of weeks back 75000 sequences deposited these many mutations documented and which variant is going and so on and you can go and play with this site and you can see which variant is increasing which variant is decreasing and how this is the delta situation we are seeing so this uh, uh, about a month old graph where you can take a new one and have a real look uh, at this so these are the things which give us uh, we innovate existing technologies optimize for the our conditions and uh, uh, use them for uh, immediate uh, application uh, in the other than genomic surveillance we did a couple of other surveillance which was uh, one is uh, sewage surveillance which is go to the uh, sewage treatment plant collect the water from there and uh, look for the virus there so we have done this in many cities in fact hyderabad of course was our center but we have done in about 10 other uh, 10 11 other cities this gives a, and in collaboration with ICT and NIRI because they have uh, uh, expertise in sample handling and health network for the collection of uh, these samples. So uh, this gives the correct estimation of the uh, cases and now we have having the technology that we can even tell the proportion of variants in the sewage treatment plants. So uh, this was something which we had to spend some time, how to standardize sample collection and processing, how much sample is required, how much concentration is required and so on. And now we are in a position actually to fairly accurately tell what proportion of the population is infected. And we are carrying out this in a very large scale in Bangalore and, uh, and Hyderabad. Uh, these are, this is the NASI. So I just show the data from Malawa, uh, Prayagraj. So this is the uh, analysis done by surveillance. You can see the trend, uh, how it is going. And this is the analysis based on the actual number of cases reported uh, by the city. Uh, it's so pleasing to see the real exact uh, trend in the two technologies. Of course, the numbers will be different. The actual numbers are three to four times more than reported, which is expected. You cannot uh, score uh, all the infected places, but it only assures that you can get real value, uh, real numbers. So not only the STP, you can even monitor NALA because our many cities don't have uh, uh, STP. So we have done extensive analysis. All these are in the, uh, already published uh, recently. So we do hourly collection to see which is the best time to collect samples, then daily monitoring, weekly monitoring, monthly monitoring, because in the rain you don't do it and so on. So uh, it is standardized for that. We even monitor the lakes of Hyderabad, where there are three lakes uh, which have a sample that comes to uh, uh, from the drainage system. And there are two lakes where there is no drainage system connected. And these two always gave negative results and other lakes showed positives uh, in the sense they were carrying the RNA traces of the virus and we could calculate what might be the uh, associated uh, population fraction having the infection and um, with the help of Andhra Pradesh government we have carried out in major Andhra cities uh, sewage surveillance and given the report and you can see the numbers are fairly good so that means Andhra was doing very good uh, testing and these numbers were matching with the uh, sewage estimate. So what we learned from this that sewage surveillance gives a qualitative as well as quantitative estimate of number of people infected uh, can be used as a reliable and unbiased surveillance measure to understand the progress of COVID-19 even when mass scale uh, uh, testing is not possible. Uh, an indispensable tool for early and easier detection of uh, future COVID-19 or uh, out other outbreaks. Uh, by the way, in the sewage you get uh, at least four or five days, six days before the signal, before actually the person uh, starts the symptom or starts to shed the virus. Uh, in fecal samples, the virus starts to come out uh, earlier. Means to ascertain the efficacy of the steps taken. If you have put the lockdown, it should go down and so on. So you know that people are following the rules. It is very, very useful, in fact. And you can, along with this, you can follow several infectious agents and biomarkers. Uh, uh, that may be there and water surveillance can be helpful in understanding the antimicrobial resistance emerging in the microorganism and 
we are uh, both in Bangalore and Hyderabad, we are uh, setting up an uh, extensive uh, system to, uh, uh, to measure all the infectious agents, particularly uh, uh, antimicrobial resistant genes that are known. So we can tell which part, which antibiotic is going to be less effective and so on. So this has been a major and I hope that uh, this will be implemented in most cities and we will have a much better understanding of infectious diseases uh, without spending much money, much uh, efforts, because it's quite a cheap way of, uh, uh, of doing this. The other activity we did was uh, uh, air surveillance, because there was a lot of uh, uh, discussion whether it's airborne or not and, and so on. So we uh, uh, designed some methods, used existing tools available. Now CSR has made a, a much uh, a cheaper tool to collect uh, for air sampling. And it, we did sampling. This was done in coordination with the Imtech Chandigarh. So they did in Chandigarh and uh, CCMB did in Hyderabad. And we then combined the data to understand what was happening. And the sampling was done in COVID wards, uh, ICUs, uh, nurse stations, uh, apartments and homes of volunteers who ac accepted. And then we even created a situation where we had room in which uh, people infected were uh, asked to sit at certain distance for a certain time and so on. And then we measured the infection rate. So I will not go in the boring table and graphs, but the uh, what uh, we learned from this is that SARS-CoV-2 is detectable in air in certain conditions and masks works really well. Uh, uh, there are many, many stories that we can tell. Uh, the chance of picking SARS-CoV-2 in air depends on the number of COVID positive cases in the room, their symptomatic status and the duration of the exposure. The strategy of segregating hospital area into COVID care and non-COVID care is a very good idea because it can con help in controlling the spread in the hospitals. Analysis of air sample collected from house of uh, COVID-19 individuals suggests that if the patient is immediately isolated, uh, uh, then uh, you can save the others from being infected. We have seen in the same house, if the person is quarantining in one room, rest of the people living rest of the house were not uh, uh, infected. And in fact, the virus is not seen outside. It's seen only in the room where the person is living. In closed, less ventilated rooms, virus can stay longer in the air. And this is maybe useful for many of us that virus can stay in air in places like toilets for more than two hours, which is very uh, uh, important to know because uh, when you go to toilet, uh, uh, public toilet, especially when there is no one, you may remove your mask. But if somebody infect, is infected had gone there and removed the mask and uh, stayed there for some time, for two hours uh, or more, it will carry the virus. So in the toilet, never remove a mask. So those were the few things we had to issued advisory and shared with the government and many other organizations. And yeah, I think this kind of innovations are very useful. And this can even, one can think of setting this thing up in malls, cinema halls and other places and measure the level of uh, infection and take decision based on that, how many people can be allowed and so on. Uh, now I'll... Uh, 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 go to another aspect which is very well discussed about this virus. In fact, most of the pandemics and infections are zoonotic in origin, as uh, Professor Balram also mentioned uh, uh, in the, uh, during his talk. So, uh, and current pandemic uh, uh, is thought to have come from a wildlife food market uh, in, in, in China, and the origin is supposed to be bat-borne virus. So the pathogens that cause outbreaks in humans evolve in reservoir hosts like rodents, bats, small mammals. And the transmission of SARS from human to Minsk uh, has raised a concern uh, that uh, one can create many such reservoirs. In fact, uh, the current uh, variant Omicron is so different from uh, Delta, which has been, uh, or even Alpha, which was uh, to be related, it appears uh, this two lineages have separated one year ago. And one of the theories is that, uh, of course, one is that it was growing in a even compromised person for many months. And the other one is that maybe it went to a reservoir uh, and then came back to humans. One doesn't know. But it's just to bring that, uh, uh, that 
uh, zoonotic uh, surveillance is very, very important. So with the increasing uh, danger of zoonotic transmission as a human come in greater contact uh, or greater conflict with the environment. Uh, we have been uh, 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 preparing protocols, SOPs for zoo, so uh, for the animals which showed the symptoms and uh, uh, that is activity still going on and we have been interacting with the, our zoo and many other uh, zoos in the country with central zoo authorities help uh, in testing these animals uh, and I will not go into details uh, what I'll, uh, we have seen there. But a lot of mammals that are examined, uh, many of them are shown to be shown to be susceptible, and seven of them can even transmit. So this is experimental uh, uh, work based on several model building uh, uh, genome data and uh, uh, protein structure of ACE2 and uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, now there is a general uh, consensus that. Uh, a large number of animals, in fact, have potential. So this is a plot that shows that compared to cat, how many animals are more potential to uh, transmit the uh, SARS-CoV-2. So it's quite a, 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 a complicated thing that virus can go back and forth with animal to human, uh, looking at this and come back with new avatars, which can be more uh, uh, problematic for us. So it is key that we take note of this and uh, 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 stop pandemics, this and future ones are various versions of this uh, by few measures, which is one is uh, stopping uh, wildlife animal trade, uh, eating wildlife uh, uh, animals are, are bringing them into close contact and of course, if you destroy their habitat, they will come near you. So these are things which are extremely important. It may sound uh, uh, something uh, different, uh, but human race has to accept that this planet belongs to all creatures. We cannot, uh, Professor Balram even mentioned in the last three slides, uh, some aspect of this, but we have to come to terms that uh, there is a limit to which we can have our greed and there is a point where we are going to uh, kill ourselves if we go beyond that. Maybe we have already started crossing that line. Uh, in this context, uh, I will just give one example of uh, uh, self-sufficiency, which we did very, very actively with very professional way, actually, with the help of uh, Atelier Incubation Center at CCMB and uh, 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 funding from Find and uh, some other sources. But before that, see, indigenization and self-sufficiency is very relevant for supplies, kits for diagnostics, because we, we have suffered during the first wave, uh, we had to wait for weeks uh, sometimes to get a kit or some uh, get a reagent medical devices new generation of drugs and vaccines we are not only at the mercy of uh, suppliers from elsewhere but also pay multifold more uh, price for those things and now there are new generation of drugs and vaccines like antibody therapeutics biotherapeutics rna therapeutics mrna vaccine the indigenization here is extremely important otherwise these things will be unaffordable uh, uh, that Kiran Majumdar Shah mentioned about rare genetic diseases, they are unaffordable, their treatments. They cost uh, several crores uh, uh, for treatment. So, and that is because uh, that everything has to be done uh, by external means. So, the, we need uh, uh, indigenization and self sufficiency in that. Particularly when it comes to precision and personalized medicine, there is no other way we have to do because it has to be personalized to our people and genomics, genome editing, disease, food, environment, all these we require 100% uh, 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 self-sufficiency. I will give the example of, again, the COVID-19, and this is the uh, uh, last story I'm going to tell in, in three, four minutes. So COVID-19 test actually is a quite a complicated test. It's a very sophisticated test. It requires enzymes, it requires the primers, it requires probes and DNTPs and the sophisticated handling equipments and so on. So we initiated this project with our Atal Incubation Center to indigenize this completely. 
so objective was to sourcing the suppliers and components quality assurance sub components develop the sops for testing and component indiv uh, individually and in combination capacity assessment uh, deliver the validation kit uh, and uh, uh, validated kit and uh, readiness and aim was uh, half a million test per month and identify the partners for manufacturing and marketing so it was really very well designed uh, plan and uh, so we identified the partners for benchmark reagents and chemicals and these are the indigenous uh, uh, makers of so all the components many things we discovered that we are making amidites that can be used to make uh, oligonucleotides which we were been importing so, uh, so many things were actually such a pleasant surprise for me so that was the plan that you establishment the testing of the format uh, standardization identifying the partners validating its building packaging and so on and there was timeline set for six months of this um, we carried out and i'm so happy to to share this with you some of you may have seen in different platforms that you can do today a fully indigenized kit per test 68 rupees uh, of course this is excluding the, uh, the human resource and margin uh, profit margin that may be required but this is the cost that is and many of you will remember that we have paid 4000 per test at in the beginning so remember how much we have been exploited and uh, suffered for lack of availability even so the identified company uh, we, we have identified a company uh, with gmp facility for packaging of the kits identified two companies interested in marketing the kits of course that depends on the uh, supply and demand uh, equation at the moment 0.5 million reaction per month production is uh, uh, is uh, established and the capacity can be ramped up to 3 million with organized sourcing so uh, this really shows that it can be done and it can be done uh, quickly when there is a determination and when uh, so we have we don't like technology or science part of this so this is my last slide in which uh, i just want to say that self sufficiency in manufacturing and supply of research material is of course it is absolutely uh, required for any pandemic like situations uh, uh, in future but it's a really important for the research and innovation in general it will be a great catalyst i mean all of us uh, as the professional scientists know uh, that we spend uh, a significant proportion of our time in raising funds and we spend really uh, uh, significant time in spending that fund because we have to import most of the chemicals and uh, depending upon which organization you are you may spend your 15 20 percent or even more time in uh, in, uh, in running with the files to import those things all those will go away it will be all become local and we have all the ingredients as you have seen uh, as one example things to do is to build capacity uh, have proper quality measures and then acceptability if top institutions ensure the quality work with SMEs and accept those reagents I think uh, we can make a difference uh, and in a big big way then even smaller institutions universities can do research in much more effective and fast manner uh, with that uh, I'll uh, I'd like to finish I've saved four minutes uh, of the time but if there's a question uh, I'd be very happy to uh, happy to answer just to say that uh, the funding of most of the thing that I uh, talked about was by CSIR and thank you all for listening and as I said the mask is the biggest uh, uh, factor today to control this pandemic uh, peaks so thank you very much and uh, happy to answer any question if there is if, if the format allows Otherwise, yeah. thank you very much uh, Professor Mishra for excellent talk and uh, sir. Uh, uh, if any question then you can take the question uh, if time is permitted. No, we don't have time. Okay, okay. Thank you very much, ma'am. So, can I introduce the next speaker? So, it is my pleasure to introduce Professor R.K. Dhiman. He is an excellent clinician and researcher 
of the country and uh, he's a director of a reputed institute of country sgpj lucknow uh, i would like to invite professor arkit himan and his topic of talk today remote patient monitoring and telemonitoring using telehealth technology in improving patient outcomes so professor arkit himan please thank you dr sanjeev for your uh, nice introduction i am also thankful to uh, professor manju sharma for the invitation to this understanding conference and in fact i really enjoyed the pre previous uh, three talks and uh, as you have rightly said that i am a clinician and uh, but my experience have been with the telehealth tele mentoring as well as the biotechnology that we have used in treating the hepatitis c patients we have an experience with the covid but for the today i'll be talking about the management of the chronic hepatitis c uh, at the pub, as a public health problem <clears throat> so the framework of my talk would be the applications of the medical biotechnology in the health remote patient monitoring and the example is the hepatitis c virus infection capacity building that is the punjab model and the use of the biotechnology in the remote patient monitoring lessons learned challenges and the national viral hepatitis control program so applications of the medical पहले वाले उसमें लाता ना मोड में दैट्स ओके सो एप्लीकेशन ऑफ द मेडिकल बायोटेक्नोलॉजी इन द हेल्थ द डिस्कवरीज इन द मॉलिकुलर बायोलॉजी जीनोमिक्स सेलुलर एंड द टिश्यू इंजीनियरिंग न्यू ड्रग डिस्कवरी एंड द डिलीवरी टेक्निक्स एंड द बायोमेजिंग होप द प्रॉमिस ऑफ इंप्रूविंग हेल्थ केयर बाय एनहांसिंग diagnostic capabilities and by expanding the therapeutic options the onset of the covid-19 pandemic has brought convergence of all fields of the science and the technology in particular the biological medical and the physical sciences and the significant contribution of the biotechnology in recent times include digital medicine digital health cyber medicine which has converged physical sciences such as the information technology telecommunication biosensor virtual augmented and the mixed reality with health science has shown the impact in the remote patient care capacity development when the whole world was shut down and has no physical access to the service that is something we have experienced and we have done a lot in this direction as far as the covid-19 pandemic is concern so the information in the science technology there are many example emr big data analysis machine learning augmented and the artificial intelligence and the communication technology you all know could be the wired wireless and setcom and others like medical biosensors and the internet of the things and the medical internet dealing especially the health portal of for the citizen health data storage access to the information interaction with care providers and the seekers and the telehealth technology that is something i am going to discuss today applications for care delivery remote patient monitoring that is involving the tele icu chronic disease management emergency medicine health professional system capacity development through telemonitoring etc that is something we have done particularly in the covid-19 pandemic in our hospital but today i am going to talk about our experience with management of the hepatitis c in punjab you just want to tell you that before coming to become the director of this great institute i was department head at the pgi chandigarh of the hepatology department so here we come to 
the clinical issue that is the hepatitis C virus prevalence estimates. You can see it's the whole world and the maximum that you can see in the Russia and other countries, Mongolia like and the Pakistan. But in India, the prevalence is the lowest that is between the zero and 0.6 percent or the other way you can say that is less than one percent. Here you can see in India uh, because of the population of this country that is uh, 1.3 billion here we can say the more than 6 million people they are suffering from the chronic hepatitis C and this is the third country uh, in hierarchy I would say after the China and the Pakistan so lots of the things has to be done for the treatment of all these over 6 million people in the India. So we started from the Punjab when I was uh, in the department of the hepatology and the then chief minister approached us how to deal with this problem because with a uh, percentage of, of the prevalence which is exceeding 3.6 percent and the, there are only two states they are Manipur and Mizoram where the prevalence is more than 1%. And if you want to translate to the whole population, which is 28 million, so, and the prevalence of 3.6, there are more than 10 lakh people who are antibody positive. And if you do the SCV RNA in these patients, then you will find that there are 8 lakh, that because the prevalence, because the viremic population is 80% of the antibody positive population. And if you come to the demography of the Punjab, there are 22 districts and there are 20 district hospitals and subdivisional hospital 41 and chronic hepatitis, CS, sorry, CSC community health centers, there are 150 and three medical colleges. Now, why do we want to treat the hepatitis C patient or the patient who are having the chronic hep C infection? Here you can see the natural history. Once there is a hepatitis C infection, about 20 to 30 percent they develop, 70 percent they develop the chronic hepatitis C. And over the 20 25 years, 30 percent of them they develop the cirrhosis. And uh, thereafter, they develop the complication in the form of the ascites, gastrointestinal bleed and the altered sensorium, what we call the hepatic encephalopathy. These are the very serious complication and ultimately the patient goes into the end stage liver disease and some of them they develop the hepatocellular carcinoma and invariably all these patients die. So what we have to do, if we treat at this stage when there is no chronic hepatitis or there is a hepatitis, chronic hepatitis, then the further complications can be prevented. So that was the theme uh, that uh, we have to treat all patients. I would say 8 lakhs of the patient who are the virus positive in uh, Punjab. So we made this uh, uh, SOPs and so far we have 3 SOPs for the treatment and the goal was that the goal of the Punjab model was hepatitis C elimination by 2030 uh, involving the primary care providers and the remote treatment monitoring. That was the goal. And reduction of all cause mortality that including the death and liver related deaths and the risk of developing the SCC and the risk of developing the end stage liver disease and the need for the transplantation that I have just told you in the previous slide and thus eliminating the hepatitis C Punjab would help save thousands of the lives. So the ultimate goal was preventing uh, the death or saving the lives of the thousands of the lakhs of the patient who are suffering from the hepatitis C. So what we have done basically here that uh, uh, it was the capacity building exercise First of all, we have done, taken the, all the hepatitis, uh, uh, sorry, uh, all the hepatitis C workshop with a predefined course and it lasted for the four hours. 
and we discuss every aspect of the hepatitis C, starting from the molecular to ultimately the treatment complications and everything. And for the thereafter, once we have this four hours predefined course of approximately 120 uh, primary care physician, here I've written 90, but ultimately it was 120. And thereafter, then we have the echo program that we were having the tele uh, medicine that we were connected to all these uh, through the echo program that uh, that is basically the uh, community health outcomes that we were measuring. And uh, hub was the PGI Chandigarh and the spokes were the 25 medical centers, including the district hospital and three medical colleges and the case syllabus was that we used to discuss all these cases which were the difficult one both in the form of the spokes and the hub. Initially we used to present the case and we discuss and later on all these primary care physicians they bring the cases and the discuss. At the end we used to have one didactic lecture and these echo program that we used to do every one week. And between there is a problem that we used to solve with the WhatsApp uh, group. So that is something the telehealth we have been using with this training of these telemedicine we are using with these primary care physician. In the same way, we trained our district epidemiologist, pharmacists, and the data entry operators for the management of the data, as well as the monitoring and the evaluation all these they were trained and here you can see one of the session of the Punjab model that is the hub and smoke model here are we that is the hub and here you can see all the spokes in the minimum of the 40 to 50 people uh, doctors that we were discussing the cases uh, with them and train, training them. Initially we started with the 25 in 2016 June but ultimately in 2019, this uh, number has uh, grown but to 34, 2019 and 20, it is 60 and present year, it is 67. We have included the central prisons where the high incidence of the SCV is there. We have included subdivisional hospitals, ART center, OST center. So providing uh, uh, the facilities to all these uh, uh, places just for to do the micro elimination. For example, drug addicts we have to treat in the ART centers as likewise. So the laboratory testing of the hepatitis C, that was a challenge. For example, if we were doing the hepatitis C virus antibody testing, and then those who are positive, then we will be doing the hepatitis C virus RNA testing also. And the in few patients who are cirrhosis or having the advanced disease, we need to do the genotyping, hepatitis C virus genotyping for tailoring the therapy to these patients. Otherwise, the SCV genotype was the uh, uh, optional. And the determination of the hepatitis C response, we used to give this therapy for either for the three months or for the six months. And at the end of the therapy, then we have to do the SCV RNA. If it is negative, then we use say that it is the end of the treatment response is, was positive. Or SVR, SVR is a sustained viral response we used to do 12 weeks after the completion of the treatment. If it is positive, that means it is very unlikely in future there would be a relapse. So that's why it is called as the sustained viral response. The most important thing that I would say that the molecular biology that is taking to the periphery, uh, every periphery of the uh, Punjab, particularly to the district hospital. Paradigm of the treatment is that the first that I have told you that the antibody test, if it is positive, reactive, then we have to do the RNA testing. If it is not detected, that means there is no current or active SCV infection. If it is positive, then we have to do the genotyping, particularly 
those who have the advanced liver disease. And these are the two challenges that we have to the RNA. You all know RNA is a very uh, unstable RNA. I would say if the, we are not maintaining the cold chain or, or if it is not done within a specific time, so it is the uh, RNA is degraded. Therefore, these were the challenges that we have uh, done the special measures to do both the testings. And this is our was our algorithm. Once antibody was positive, then we did the RNA. If it is uh, cirrhosis, if it is absent, then we don't do usually the genotype and we give this drug for the 12 weeks, Sofosfavit and Declatasvit. And then we have done the ETR and of the treatment response and the SVR, sustained viral response. This was the mandatory. If the SV, if somebody is, uh, uh, if the cirrhosis was present approximately in 15% of the patient, then genotyping was important because the treatment was according to the presence of the type of the, uh, the genotype. For genotype 1, 4, we have this uh, different regimen and for 3, we have the different regimen, but the treatment uh, duration increases to the 6 months. And uh, that's what I'm saying that uh, we did uh, this uh, SCV RNA once the patient comes to the hospital the blood was taken immediately and stored in a very the minus 80 and these testings were done then we have to do the special algorithm like apri and the fib4 and the fibro scan for diagnosing the cirrhosis because the cirrhosis patient they have the different treatment here i would like to tell you the cascade report that is the May 2021, approximately 2 lakhs patients were screened. 1 lakh 27,000 approximately, they were found to be antibody positive. And then RNA was done with or without genotype, depending upon whether the cirrhosis was present or not. And the treatment was initiated ultimately, and we found the 93% they cleared the virus and achieved the sustained viral response. So that was the achievement. So lesson learned basically that they, uh, we have this capacity building into 25 and now the 67 centers. This was the very important that all the physicians, those who were not aware about the hepatitis C or chronic hepatitis C, they were trained about it and it included primary care physician, pharmacist, data entry operators. And there was, it was also felt that there is need of the repeated capacity building of the medical and the paramedical staff also. And this was a decentralized care. What I'm trying to say that the hub was at the PGI and the spokes were at different centers, now 67 centers. When this program was not launched, the PGI was the only center where the treatment of such patient was being done. And we used to treat between 1,000 to 1,500 patients in a year. And after the starting of the program, I would tell you that each center between four to 5,000 patients were treated. At the end of the one year, I will tell you that the 44,000 patients were treated much higher than we used to treat. So that was the beauty of this program. And uh, that not only involving the telementoring or the telehealth or telemedicine, but also a part of the biotechnology that we were doing the molecular uh, testing also in these patients to achieve or to treat these patients. So primary care physician, data entry operator, and pharmacists are the front runners with hepatologists, gastroenterologists dealing with the special situations such as the patient who have not responded, that is the treatment experienced patient, decompensated cirrhosis, I have told you with the complication, and the special populations like children. I will share my uh, experience with this. So these are the results. The, so I'm just telling you the one year results here, 50,000 where the response rate ultimately SVR was 91.6%. I think that is the excellent uh, uh, achievement that we have achieved, which was comparable 
to such experiences in other countries as well. So the, the micro elimination program, particularly in the children was also started. The only difference between the adult was that we have categorized children, those who were having the weight less than 35 or more than 35. The only implication was if it is less than 35, half the dose was used. If it is more than 35 uh, kg, then we have used the full dose. And here are the application, uh, the results. So you can see over 97% the sustained viral response. Then we went further also to including in those patients who are uh, uses the uh, or who uh, inject the drugs. So IV drug users basically. And we have treated, uh, you will see approximately 3,500 patients. And although drop rate uh, out rate was uh, higher in comparison to the general population, but the response rate was equally good. So now, as of now, we have almost treated 2 lakhs of the desired 8 lakhs patient. That means 25% since 2016. So what are the challenges actually? The main challenges that we face is basically the molecular testing, RNA and the genotyping. Uh, and that is, uh, so it is not high ideal. This kind of the approach is not ideal as where we have the higher numbers of the persons for the screening purpose is required. So, and basically they lead to the drop-offs and the particular in the cascade of the care. So now uh, there are different uh, tests they are evolving. One is the point of the care testing as well as the rapid diagnostic testing. Rapid diagnostic testing basically requires special equipment as well as the trained personnel. On the other hand, rapid or no special equipment or the electricity required for the point of the care testing. I think new tests as far as the SCV RNA is coming uh, is uh, on the way and once it is there that would help us basically the immediate linkage to the care on the same day we will be doing the antibody testing and the, we can be doing the RNA on the same day once it is available then we can start the treatment on the same day that would enhance I would say the compliance of the patient for the treatment also. And in the same way, I would like to say that uh, uh, challenges ahead basically that we see the treatment of the experienced patient, those who have failed, because it has been demonstrated one of the drug that is the NS5A inhibitor, Daclatasvir or Velpatasvir. These are the drugs, they are associated with uh, uh, substitutions uh, in the RNA uh, virus. So we are starting the, this facilities also for the, looking for the presence of the resistance association to substitutions. And we have a project which is sanctioned by and the running also with the help of the ICMR. And the another challenge is, is that the newer doctors or the uh, Peripheral, uh, all these doctors uh, at the centers, uh, peripheral centers, they are coming, primary physician. So they require the repeated capacity building. So, but that is not an issue we, we can do at a regular interval also. Another issue, the loss to follow up. So I would say the telemedicine in that situation is very helpful. We could be able to generate the uh, alerts before they come for the medicines or though don't come we can uh, generate another alert so so increasing the compliance or enhancing the compliance with the patients also so the Punjab model was so successful I would like to say uh, that uh, the same model was uh, basically was taken up by the central government and they started the national viral hepatitis control program Basically, I am also the chairperson of the tag group of this program also, and we have published uh, at least uh, three SOPs, diagnosis and management of the viral hepatitis at the national level. So it includes all viral hepatitis from A 
B, C, and E, and National Viral Hepatitis Control Operation Guidelines and the testing guidelines also. So these are the three one. Now the program has evolved at the national level also, just to combat the viral hepatitis at the national level. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to conclude. SCV infection is a real public health problem in different parts of India. If left untreated, you all know, then SCV infection causes substantial morbidity, means the, that the end stage liver disease, and the complication and the mortality that is the death. Thus, large number of the SCV patient needs to be treated at the public health level, involving all kind of a thing. What I have told you, telementoring, telehealth, or even the biotechnology use, for example, the point of the care test uh, uh, development also. So they are the very important aspects of this program. And the goal of the Punjab model was SCV elimination by 2030. So far, we have been successful in eradicating 25% of our uh, the target using primary care providers and the remote treatment mon monitoring. The model utilizes unique combination of the remote patient monitoring, telemetering using the telehealth technology and the biotechnology in improving the patient outcomes. And uh, at last, I would like to say that this kind of the decentralized care of the patient with the hepatitis C virus infection using generic all oral DAs. Uh, now we have the oral treatment for the hepatitis C regimen is safe and effective regardless of the genotype and the presence of the cirrhosis. Uh, so. Basically, we are they are the acknowledgments, particularly to the government of India, and uh, Gagan, uh, Deep Singh Grover, who is the state program officer, and uh, my younger colleague Madhumita Prem Kumar, and all financial helps from the government of Punjab as well as from the India. Thank you so much for giving your time listening to this talk. Thank you so much. Manaban, would you like to say something in the concluding remarks or should we go, go on to the next session? Dr. Sanjeev Sinha, you are unmute, please. Unmuted. I would like to thank Professor Dhiman for excellent talk. And uh, uh, just uh, with the permission of Professor Sama, I would like to conclude this uh, session. I would like to thank Professor Padmanabhan, and all the speakers, including uh, Professor Balram, Professor Mishra, Professor Jagannathan, and Professor Dhiman for excellent talk. I would like to thank Professor Sama for inviting. Thank you very much. So, is Renu there? Okay, good. So, Renu, can we start okay. next session? Okay. Um, you have three speakers, and Dr. Kamboj is there. Your yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, I can see Dr. Kamboj. And yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so have, it's in have, your right. have all the three speakers uh, joined in? I that I don't know. Ma'am, Dr. Modi is not yeah, there. Dr. Dr. Sorba here. Dr. Modi is not there. I can see Dr. I can uh, Dr. Satish Reddy is there, and I think Ritu is also there. So we have the two speakers. Yeah. So um, can we start, Archana? Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Sure. Right. Uh, time restriction, Renu, around yeah. 25 minutes. Huh? Uh, for the full session? The, about 25 minutes, because we have one last lecture, Foundation Day lecture also. Fine. So, Dr. Reddy and Ritu will try and reduce their talks to, to about 10, 10 minutes each, if that is okay with them. So, very good evening to all of you, and uh, thank you, Madam Sharma for and uh, Dr. Ghatak for organizing such a wonderful uh, symposium seminar on the foundation day and congratulations to everybody on the foundation day of nasi and i think the topic of this whole conference that is uh, the interface between biology and physical sciences for an atmanirbhar bharat uh, is itself so interesting and the way the sessions have been curated to bring out each aspect of it from the morning going from the agriculture to the medical and i think we've come very appropriately to a session on entrepreneurship. We cannot have Atmanirbhar Bharat without entrepreneurship. 
Considering that we have a paucity of time, we're not going to get into too many details because all that has been discussed this morning. But I would just like to say that uh, if we talk about an Atmanirbhar Bharat, the call that was given to us during the COVID times, we have really seen how the entrepreneurs have worked so closely with the academia and also how we have seen high tech science, disruptive technologies being taken up by these entrepreneurs to be able to take on the tools for bringing in not only a self-reliant India for the country, but also globally. And our speakers for today will highlight that. I know Dr. Satish Reddy, who has worked so closely with the industry to not uh, with the academia, not just within the country, but the Russia partnership for the Sputnik, how his team has worked so effectively to be able to produce vaccines, not just for India, but for the globe. And I think that really is what entrepreneurship is. That's what the whole area of Atmanirbhar Bharat is. It's also important that we have Ritu here, who comes in from the Academy Institute, a good combination of industry and academia to be able to tell us uh, what really the academic institutes are doing and how we are looking at the natural products, because that is India's strength. These are areas where India can actually make a difference to be able to be globally recognized in terms of how we can look at science and technology moving out from the laboratory to the startup ecosystem, to the industry, and then looking at product development. COVID being where COVID is has given us the understanding of this robust ecosystem that we've been able to develop and to be able to connect the academy industry so well. I will stop here. I will request Professor Kamboj, who himself is one not just a person who has driven translational sciences, but who has the complete background about how entrepreneurship works, how academia and industry move ahead. So over to you, sir, to take on your initial remarks and also to introduce formally. And maybe for paucity of time, we could you know, have a formal introduction of both the speakers and then move on to requesting them to take on their talk. So with this, I will move it over to Professor Kamboj for his initial uh, remarks and introduction of the speaker so that we can have Dr. Reddy. So over to you, sir. Thank you, Renuji. I too will express my sincere gratitude to Dr. Manju Sharma for inviting me to co-chair this session with Dr. Renu Saroop, Secretary Department of Biotechnology. See, Renuji has already introduced that the entrepreneurs of our country have lived up to the expectations of the country in developing products. I will only add that India is third largest as far as the entrepreneurship, new entrepreneurship ecosystem is concerned. But unfortunately, it is ranked 20, 20th, 23rd now as the business of doing ecosystem, business of doing in this area is concerned. The limitations are the internet speed. I never thought of that the internet speed would be a limitation. And the other limit, limitation is the, that is known to everybody is the power availability. Power availability, India is now hijacking the power availability, but the internet speed, we should soon move to 5G and maybe 6G to cater to the demands of the industry. With these few words only, I will uh, introduce the first speaker, Dr. K. Stish Reddy. He is the chairman of the Dr. Reddy's Laboratories Limited Hyderabad. And Dr. Renuji has already mentioned that what critical role he has played in developing the Sputnik vaccine in our country. And Reddy's is a well-known uh, place. I have never met Dr. Stish Reddy, although I knew Dr. N.G. Reddy very well. I had met him a number of times. I will invite Dr. N.G. Reddy kindly to speak. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kamboja, for that uh, uh, nice introduction. Uh, very good uh, Good evening to uh, Dr. Renu Swaru, uh, Professor Manju Sharma, and uh, distinguished members of uh, uh, NASI and ladies and gentlemen. I first uh, wanted to thank Dr. Ashok uh, Mr. Mishra, uh, Professor Ashok Mishra, for uh, inviting me to this uh, prestigious uh, event. So I just try to make it brief in the interest of time, uh, mainly to you know talk about the Indian uh, pharmaceutical industry in terms of its journey towards uh, you know self-reliance. Um, 
if you see the you know the the defining moment if i may call it that uh, for the indian pharmaceutical industry it was really the patents act the indian patents act of 1970 uh, because that's what kicked off what we call the active pharmaceutical ingredients industry popularly known as the bulk drugs industry because uh, prior to that most of the products at that time uh, you know especially active ingredients used to be imported uh, you know and then uh, if you see the finished dosage formulations they used to be highly priced because of the lack of uh, you know availability of raw material which is active ingredients and uh, in fact the little that was produced here maybe uh, you know for example if you take antibiotics uh, it it was done in partnership and uh, the example would be idpl uh, you know where my father worked dr anjali worked uh, you know as a scientist and uh, for example uh, idpl had technology provided by soviet union for penicillin antibiotics so that was a situation way back in 1967 what happened in 1971 once that act was passed which basically said that india won't recognize process patents uh, sorry won't recognize product patents but will recognize process patents it spawned entrepreneurship and i think that's the key we a moment that's why i was explaining this uh, entrepreneurs like dr reddy himself who was working in idpl to start off on his own and that's when he started his first venture in uh, you know we back in 1976 but then you know dr reddy sir uh, he started completely on his own because earlier he was working with partners but he he, he started on his own in 1984 and uh, the journey from that point onwards uh you know they almost trace the evolution of the api industry in india because what happened was uh here we since we, we did not recognize product patents you basically were allowed to uh, you know develop new processes for existing products and then since you were so good at it because chemistry skill was uh, you know pretty high in india at that point of time so basically we were able to uh, you know produce uh, products uh, you know that of very high quality which is very important but continuously keep on innovating on it to uh, come with cost efficient processes so product after product if i trace the history of dr reddy's journey itself you know there were off patent products like ibuprofen where it was made so cost efficient that we we in fact displaced uh, you know leading manufacturers from japan from italy to become the third largest manufacturer in the world you know i'm talking about we back in the 90s early 90s so that's that's one example if you take uh, india itself when you talk about the path of self reliance products like quinolones you know which used to cost so high you know there was a time when a ciprofloxacin used to cost 20 rupees per tablet you know it, it's now available at you know almost something like a 2 rupee 50 paisa that was because quinolones uh, dr reddy's had worked on it uh, you know made it self sufficient and then it was also exporting so these just these are just to give an examples of you know where it all started in terms of being completely reliant uh you know on uh, technology by on cost efficient technology and then india became self reliant it was a leader in apis but then if you trace the history of uh, you know what happened after that we lost space to china and again i won't go into reasons for the paucity of time but then again there's a there an attempt to revive all this the new pli scheme which are encouraging uh, indian industry all towards atmanirbhar uh, bharat to also bring back uh, indigenous production uh, especially by the establishment of software parks all these are steps in the right direction but i think it will take time but it, it is bound to at least bring back the lost glory that we lost in apis the second part is the if i call it the second phase because all this i'm talking about was in the early 90s or so uh, at the point of time or or up, up to the year 2000 but then if you see from 2000 onwards the story was completely about generics generic products again here again uh, india come became out uh, very strong in terms of entrepreneurship uh, because again the, the, the if you see you know in terms of policy there is something in the us especially the us market being the largest market uh, which promoted generics there was something called the hatch back waxman act of 1984 uh, you know which again without getting into details of this this is something which encouraged generic companies uh, to challenge the patents owned by innovators and then if you were successful uh, to invalidate uh, uh, those patents or uh, you know develop non changing processes you had a 180 day exclusivity i right. just coming in very simply but that that was an opportunity so again companies like uh, dr reddy so we one of the earliest to uh, get off the block uh, using this act and then uh, we started uh, you know the, to sell generic medicines in the us it's a very difficult and challenging journey because just to give a snippet of that uh, we would have uh, you know built our uh, plant sometime in the year 1996 you know in anticipation of commercial sale 6 years later the first product uh, from this plant was sold about 6 years later and then again if you see the us uh, regulations especially when it comes to regulatory areas 
it, it, it is extremely stringent. So, you know, to go through US FDA approval, it's, it's a very stringent process applying uh, to a uh, CGMP situation. I mean, all this, I mean, now it sounds easy, but if you look at way back in, uh, you know, the uh, early 90s or so, it was not that easy. Right? So, that, that's something we had uh, done at that point of time. So, if you see the, the you know, the success rate after that, uh, the 180 day challenge for, you know, a product uh, which uh, everybody is familiar with, Prozac, 40MG, for example, that was the first 180 degrees challenge, 180 days uh, exclusivity that we obtained uh, from for an Indian company at that point of time. And then that started the journey of generics, right? So that, that was Dr. Reddy's story. But then a whole host of Indian companies have gotten into this game. And uh, today, if you see, if you fast forward uh, 20 years later, uh, India is a globally competitive uh, generics player. Uh, one in three medicines, generic medicines in the US are from India. One in four medicines in the UK are from India. And uh, all this talks about when I say globally competitive, it is not just about price. It is also about the quality. Right. So that's that's something we've been able to build. And again, if you trace the success in APIs as well as in uh, generics, what it clearly shows is the talent, you know, the scientific uh, talent, entrepreneurship of uh, people like Dr. Reddy and several other entrepreneurs, uh, not just about Dr. Reddy by himself, but so many people who have, uh, uh, you know, founded companies in, in that era. Dr. Reddy lost his connection. Yeah, it looks like. Dr. Reddy, uh, can you hear us? No, we can't hear him and he can't hear us. Maybe we'll just give him a minute to join back. Neeraj, yes, sir. Neeraj, try, try to yes, ring sir. up. He cannot do anything. I, I'll call gone. him. He should just, he should he just. Does, show, Mr. I will just call him. Yeah. Okay, that's it. Maybe he should log off to... log in again. Yeah, yeah. Log off and then log in. And if he's got a low bandwidth, he should switch off his video. Then we yeah. may be able to... I'll tell him. I'll tell him. Hi, uh, Sadiq, we lost you. So you may have to log in again. Sorry, can you... Can you hear me from this? I've just yes, Yeah, I Satish. can hear you now. We can hear you now. Satish, sure, sure. I can hear you. And you may want to keep your video off, Satish, if uh, uh, so that we can hear you better. Is this better now? I just uh, switched off the video. I can hear you, but if you can switch your video off so that uh, if there's a bandwidth problem. I actually switched the video off. Uh, can you hear me now? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Hear. Yeah, yes. Okay. Okay. okay, I'll just quickly conclude. Uh, you know, I was just talking about the strengths that we built on... Uh, uh, you know, both the APIs as well as uh, with the generics. Uh, but then the important point, uh, just to make, conclude on this, is that, you know, it's like just having this won't be sufficient. And we just came off a global uh, uh, innovation summit that just happened. And uh, this was inaugurated by the Honorable uh, Prime Minister. Uh, this is about, you know, moving on from just being the pharmacy to the world to becoming the innovator from India. And this is where I think it's it's a tall order it's risky, but it's highly rewarding. But more than anything else, I think Indian companies have the capability. Uh, this has been, again, proven, uh, you know, in terms of the products that are there in the clinical development. I would say from Dr. Reddy's, for example, we're in the space of, uh, you know, immuno-oncology products. Uh, Zydus is uh, there in uh, Nash, uh, for example. Uh, there are a host of companies, multiple integrators from uh, Lupin, host of companies who are investing heavily into this. And uh, we are able to... Uh, Sorry, can you hear me? Again, it said something. Yes, yes, we can. Oh, sorry. So I was just, I was just concluding saying that, you know, there are a whole host of companies investing heavily into research, but it calls for a lot more. It's not just the industry. It's also the academia, which needs to uh, come on board in terms of partnership with the industry. It's also about building innovation hubs in the country. It's also about policies. I earlier heard Kiran talk about, uh, you know, funding especially, which is very important. All these steps will, I think, take India to the next level. And this is where I think all of us are looking forward because the success which India displayed in APIs, in generics, we would certainly like to see in terms of becoming innovators uh, to the world. Uh, so with this, I would like to conclude. Again, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Dr. Reddy, for sure. telling us how, how the 1970 Patent Act revolutionized Indian pharma industry as you have mentioned, this is now the dispensary of the world, not in, only in generics of the uh, 
uh, so small molecules, but also in the biologicals. And Vaccine India is the largest supplier of vaccine. So that shows the capacity of the, and we are confident as government has come in a big way to support in the area of vaccines, they will be coming in the area of small drugs also, that is the small molecules, as well as the biopharmaceuticals. So now the next speaker is Dr. Ritu Trivedi, an upcoming uh, women scientist. She's a principal scientist at the CSAR Central Drug Research Institute, Lucknow. Dr. Ritu Trivedi, please. Are you speaking, Ritu? We can't hear you. Ritu, limit yourself to 10 minutes only. You are mute. Unmute yourself. Yes. Ritu, you are losing precious time. If you are not able to yes, log, log on. Yes, madam. Yes, yes madam. Ritu is there. Ritu, you are mute. Yes, sir. Hello? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, please start. Please start. Okay. 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 Thank, you. Okay. Thank you, Nasi, yeah. for giving me this space, especially Dr. Manvi Sharma. Thank you so much. And Dr. Renu Saroop also. Both of being who I've been associated to and have been like women icons to me in some way or the other. Just when Dr. Reddy gave his uh, topic about uh, pharmaceuticals and he wanted to show as a path to self-reliance, I thought that I should show the canvas of what is the status of phytopharmaceuticals and where do they stand in terms of Atmanirbhar Bharat. So if we go back, I just run quickly through the slides and show that the history of our traditional medicine has been like 5,000 years back. And it, uh, if we take more than 10,000 medicinal plants only contributes to 5% of the total plant diversity that we have. And if we look at the 100 years of history of uh, um, uh, the medicinal plants, you'll find that we have NC, so many NCs being discovered from these medicinal plants. And over a period of years, it has led to well-established regulatory pathways, the USFDA, the BCGI. And um, most of the, uh, over 50% of the NCs approved by USFDA have origin in natural products. But it was in 2005, actually, which is which was uh, uh, which was an opener or a ground break breaking, um, uh, so as to say, an environment that led to regulatory pathway for botanical uh, drugs. And in in this area, we had like 500 INDs and three NDAs that were discovered, but they were extracts and enriched fractions, but they did not have the active principle in it. But this definitely opened a new opportunity for traditional medicine and Ayurveda. And it was China at this time that actually used it. Uh, um, and India, in spite of having this regulatory guidelines, I don't know why we just stayed back a little bit because you, you see the global trade, it was 13% of the global trade that China did at that time, whereas we stored only 2.5% of the global trade. But in 2015, again, we got a chance when the DCJ formulated the phytopharmaceutical guidelines for us for new drug development and guidance. And this actually gave us the uh, opportunity in India. But if you look at the influence that traditional medicine and Ayush have in Indian in terms of in economic context, you will see that approximately like eight, more than 8,000 plant-based remedies are available in the Ayush system. And in terms of revenue, it's if you see both all three of them, the Ayurveda, Siddha, the Yunani, they contribute annually over a half a billion of dollars. And the global market is like USD 111 billion. So, um, but the domestic market, if you compare the domestic market versus the global market, you'll see the domestic market for Ayurveda still is currently 500, 500 crores. So, um, uh, the current valuation of the Indian herbal market is like 5,000 crores, showing an annual growth rate of about 14%. And we've got recently a lot of key players into it. A lot of companies have come into, uh, um, since the phytopharmaceuticals has been introduced, and even before the Himalaya, Dabur, 
Hamdard and Patanjali all have been there in the picture. But the question still remains that the five why phytopharmaceuticals, what are the deterrents in, in these in the regulatory market? Why are we not able to make the kind of impact we should have been making? And if if you see a couple of points that I've listed that uh, approximately like more than 90% of the botanical raw material demand is actually happens from the wild collection. And that is where the quality compromises because of which we are, we don't, uh, in terms of quality, we stay back. There is lack of transparency in the chain of custody uh, of the botanical raw materials. If we consider from the collector to the cultivator to the consumer industry. And approximately 8,000 Indian ISM industries actually are very small. They lack in-house quality control and standardization facilities. So there are a lot of companies that are coming up, but they lack uh, this in-house uh, quality control and standardization uh, facilities. So, and the another point is that the lack of uh, the plants being included into the global pharmacopoeias. We don't have many of them. I mean, there have been like recently, there are 90 Indian plants that have been included and this has opened in the US pharmacopoeia and this has actually opened a new business opportunity for us. And there is a lack of aggressive policy in promoting Indian system of medicine in global markets and regulators should form laws which are helpful actually in promoting exports rather than deterrent and too many laws that inhibit um, freely uh, work in this system. So, and also lack of concerted efforts in validating the claims of traditional drugs using modern scientific tools is another one of the reasons that we lack behind and it becomes a deterrent uh, of making a, an impact. So, I mean, um, for this, I give my own example from CSIR CDRI we had a product by the name of, uh, which is a bacocyte enriched standardized extract of the copa. And um, it is a clinically researched product for dementia, particularly children suffering from ADHD, elderly persons and all. And um, it, it has undergone vigorous chemical, preclinical and clinical uh, investigations in 1980s and developed, it was kind of developed like a modern medicine and it was marketed to Lumen. Um, it, it made his, its place in South Africa and Australia. There are around 4,000 children with ADHD who regularly consume Keen Mind. It is there in the market by the name of Keen Mind. In the right are some of the uh, economic or the statistics of how Keen Mind is doing. But the only, uh, it would have made a much bigger impact um, uh, uh, but it could not get the kind of hold and place it should have got because of lack of marker and content uniformity. And this content uniformity get uh, it kept coming back and forth because of which uh, the place, the pedestrian, the place it should have been, it's not there. So learning a lesson uh, from this uh, in our own institute and with uh, 2015 guidelines, we started following these DCGI regulatory requirements, phytopharmaceuticals, which lays down what are the requirements, how do you go about before you go for an IND approval, and the medicines from the plants are um, well placed as the English medicines. These are the US FDA guidelines, regulatory um, requirements for botanicals, and in US, uh, they are known as the botanical, um, botanical drugs, and even before you file US FDA, you have to have clinical consideration uh, with respect to its effect and efficacy, safety. Uh, it has to be verified in randomized, double blind, controlled clinical trials. And so these regulatory guidelines are well in place. So, what are the possible growth drivers for phytopharmaceuticals in India, especially uh, when you see that it allows you to have products in? formulation forms. Initially, phytopharmaceutical dosage forms are processed traditionally, and but they can be uh, as well as uh, pharmaceutically. And what happens is when you have new dosage form, it actually minimizes risk of contamination and adulteration. So instead, in a, instead of crude plant-based materials, you have now standardized bioactives, which are in the form of the grass category that they come into the dosage form. The other is to convert Ayurvedic 
aqueous extract to phytopharmaceutical with the help of technology based approaches. So this is something new. This has opened up in the category of phytopharmaceuticals. Then the, uh, the emphasis that it should be evidence based. We need to know its mechanism of action or how it functions is another uh, uh, driver uh, for phytopharmaceuticals. So evidence based approach. Um, will definitely promote research and interest of innovators, national laboratories, industries, and um, uh, in the phytopharma set, uh, sector. Then again, you have this attitude difference that has actually come up after COVID-19. When you see that um, so much of emphasis on having a overall good immunity, because of which long-term usage of allopathic drugs, which only mitigates symptoms, is a little bit it doesn't heal as much as the people have trust on herbal medicines only if they are quality controlled and they're placed in the market and approximately 65 percent of the people in india use actually use traditional medicine then there has also been initiative from the government and ayush if you see that you have the csir it ran like we are running a second phase of phytopharmaceutical mission um, the first ran now we have the second then we had, uh, have another Phytopharmaceutical mission for the now northeast region is aimed at cultivating and promoting the medicinal plants in that region. So this overall in the government initiative um, has eased and uh, the rigid platforms that initially were thought of uh, so that these plant materials can be revalidated in a much uh, productive manner. So all these uh, are growth. All these growth drivers. Um, Backed with strong mechanistic research will help consumers get confidence on how products <coughs> available as phytopharmaceuticals and surely a combination of all these factors would provide lucrative opportunities for phytopharmaceutical business in India. But finally, the last word would be of the consumers and it would come uh, from various regulated markets, mar uh, markets for these products. Now, the areas of interest. Uh, that I work in is uh, postmenopausal osteoporosis, and I've expanded my work from postmenopausal osteoporosis to obesity induced bone loss to target uh, a delivery system for bone. And I also work in the reproductive uh, window, which involves lactation and weaning models. And the reason for showing you this slide is that I've been able to bring out a product for postmenopausal osteoporosis. And I quickly want to show you that how. We've contributed in a very, very small way in the Atma Nirbhar uh, Bharat, so as to say. So this is uh, from Delvergia Sisu, which is also known as Shisham in local language. And the idea for um, working for postmenopausal osteoporosis was um, it targeted a women population. We have like 50 million, 50 to 60 million women in India who suffer from bone loss or osteoporosis. And um, International Osteoporosis Foundation keeps telling us that every one in uh, five men and three women in five women are osteoporotic in need at the moment. So it is an area of unmet medical need that needs that needed need, that needs, and you have only two drugs for it. For the anabolic therapy, you have only have uh, parathyroid hormone as an anabolic therapy, and that is also the long uh, the last. Uh, kind of therapy that is given in the end because it can only be given for two years. Otherwise, you are only dependent on the bisphosphonates for postmenopausal osteoporosis. So, um, Delvajia Sisu, as I said, that it is a reunion on, from Shisham and uh, it belongs to family Fabiaceae. And we've shown the that its renewable uh, part has been documented uh, for oral human medical uh, purposes. It's also at herbs of commerce. It comes into the category of herbs of commerce. I'm not going to go into the details of the data, but I'll tell you that what we found in the preclinical city settings was that it could bring back the bone or the lost bone in uh, uh, the WHO approved models for osteoporosis. And uh, we worked out its um, mechanism of action. It works through the wind signaling pathway, um, uh, inhibiting the SMURFs. And then letting bone formation happen. This is a fracture healing model that we did a study on to show how fracture is healed and much earlier than usually the fracture is healed. Then 
we've done a comparison of reunion but with all the standard drugs that are available in the market if you see over here this is parathyroid hormone this is elendronate the bisphosphonate and if you see one milligram per kg body weight is it is equivalent to parathyroid hormone and elendronate so all the studies that we did, did were with these uh, drugs that are already there in the market these are this, these are some of the fracture healing data and we would see that as early as day 11 it could heal fracture in these animals this definitely is uh, preclinical data but it could uh, heal fractures as early as day 11 then um, we licensed this technology to farmenza which is um, a herbal company and it is being marketed by iris life sciences and it's by the name reunion in the market it's also available on the amazon but we did not stop over here we did two clinical trials one a fracture healing clinical trial that was done in 20 patients it's a small number just to see the safety of reunion this was a single arm non-randomized open label clinical trial it was done in nasik in maharashtra in maharashtra then we did a one-year clinical postmenopausal clinical trial and this was done in hyderabad and also in mumbai center and this involved like um, 80 patients that the data of 80 patients that we finally got and this we've this, it's in, the data is in the public domain and for people to see this is the paper that I came out a clinical study of a standardized extract of leaves of delvergia sisu in postmenopausal osteoporosis so actually this is an indigenous product from the concept to the marketing it's it has sustainable use and uh, it, it's since the trees are obviously banned for cutting it's a tribal population that is involved in collecting the leaves in Madhya Pradesh to whom uh, we are offering help. Uh, it, they're helping us not to cut the trees and uh, basically they are earning through this process also. It's a good product for old people, um, especially for trauma cases um, of road accidents. Um, it heals fracture 40% faster than usually what happens. Um, the usual time of fracture healing and till now approximately 70 to 75 lakh tablets have been sold uh, mainly for fracture healing because the postmenopausal or the osteoporosis data has just come and so many patients have benefit and we have till now had no reported adverse effect whatsoever and through this study we've done a lot of human resource development a lot of phds postdocs and published papers in this area what is the present status of it? We are still we are into the licensing agreement in the process with uh, Avita Biomix in USA as a pharmaceutical drug as per the US FDA guidelines. So we'll soon be pushing it into uh, US as soon as this agreement is complete. So um, and just a learning a lesson from uh, Bakopa, the slide that I showed you. We are constantly monitoring the content uniformity of the novel compound that we identified on uh, in it which is i've abbreviated as cafg present in reunion and uh, the novel this novel compound identified in it also helped us get the patent which has also been uh, accepted i mean it's it's been gone so um, what dr reddy said i mean and what uh, covid taught us that we've been listening that we are so much dependent on um, even for paracetamol or raw, raw material we're dependent on china we don't have our own antibiotics if we look into our indian system of medicine it is indeed a rich repository and from centuries and the onus is actually on us to maximally use this system and establish its scientific relevance to the art maker and this is what i wanted to say for this presentation thank you thank you, thank you very much ritu and this was a very good talk that you gave us from the research institute point we're running short of time and i know madam is looking at the watch and we have dr balram Harga who's already come here for the foundation day lecture but i'd just like to make two points here before we conclude this very important session and we got a snapshot of what entrepreneurship development is and how important it is for an atmanirbhar bharat we saw the research institute and we saw the industry. And I think what the COVID has actually taught us is how important entrepreneurship is. And we've seen it across, whether it's 
our COVID SNT solutions from diagnostics to vaccines. We've seen the role which entrepreneurs have played in this. But I think clearly the message that has come to us is how have we succeeded in this entrepreneurship? And it's all through collaboration, through convergence of ideas, and most importantly, through a commitment. So it's the three C's which have played a very, very important role. If we need to take it for an Atmanirbhar Bharat, we do need to have, again, as we call the three important P's for it, and that's you need the people. You need the people, the human resource, you need the policies yeah. that you to take it ahead. But most importantly, what Dr. Satish Reddy said, you need quality products because it's those quality products which you need to focus on. And for global, uh, Ritu showed it in her uh, talk, the reunion that she's talked about. I think it's clearly we need to have again a focus on the three eyes and that is innovate in India. You need to innovate in India, but you need to make sure that you have the right investments for it because these are these do require investments. But most importantly, our focus has to be on indigenization. If you work on indigenization, we can take it for global access. And so thank you very much to both the speakers and Dr. Kamboj, if there is any last concluding remark, but thank you very much. And this was well, a well, thank you. Thank you very much Anuji, for concluding it. Thank because you. Very loss of, uh, Manjuji is looking towards all of us. <laughs> and you can go ahead and uh, thank you because yeah. rajiv modi is an okay. to come uh, we we have finished in time so there is no problem now and uh, dr we i can see dr balram bhargo is there so <clears throat> thank you so much uh, dr reddy swarup and uh, professor kamboj for sharing this uh, लास्ट सेशन वो शुरू होने वाला है सिक्स थर्टी का अभी टाइम है जी अभी शुरू कर लेते हैं क्योंकि फिर टाइम सेव हो जाएगा बहुत लेट नहीं करेंगे सो फॉर चेयरिंग द सेशन ऑन द इंटरप्रेनरशिप डेवलपमेंट एंड एस ऑल ऑफ यू हैव सीन वी हैड द फर्स्ट सेशन एग्रीकल्चर एंड द बायोमेडिकल स well orchestrated and at the end we have seen the importance of uh, entrepreneurship development for the atmanirbhar bharat okay. whether we talk of the medical sector or we talk of the agriculture sector so uh, neeraj with your permission yes sir can we, uh, yes madam can we start the last session uh, yes madam my permission is not required uh, we may, actually we have to invite professor padmanabhan sir to yes. share I am going to do it. Don't worry. I am going to do it. Yes. And felicitation also, madam. First is the felicitation yes. of Professor Bhagat. We, we will do the, the everything. Let let me okay. invite okay. Professor. Okay. Okay. Professor Padmanabhan, yes. are you there? Yeah, I am very much there. Yeah. Uh, sir, you are chairing the session <laughs> of uh, the Foundation Day lecture. But before the lecture, uh, can we just felicitate you? Know, you some people may log in only at 6 30 so that is the only concern i have uh, okay nahi aisa kuch nahi ab koi jisko interest tha wo abhi tak ruka hota nahi but some people may log in only at 6 30 knowing that the time so we can take a 5 minute uh, break and uh, sir uh, sir uh, we can uh, start felicitation Huh. Yeah. The introduction. The lecture will start at. Uh, we will start the lecture at six thirty. Hundred percent agree. We'll be introduced in the lecture. Uh, so, uh, well, I will just give the background. Uh, we have uh, uh, been working. The NASI has been working on this whole program of COVID nineteen pandemic uh, through the Jagrupta Abhiyan. So, uh, webinars. So far, we have organized uh, more than uh, 25 webinars, and uh, many of you have been a part of that. And uh, then uh, the NASI Council also thought that it will be better if we give some awards to the younger people, to the health professionals, uh, to scientists who have really contributed in this during this period uh, for the benefit of the people. So an expert committee met and and we all discussed and uh, this morning we have presented the two awards. Professor Bhargo will know about it. Uh, one is to Dr. Neeraj Nishchal and he knows him 
also very well from all india institute and the second award has gone to dr pragya yadav of niv euro institute so these two were the younger people award in we have given then the committee also decide, decided that there are uh, some senior people who have done monumental work during this period and uh, it is with their dedication and commitment uh, it has been possible to uh, cover aspects of research uh, application of science and technology and actual prevention and control of the uh, pandemic so in this connection the first person who who whose name committee recommended was professor g padmanabhan uh, whose uh, contributions as the chairman of the uh, vaccine group in dbt but overall he has given several lectures all over the country on the importance of uh, awareness about covid 19 appropriate behavior and the use of mask but most importantly uh, why the committee felt uh, that his contributions are really outstanding is that because he talked about vaccines their research and also the vaccine hesitancy and why people are not taking and all this he spoke all through the country in those 25 webinars he has written several articles on the vaccines so uh, we felt that uh, his contribution has been really very laudable and uh, so the, we have given the nasi has given him uh, the award of uh, excellence neeraj what do you call it award of honor honor or excellence to professor padmanabhan uh same way is not connecting can you hear me now yes yes, yes madam award of honor for exceptional contribution during the covid 19 pandemic so this was given to professor padmanabhan the second person uh, professor bhavro we don't want to embarrass you but everybody recognized unanimously that your contribution during this covid 19 pandemic its prevention control monitoring management everything all aspects of covid uh, have been absolutely yes. monumental and laudable and the country has felt uh, that you have worked 24 hours uh, during these last two years and uh, from the testing facilities you created from 5 i don't know to thousands now and even today you are creating more if necessary like that for every aspect of covid 19 and the most uh, important contribution made under your leadership uh, from the icmr is the vaccine uh, covaxin and which has now benefited crores and crores of people in this country and we are all living safely only because of that so the country decided that the uh, next award after professor padmanabhan will also you will be also honored with the award of uh, his outstanding contributions during this uh, period so we recognize you today and uh, our president uh, neeraj will read the citation for you mm -hmm. and the country is very proud of both your contribution and professor padmanabhan's contribution neeraj thank you madam thank you madam yes uh, the award of honor for exceptional contributions during the covid-19 pandemic the national academy of sciences india felicitates dr balram bhargava director general icmr and secretary dhr government of india for his outstanding leadership and round the clock scientific management of the covid-19 pandemic preventive measures taken and establishing the test centers all around the country as well as enormous contribution towards the awareness campaign against the sars cov2 congratulations sir thank you very much hearty hearty congratulations we are all very very proud of both of you and dr i thank sincerely my dr manju sharma for taking the initiative and uh, there is there is no doubt that 
you know, both of you have made outstanding contributions to the society at large and to the country at this difficult time juncture. Thank you. Thank you, Rasagat. Uh, Professor Padmanavan, can I hand over to you now and uh, you will chair the lecture? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Manju Sharma. I'll just only take a couple of minutes to introduce Dr. Balram Bhargam. Yes. Uh, you know, it's very gracious of him to uh, agree to give this uh, Foundation Day lecture. And we know what kind of pressure he must be in, in this, uh, you know, trying situations. As already said by Niraj, he is the secretary to the, is the director general of ICMR, uh, secretary to the government of India health research. And, uh, you know, uh, he is an eminent cardiologist. He's a professor of cardiology at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences and well recognized all over the globe and several, you know, recognitions, including Padma Shri by the government, S.N. Bose Centenary Award of the Indian Science Congress, National Academy of Sciences Platinum Jubilee Award, Tata Innovation Fellowship, Basin Award in the field of health and medical sciences, just to name a few, actually. But, you know, as highly, as very well pointed out by Dr. Manju Sharma, the way he has run ICMR or given leadership to ICMR in this real pandemic time is something which, uh, you know, we are all very proud of, as the president said, um, you know, testing, for example, how starting from a single center to probably 1,400 something in this country. Uh, and I feel his greatest contribution, in my opinion, is to support this vaccine. That is the inactivated viral vaccine, considered to be old fashioned. But you know, he went out and it was, the culture was isolated at NIV Pune, that's fine. But to make it as a vaccine and support it, trial all over India, various centers. But for Dr. Balram Bhargava, you know, it would not have seen the light of the day, in my opinion. And despite all criticisms up and down, people who understand the field, who do not understand the field, you know, it stood by that vaccine. And today, I feel the whole globe is talking about this simple inactivated viral vaccine. And I think the credit really goes, you know, Dr. Balram Bhargava, you have exemplary leadership you have given to take this virus, you know, culture as a real vaccine. You know, there is a difference between isolating a culture and take, making it a vaccine. And all that is needed for the validation. And uh, I know I've been reading how many centers have uh, supported this thing. So it's indeed a great pleasure and privilege for us that they have agreed to give this Foundation Day lecture. And over to you, Dr. Balram Bhatt. Thank you, Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for the very, very kind words. It is absolutely humbling for me. Uh, 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 we have been just keeping calm and trying to do our work, and uh, we have been lucky with a lot of things and with the guidance of seniors like yourselves uh, and the Galaxy who are present today. We have been uh, uh, able to help uh, do something which uh, uh, our country is faring better than many countries uh, in the world. Um, it was a very tough time for uh, all of us, um, every Indian national, uh, every Indian scientist. And in the previous session, as we heard uh, uh, Dr. Renu Suroop talk about how um, it anything that has to be done, it has to be done in a collaborative manner. What were the what I learned and what we learned from this pandemic was that one scientist would normally not work with another scientist. During this pandemic, one scientist started working with another scientist. One lab started working with another lab. One institute started working with another institute. One ministry started working with another ministry. And then we have now seen that, uh, and, and, and it was a whole of government approach. And now we are seeing many countries working together to fight this pandemic. And I think uh, India will not be safe till the world is safe and therefore, uh, the, uh, the contribution by India will be very important, particularly in the light of vaccine delivery, vaccine uh, uh, maitri and vaccine uh, 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 
to export to very parts of the world. So uh, I think we are uh, at this moment we are uh, in India. We're dealing with this uh, pandemic. Still, uh, it's not over. We have got this new variant, which is a worrisome variant. We have to be alert to this variant. Uh, we do not know how it uh, how uh, 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 virulent it is. We do not know how severe the disease it causes. But we have to be careful. We have to continue with the COVID appropriate behavior, and 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 continue with uh, uh, life as 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 it goes on. But uh, mass gatherings and and that should not be encouraged in any form. So I will just uh, have a few slides. If I allow me, I will share my screen and, and talk. So are my slides visible? Yes, sir. Okay. So, uh -huh. so, so now this is the first slide which I'm talking about the today being that uh, the happy birthday of uh, Nasi or the foundation day of Nasi, uh, which was, uh, 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 we have this uh, first slide which I'm showing of Professor Meghnath Saha addressing a silver jubilee session. And Dr. Sampurnanand is the chief guest is seated in the center. So I, I was able to get this slide from Nasi and a and, uh, few other slides, which will be uh, which will be uh, quite emotional and mind, mind uh, important for the youngsters to see. So the Nasi was established as a first science academy. The idea was mo mooted by Professor Meghnath Saha in 1929, and he established the Academy of Sciences of the United Province of Agra and Awadh in 1930 at Allahabad. And it was registered on 4th of December 1930. And today is 4th of December 2021, exactly 91 years hence. The name of the academy was altered to the National Academy of Sciences India on 5th of December 1936. We have the stalwarts who were the presidents earlier. I'm just talking about the early presidents, Dr. Meghnath Saha himself, Dr. K. N. Behel, Dr. Neelratan Dhar. Dr. Veer Balsani, Dr. Suleiman, Dr. Bhattacharya, and then there is a galaxy that has, uh, we see the Foundation Day, the Golden Jubilee in 1980, and we can see that in the center of this, we have our, our, our beloved Prime Minister, ex-Prime Minister, Dr. I mean, Srimati Indira Gandhi, we have the Dr. Venkatraman, and we have uh, in this Platinum Jubilee ce celebrations, uh, uh, Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam, and, uh, and we can see some of our, uh, 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 champions of Nasi also in these pictures. Uh, many of them are looking very young. Many of them are, uh, are, uh, are, 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 are with us and some of them have left us. So pay homage to them as well. So today Nasi has got 1800 fellows. There are 1800 members. There are 100 foreign fellows, 30 honorary fellows. And there are 21 chapters of Nasi across India with 22 tribal centers. More importantly, there are 22 tribal centers. And the current president is Professor Ajay Ghatak. Immediate past president is Professor G. Padmanabhan. And the general secretary is Professor Satyadev. And, uh, and they, are, they are all present today. So thank you so much for joining. i uh, just give a few examples of some of the champions. I have not included all, but some of the champions of uh, Nasi. Uh, the present uh, Professor Kasturi Rangan, Professor Anil Kakotkar, Professor Manju Sharma, Professor M. S. Swaminathan, Professor G. Padmanabhan, who is chairing this session, and, and the past uh, uh, champions who have left us, uh, Professor Menon, Professor V. P. Sharma, Professor T. N. Khushu, Professor U. S. Shivastav, Professor A. K. Sharma, and, and, and uh, for, I have had the fortune of meeting all of them. And, and physically meeting them. So, so this is a hugely emotional moment from that, that perspective. We can see this uh, Professor M. G. K. Menon Feshtrif, which was released by the Honorable Prime Minister uh, with uh, uh, Professor Akhilesh Tyavgi and Professor Manju Sharma at the Prime Minister's uh, residence. So this uh, speaks how important this academy is for the nation, how much history and how much water has flown uh, in these 91 years of this academy 
and its contribution towards science and society in India. The mandate is basically science and society programs for science communication, entrepreneurship development, technological sensitization of women scientists, safe water and sanitation, health issues, children science meet. And in this direction, it would be strengthened many fold if the younger generation get involved with more and more of science and society programs, which has been the, the backbone of, of, of this uh, society. Now I will shift gears and talk about uh, going viral, which is the inside story of Covaxin. Uh, uh, Professor Padmanabhan talked about this uh, whole virus vaccine, which was uh, uh, an old time uh, vaccine, which uh, is the classic method of producing a vaccine. And this is the Covaxin, which is a, a story which has also been written. Uh, and it has a foreword by His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama, uh, which is uh, um, just been launched a few weeks back. Now, the Indian Council of Medical Research uh, was founded again, one of the oldest research bodies, uh, medical research bodies in the world, was founded as Indian Research Fund Association in 1911. And in 1949, it was renamed as the Indian Council of Medical Research. It conducts, coordinates, and implements medical research again for the benefit of society. And here again, I am remembered, I remember a few, three or four points which uh, Dr. Um, Metro man, Dr. Sridharan always says that if you have to be successful in life, you need four things. One is that you need to be punctual. You have to have utmost integrity. You have to have uh, professional competence and you have to have commitment towards the society. So this is the important point. Uh, this, 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 this academy, as well as the Indian Council of Medical Research, are conducting, coordinating, and medical research for the benefit of society. And if you look at the 111 years of service to the nation, in 1918, the Beri Beri inquiry was done. In 1938, the malaria survey of India. And in 1942, the Kalazar cycle was established by Lishmania Donovan. And in 1959, domiciliary treatment of tuberculosis, first oral polio vaccine trial in 1963. And the low cost cal uh, calorie supplements for protein energy malnutrition was in 1969, oral rehydration therapy 1970, and double fortified salt in 1994. And now we are looking at double fortified salt with iodine as well as DEC for elimination of the uh, lymphatic filariasis in the country. The COVID pandemic has taught us that India, being the largest democracy, has calibrated its intervention as needed. We were fortunate that the pandemic started about three months later than it had started in the Western world. And therefore, we could get some learnings from the Western world. And, and, and we were serious right from the beginning when the first case of uh, COVID-19 was uh, described on 30th of January 2020 by the National Institute of Virology when a medical student who flew from Wuhan to Hong Kong, Hong Kong to Calcutta, Calcutta to Bangalore, Bangalore to Cochin, and then by bus to his hometown. The number of contacts that were traced at that time, because that was the first positive case, the number of contacts traced, traced, uh, traced for him were more than 200. And it was a whole of government approach, calibrated, proactive, preemptive with a graded response. And again, science driven with uh, best practices and evidence based and strong leadership uh, and communication from our leadership that he was able to keep the country together with uh, with the formula of test track treat and not not and I, here I repeat that he did not embrace the concept of herd immunity which many countries in the West did and and realized that it was leading to a large number of deaths when it, they were embracing herd immunity so India never thought of herd immunity we always maintained test track treat and maintain the COVID appropriate behavior in every form. The virus was isolated on the 9th of March and uh, India was the fifth country in the world to isolate and culture the virus on the 5th of March. And this was given to Bharat Biotech on the third, uh, in the first week of April. And then they provided us with a, 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 a product which we characterized as well as looked at it in terms of small animal studies and large animal studies, and I'll talk a little bit about that. 
we were the first country in the world to culture the alpha variant, which was the UK variant in January of 2021. And we tested the efficacy of the vaccine against the alpha, beta, zeta, and the delta variants. And we are now trying to culture the Omicron variant, which has just been described in three individuals in the country. And, and we are trying to get the samples and uh, culture it so that we can look at the efficacy of our vaccines, both Covaxin and Covishield, in the laboratory and, and, and allay the fears of, of the society. We started the uh, testing laboratory and that has been alluded to by the chairperson and he has uh, applauded uh, the work that was done uh, at ICMR. We were able to set up the laboratories from uh, uh, one laboratory in, in the NIV Pune, which was established as the maximum containment laboratory, the first of its kind in Southeast Asia region in 2012-13. And the second was Wuhan lab in 2017. So this laboratory was established uh, by the, uh, the uh, earlier uh, director generals and a vision of, 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 the, of, of uh, Professor Kato, Professor Ganguly, and other senior ICMR uh, director generals who established this laboratory at Pune. And at that time in February, we were only testing travelers and we did not have testing materials. Much of the testing materials were supplied from uh, Western countries and China, and it was a supplier's market. If it did not purchase it in a matter of hours, it was diverted to other countries. So we had to work uh, with them, but with the uh, young entrepreneurs and with the uh, help of other science uh, agencies, the Department of Biotechnology, Department of Science Technology and CSIR, the young entrepreneurs were able to manufacture uh, more testing equipment. And by June, July, we were exporting testing equipment. Uh, materials to different parts of the world. But another interesting thing was that in April of last year, uh, 2020, we established, uh, we uh, were able to use the repurpose, the molecular testing for tuberculosis, which was the TrueNet, which is again, a collaborative effort of the Indian Institute of Science, the, uh, uh, the Department of Biotechnology, the CSIR, and the ICMR, wherein this got WHO pre-qualification for tuberculosis, we repurposed it for the first time in the world for Nipah virus, as well as leptospirosis. And more recently, uh, in April of la last year, we started using it for COVID-19. Uh, uh, COVID uh, COVID and this was uh, a similar test was developed in the United Kingdom called DNA Nudge, much about six months later in September of October of last year. We already had more than 7,000 such machines across the country. So we were able to repurpose those machines Although the number of tests done was very small, but it was portable, could be taken in remote areas, and this happened in April last year. Again, in India was the first country in the world to start using the rapid antigen test in June when the, we had the first peak uh, of the Delhi uh, pandemic, and we started using the, uh, the rapid antigen test, which started giving us results in 10, 15 minutes. And, uh, and, and uh, then uh, we started manufacturing it in large scale and being exported to different parts of the world. By September of last year, we were testing on demand in terms of atypical, severe, high risk, pregnancy, pre-surgery, pool testing, all that was being done. And, and, and today we are uh, testing and have tested more than 63 crore samples till date. And we have 3000 laboratories and national testing average is about 1000 to 1500 tests per million per day, which is 10 times what WHO recommends. WHO recommends 140 tests per million and we are doing about 1,000 to 1,500 tests. The costs of these tests have been reduced because of the, uh, the, the young entrepreneurs of India. The, the RT-PCR test is now $2 per test, and the rapid antigen test is $1 per test. All these labs are continuing to work. Still, we are doing about 13 lakh tests per day, 12 to 13 lakh tests per day, and 32% of the labs are doing three shifts, and, and that is still continuing, and we've uh, this is an example of how we had upscaled the TrueNet, which is the molecular test. Again, collaborative effort of the science ministries, science agencies of India, which has led to this uh, TrueNet. Uh, and now uh, the, the COVID uh, TrueNet testing has been done from April of last year, and we are still awaiting the WHO pre-qualification for this COVID test uh, TrueNet. Uh, we, uh, in June of, uh, on 9th of June last year, we passed a Gazette notification 
that every medical college has to set up a BSL2 laboratory and 534 of the 536 medical colleges now have established a BSL2 laboratory and every district has a, a, a lab except 50 to 50 to 60 districts still do not have RT-PCR testing laboratory and we're working on them uh, to test up those laboratory. Although rapid antigen tests can be done there and, and, uh, and they are within one hour of testing laboratory. So here, an, an, another emotional moment for me is the mission Lifeline Uran, which was carried out during the four phases of lockdown from 24th March to 31st May uh, last year, wherein during the lockdown, the ICMR uh, and our scientists were working uh, till 2 a.m. every every day, 24 seven, uh, because we had to send consumables, testing commodities, medical supplies to various parts. We had collaboration and help from the Indian Railways, Indian Air Force, uh, India Post, Ministry of Civil Aviation, and, and we were able to carry out those missions, including the mission of setting up a testing laboratory at Iran because 6,000 of our Shia pilgrims were stranded at Qum in Iran, wherein we had to test, set up a testing laboratory overnight. Within 24 hours, six scientists uh, and uh, technical officers from NIV Pune left for Tehran and set up the lab in the basement of the Indian Embassy in Tehran. And we were able to test those samples. Those who are negative were taken back by uh, flight of uh, Iran Air and Indian Air Force and brought to quarantine facilities in India. Similar things were done at Wuhan uh, evacuation and uh, similar samples were collected in Italy and also in Japan. So it was a whole of government approach. And this is the story of just of testing and vaccine development. Similar story exists for PPEs, for masks, for oxygen and other uh, ancillary equipment, ventilators that the government has and the different ministries have worked together. We also bust the myth of uh, uh, convalescent plasma. This was one of the most uh, largest trial, uh, uh, which was done in a record time of two months uh, with the, the largest trial of convalescent plasma in COVID-19, published a randomized trial where we clearly demonstrated that convalescent plasma is not working and does not lead to reduction and progression to severe COVID-19 all cause mortality. And we had two editorials on this, which talked about how a democratization of research happened, wherein smaller hospitals were connected by VC and, and they were participating in a clinical trial for the very first time. And they were monitored every day by, uh, by VCs. And we were able to collect the data from this. We conducted the four rounds of national zero surveys in 70 districts, 700 villages, 21 states, uh, and, and in four rounds. And we know that in the last round in July, we have found 66, 67% zero positivity in individuals and more than 50% in small children. And all these papers have been published in um, various journals. The, uh, the Indian SARS-CoV genomic consortium of 37 laboratories was created uh, last year in December. And, and this is now functioning over time with the help of uh, the ICMR, CSIR, DBT, uh, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, and, and the NCDC and uh, uh, detecting the circulating variants. And recently we've been isolated, we've uh, uh, tested three uh, patients of Omicron variant, which is a, a, a genuine concern because it's found supposed to be highly transmissible, but we do not know how severe disease it is going to cause. And therefore we have to continue with all the COVID appropriate behavior, including, including the use of masks and, and not uh, doing mass gatherings. Now, this is the story of COVAXIN, uh, which uh, uh, the chairperson, uh, Dr. Matanaban, alluded to. This is a whole uh, kill virus vaccine, wherein we, it is a broad spectrum vaccine. It allows a broad spectrum immunity. It is a conventional vaccine. It is not a very modern vaccine. It's difficult to produce because it requires the virus culture. It requires the virus and to be uh, in, in a, it requires a BSL3 facilities. So we, the, uh, the virus was given to Bharat Biotech. And I think this is a classic example of how private-public partnership has worked. The preclinical studies on mouse, rats, and rabbits were done, and this was published in Eye Science. We had to do studies on on large animals, and and again, monkey breeding facilities uh, were not working at that time. We have very limited monkey breeding facilities, and now under the aegis of ICMR, we've established two: one near Bombay and one in Hyderabad, which are now going to be breeding monkeys and other large animals. For, for 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 scientific testing because during this time we had to get during the lockdown we had to get the monkeys 
and it was a lockdown. All the monkeys had gone to the forests and were not available anywhere nearby the cities. So we got permissions and within a matter of five to six days, we were able to capture monkeys on the Telangana border and the uh, from uh, and the Karnataka border from Maharashtra and, and capture 24 monkeys. We tested them. Uh, uh, now these were captured from the wild. Wild, so we had to do all the EGRA test, the tuberculosis test, the X-rays. A new X-ray machine had to be purchased overnight at uh, NIV Pune. They were kept in the air-conditioned cages at the maximum containment laboratory. Well, then we had to do their give them the vaccine. They were given the vaccine, uh, and uh, then intramuscularly, and then the virus challenge had to be given by bronchoscopy. Now again. Uh, a, a scientist D from uh, ICMR headquarters, who was a pulmonologist, was flown in by an IEF plane overnight to uh, Pune, and the CTC Pune, which is the Army uh, Cardiothoracic Center, they also deputed one uh, pulmonologist, and they did the bronchoscopy of the monkeys for the first time and gave the virus inside the third generation of the bronchi, uh, and 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 then they did the bronchi lavage every. Of seventh after the seven days every day for seven days under anesthesia for the monkeys and we collected and see saw that the virus was not growing and that was a turning point where we realized that this vaccine is working and 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 then we did the phase one phase two and the phase three trial on on twenty five thousand volunteers published in the Lancet with two with uh, again an editorial also in that uh, praising not only the uh, the killed virus vaccine but also the adjuvant which was a novel adjuvant, which was added for the first time in a vaccine, developed uh, uh, out of uh, that adjuvant was uh, developed by a startup company in the US, uh, an Indian who was there, uh, and that was uh, included in the vaccine. And probably that also contributes to its antibody, uh, antigenicity in a big way. On the 3rd of November this year, we were able to script history by getting WHO emergency use licensing for this vaccine. And after that, we have uh, uh, given more than 17, 18 crores of this vaccine and, and, and several countries, more than 100 countries in the world are, are using this vaccine now. This neutralizes various viruses and we have seen it in alpha, beta, delta, zeta and kappa. And, and also we uh, set up the national task force under the, uh, which we informed the Supreme Court last year. This was, uh, you know, the role of this task force was uh, calibration of testing strategy providing oversight on research, uh, uh, advising on lockdown and containment strategies, newer and repurposed uh, treatments. We have had more than 140 meetings of this national task force, and we meet uh, regularly on Sundays. We have another meeting tomorrow on Sunday to discuss more about the other, the new variant, as well as the newer treatments, pharmacological treatments. We have published more than 250 papers and, and more than five uh, uh, special issues of the Indian Journal of Medical Management Protocols, a single page management protocol has been given by All India Institute, ICMR, Ministry of Health, and and uh, and, and the Joint Monitoring Group that has been uh, the, uh, the 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 backbone of guiding the treatment for different states. We gave the home isolation and care uh, guidelines in 14 languages during the second wave, and this was very useful uh, for, for people for home isolation and self management. So, in summary, the 10 COVID highlights is the countrywide scaling up of diagnostic laboratories, diagnostic kits, self sufficiency, 100% import to export, nationwide zero survey, four rounds, indigenous vaccine development, virus isolation to phase three, with preclinical animal studies of international standards, more than 250 papers. And more recently, we have the innovative service delivery of, I, of drones. Uh, we have been delivering the vaccine in the Northeast region by a program called iDrone, which is ICMR uh, drone uh, deployment of uh, rescue of, uh, of a vaccine in the Northeast. And, and this project has done more than 45 sorties in Manipur. And yet today it has started in Nagaland with delivering vaccines, iron tablets, as well as syringes in remotest of areas within a matter of minutes. And, uh, and, and, uh, and as I mentioned, 45 sorties have been run, uh, done with this uh, uh, program. And this is uh, for the entire Northeast and it's being scaled up on a war footing. Uh, the, uh, well, India has achieved uh, a feat of uh, more than 1 billion doses by the 80%, more than 
85% of adult population, more than 49% are fully vaccinated, more than 50% are women now, and more than six, nearly 60% are in rural areas. And this is uh, because of the um, political will, uh, strong from top to the bottom, a uh, whole of government approach, and India having uh, a, a very successful universal immunization program for the last several decades, with more than 348,000 public and 28,000 private vaccination centers, with 2.3 million ASHA frontline workers, million of doctors and auxiliary nurse midwives, and 28,000 cold chain facilities. And this has already been used in the UIP for 27 million newborns and 100 million dose booster doses every year. So the same backbone has been repurposed for this COVID-19. And India being a vaccine manufacturing superpower with Serum Institute, Bharat Biotech, BioE, Cadilla, Panacea, and many others, with the IT prowess of the COVID, which being an open source pro platform, with appointing, scheduling, and providing a QR uh, coded certificate for a vaccine certificate, which you know, many countries are still, uh, we've used people's participation, self-help group, and sophisticated digital strategies. And therefore, it has been a successful program with the whole of government program with the cabinet secretary, the national task force, the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, the Drug Controller General National Accreditation Board, the uh, the other science ministries, the Education, pharmaceutical, NCDC, state surveillance officers, district surveillance officers. Uh, during this entire journey, during this entire journey, we have uh, lost 28 colleagues of ICMR uh, who have uh, laid down their lives working either as technical officers, as a scientist, and, and we are grateful to them and, and pay tribute to them uh, today and every day uh, for, their, for their contribution. And I think this is a huge journey which we have realized that both uh, all science ministries, the whole of government as a nation uh, during crisis, we can work together. And I think together we can deliver uh, not only the simplest of the things, but the most complicated things uh, with, uh, with, with the way when the will is strong. So thank you so much for uh, with ICMR leading from the front. Uh, and we thank you for your attention. As I always say that attention is the rarest and purest form of generosity. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. There is no sound. Thank you, Dr. Bhargava, no for giving such a panoramic and graphical view of what has happened behind. A lot of people don't know what has happened behind to make, uh, you know, to fight this pandemic. And, you know, we are really feeling proud and a bit emotional about all that has gone behind and the people who have sacrificed their lives uh, to fight this disease. And we would like to compliment you for all the leadership that you have provided and the, the wonderful uh, interaction between government departments also has seen uh, has happening. I do believe this will continue and, you know, does that, we don't have to be tested by another pandemic, but I do suppose, <laughs> you know, this collaboration would really help uh, India to move forward in the uh, health sector in great. So I would like to thank you once again on behalf of NASI for finding the time and uh, leave it to the president that you want to make any comments uh, at this point. Yeah, yeah. it was. Indeed, we are so happy and so proud to hear what you have said, the collaboration between the government, the medical people, the ICMR, and entire the country came together to take, his, take us out of this extremely difficult situation. And with leadership provided by people like you, we are deeply, I mean, we are overwhelmed by the talk, by your talk, and by the contribution that you have made to our country. We are deeply, deeply grateful and thank you for your time. Thank you for the efforts that you are making. And in spite of such a busy schedule, you really have taken out time for NASI. And that is probably because of the persuasive powers of Dr. Manju Sharma. I mean, he is in, she is incredible. And we have today a tremendous program that she has organized and uh, we are so proud of all of you. 
and uh, thank you professor balram bhargav thank you professor padmanabhan and thank you as always professor manju sharma for creating this wonderful program and my only regret is that the audience should have been much much more that is my regret and i had sent this notice to so many people but i guess there are commitments of others also but it was a phenomenal lecture and very proud that uh, that uh, you gave the foundation day lecture i'm sure a person like meghnath saha would have been so proud of you so proud of you and your commitments and that it was chaired by professor padmanabhan and professor manju sharma thank you thank you so much sir thank you so much uh, the scientific community of india for guiding us always and and uh, we have seen this academy for the last 91 years has been leading the way in every which way and we have had such stalwarts for this academy and i'm sure uh, nasi will live forever and uh, india indian science will live forever thank you so much sir on a more humorous note let me mention that we nasi is passing through a very troubled period and uh, <laughs> i should this is not the forum to mention that but uh, that probably we will take your help in sorting out our issues but we'll uh, thank you so much uh, dr uc shivasto would you like to uh, give the formal vote of thanks uh, sir ma'am i see dr uc shivasto ah uh, yes i am here okay would you uh, now we at quarter ha huh. so you give the formal vote of thanks okay uh, thank you madam thank you very much uh first i would like to thank you because you have made a program and you have kept me in the end to propose the vote of thanks uh i was just thinking that i have to speak in the end and i have to sit here for the whole day but starting from the beginning i heard a lot of lecture and very nice informative one uh and i have gained a lot because of those lectures and i was just waiting for uh, the lecture of the professor balram bhargwa who was going to talk about the uh, nasi foundation day uh, lecture and his award uh, which is very prestigious and i really congratulate professor bhargwa for that particular award uh, i express my great sense of gratitude to professor balram bhargwa ji dg icmr secretary dhr government of india for delivering nasi foundation day lecture and uh, he has made us remember to know about the activities which are going on in the nasi and the second aspect which he has talked about the uh, covid 19 it was really wonderful the only thing which i would like to say that if a person has published in the lancet one can think of this science that how much he has worked because uh, publishing in the lancet it is very difficult and many papers in the lancet and the information which i got that was a wonderful uh, i generally we tell to the students about the covid 19 and the virus but the information which i have received today uh, that i will take your lecture i will just go through it because it is very difficult for me to understand in one day each and everything but it was a wonderful lecture and i have gained a lot uh, from your lecture uh, thank you sir thank you very much there are many things which i have to say but at the present moment because uh, it is the end of the day and we all want that we must go somewhere but we would like to listen you again and again about the information that you have given thank you sir thank you very much thank you madam thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk about and to propose vote of thanks thank you so we close the session and yes. uh, we meet tomorrow morning at uh, 10 o'clock and uh, i hand over the whole thing to professor ashok mishra now tomorrow you will have to conduct the whole day all the thank session till we come to the concluding session is that okay uh, huh? what a wonderful session uh, we had i must mention i am actually in uh, massachusetts in usa so i know that 
So I had to, I couldn't attend all the lectures because I was falling asleep. But uh, I will make, and I took the booster vaccine yesterday, so not feeling well. But tomorrow, I hope I'm tomorrow, there, morning, tomorrow morning you'll be available, na? 100%, 100%. Even today I was the there. The session is starts at 10 o'clock. Yeah, 10 so o'clock. 11.30 here, uh -huh. and there's not a problem. I'll be there, 100%. And we have a, a exciting program tomorrow. So look forward to all of you attending. And please, uh, Archana, please share it with the, with the membership and fellowship a little bit more today, just as a reminder, because we would like, uh, as Professor Gadak said, uh, uh, more audience. Mm. Then, At the end, I would like to thank Dr. Manju Sharma, Dr. Padmanabhan, and everyone who have contributed so much to today's uh, discussion. And uh, of course, Professor Balram Hargav, outstanding talk. And also to everyone at NASI headquarters, Dr. Professor Shivasta, Professor Satyadev, Professor ne Dr. Neeraj Kumar, Dr. Archana Pant, and everyone who have made this program a wonderful program. Really, Dr. Manju Sharma, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your organization. Tremendous organization. I want to also tell Professor Balram what an excellent lecture you gave. Yes, yes. Yeah. Every bit we it was very nice lecture. Can you hear Thank me, Professor Balram? So Ashok, Dr. Ashok Mishra, we will meet tomorrow at ten o'clock then. Uh, yeah, ten o'clock. We I'll be there. I'll log in and all right. we'll all meet, but uh, he has to be there. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Even today I was there, but in between I had to log off because. But you, Why did you go to states at this time? <laughs> he had planned the annual session one year ago. That's not good at all. <laughs> if it was in person, hundred percent I would have been there. But since it was web based, so I could take the liberty. But tomorrow uh, I'll be connected all the time. So. There is little difference. Okay. Thank you. Namaste, Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Neeraj. Thank you, Archana. Thank you, sir. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.